Hey guys, and welcome to react beach resort project, where we'll display hotel rooms and set up functionality. So the user can filter them as well. During this project, we'll use react router for our routing react context API for our state management contentful headless CMS for our data management and Netlify to host our application. So what in the world we will build? Well, first and foremost, I do want to let you know that project will be responsive. And since I don't want to jump back and forth for every section that I'm showing you, I might as well tell you that right away. And for the nav bar on a smaller screen size, we're going to have a toggle button. So this is how the nav bar will be displayed on the smaller screen size. But then once we go to the bigger one, we will going to have our traditional nav bar right after the nav bar on the home page. There will going to be a hero component that will going to have a background image. And in the middle of the hero component, we're going to have a banner that has a link to route to our rooms page. Since we're not done with the home page, we will going to head over back and then we're going to have services where we're going to use react icons to display the services that the hotel provides. After that, we're going to have featured rooms. So imagine you're going to have data for all the rooms in the hotel, but some rooms hotel would want to display as featured. So these will going to be a featured rooms. Now in both pages, whether that will going to be featured rooms or all rooms together, we will going to use a room component to display that one specific room. And as you notice in the room component, there will going to be price for the room as well as the name for the room. And as I'm hovering over the card, we're going to have an option of clicking and then we're going to navigate to a single room page where we're going to have information just about that specific room page, whether that will be, let's say, our family deluxe room or it will be single deluxe. Again, I'm heading over there. This will be a unique picture about that specific room as well as rest of the information that would tell us more about this specific room. Since we are using the React router, I also want to let you know that if, let's say, we're going to be trying to navigate to a page that doesn't exist, we are going to create a custom 404 page where it says, okay, so page not found. And obviously we have either option of clicking return home or we can navigate through a nav bar. Now, once we're done with the home page, notice these are the sections we're creating. Now let's head over here to a rooms page where we're going to have all the rooms that currently hotel provides, as well as since we have multiple rooms, the user will also going to have an option of filtering them out. So let's say I'm not interested in all the rooms. I would just be interested in the family rooms. This displays me all the family rooms that hotel provides. And like I already previously said, we still have an access to a single room page where we're navigating to that specific room. Then once we look at the family rooms, this is what we're interested. We also have an option of filtering even more. Let's say judging by the price. And if I'm going to go below the price that I'm looking for, notice it says, unfortunately, no rooms match your search parameters. Now, what does that mean? If we are going to have no rooms to display that would match the search parameter, this is going to be our error message. We can filter our rooms even more. Let's say I could look for family rooms that are only providing the breakfast as well as the pets are allowed. Now, in this case, this particular room allows pets as well as provides free breakfast. However, I can check maybe for the rooms that only allow pets. All right. Now this is just going to give me the rooms allow pets. But if I would want the breakfast, then obviously I'm going to be heading over back to that one room within the family room type. Then I can also say, you know what? I would be interested in, let's say, staying four people. So let's see which rooms allow to have four people. And then this one obviously doesn't allow four people. That's the reason why it's not showing you. Now, hopefully this gives you an idea what we're going to be building. And why don't we talk about where we're going to store our data now? First and foremost, initially, we were going to have all local data that I'm going to provide. So even if you don't want to work with Contentful or Netlify, which, by the way, we're going to use both of them free tier, so you will not have to pay anything. But let's in say that you just don't want to work with Contentful or Netlify. You will be able to finish your whole project just with the local data that I'm going to provide in a set of files. Now, later on, once we're done with the project, we were going to take a look at how we can set up the contentful, which is a headless CMS or also something called BOIF, which means bring your own front end. And what's really cool about contentful that regardless of the 
application that you're building, whether that would be with vanilla JS, whether with a Gatsby project, whether a React project, which would be our case, we can set up our data and then using the CDN, we're going to be able to consume our data. What's really cool about Contentful that once we're done with our application, once we're going to set up all our data within the Contentful, it will be possible for us just to add changes within the Contentful and we will not have to store our project locally or our machine just to change something, delete data, edit the data, and so on and so forth. Last but not least, like I said, we're going to use free tier Netlify to host our amazing application so the whole world can see it. As far as setup files go, they will be located on my GitHub account. So you can search for setup files React Beach Resort or just follow the link that I will leave in the description. I also want to let you know that if you like project based courses, be sure to check out my Udemy courses where we cover topics like React, JavaScript, Gatsby, and styled components, just to name a few. In the description of the video, you'll find $10 course coupons. Before we tackle the project, I do want to mention two things. First, as far as styling is concerned, we will use one main CSS file available in the setup files. And since it is a React project, we will cover CSS very briefly, only when I find it useful or for understanding our whole setup. Second, while developing application, only one React hook will be used, use context hook, and only because we will look at multiple options of consuming context API. All right, assuming that you installed these setup files, I think we can kick it off and start working on our application. And the first thing that I would like to do is bootstrap the React application using the Create React app. Now I'm going to go with NPX route, but obviously you can install this globally or assuming that you already have this globally, you can just run Create React app and then whatever the name of your project will be. Now I'm going to call my resort. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to navigate to desktop. Once in the desktop, like I said, I'm going to run NPX. Then we're going to go with create react app. So now I would need to just come up with a name and I'm going to go with resort. While I'm right now bootstrapping the react application, I would want to show you what you're going to have within the setup files. So here you're going to have three files as well as the images folder. And this is going to be used for redirect. So I'm going to show you what's happening in the next video. Then app CSS will be the main CSS file for the whole application. Data will be the local data that we're going to be using while we're developing the application prior to when we are hooking up actually everything with the contentful. So this is very important. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard for you to code along. And then last but not least, we have the images again, which we will use while we're developing this locally, as well as later on, once you're setting up the contentful, this might be useful, where basically as you're creating more and more items, you can just grab here the images that we are going to be using. Okay. Now, also, you'll notice there's a GIF one for the loading. So there's going to be a case where we would want to set up the component as, let's say, some kind of page part loads. So this is where we're going to be using the GIFs. All right. Now, once you have all this installed, then obviously what's next is happening is that the application currently is being bootstrapped. So we can see that we have a bunch of dependencies that are being installed with create react app and once that will be finished in fact before we run npm start and we actually start the development server i would want to install these two dependencies because we're going to use them right away so i didn't see the point of starting the dev server and then in fact stopping it install these two dependencies now one of them will be react icons and the second one will be react router dom which we'll use for our routing so in this case, I would want to navigate to my resort folder. So since the name is quite simple, I can just say CD resort. And then let's run npm install. I'm going to go with the react icons first. And then once they will be installed, I'm going to go with react router down. And then after that, I would want to open up right away my text editor. As, as always, I have a few options. I can do it directly here from the terminal where I can just type code dot or I can just go with drag and drop. Now, this would be my first application, or I'm sorry, not application, the dependency. And then I'm going to go with npm install again, or we can just write I uh, react router 
Dom, and we can just go with dash dash save as well, just in case. Okay. Now, once we install both of these dependencies, like I said, I would want to open up my text editor. And in this case, this will be visual studio code. We will drag and drop and we're going to get our folder. We can might as well minimize this. We will not going to need that. And let's open side by side window. So that way we can have two browser windows. One is going to be the small one where we're going to see everything that we're doing as we're developing the application. And the second one, we're going to be the bigger browser window where we, let's say, want to say how the grid works. Okay. Now, in this case, I will going to open up the terminal, the integrated terminal in the Visual Studio Code. By the way, if you don't know where it is, this would be the new terminal. And I am using the shortcut here, of course. And then why don't we run the dev server? So npm start, we are going to start the local dev server, which will serve our project on localhost 3000. Now, like I said, this would be the finished project that we're going to be striving to achieve. And then I would want to set by side by side with localhost 3000, where this will be the project that we're currently working on. Okay, now this will be the setup. And assuming that you followed all the steps and everything was successful, I think we can move on to our next phase of our application. First things first, I would want to do a bit of a spring cleaning because obviously this comes with a bunch of things that we don't want. And we can start simply by app CSS. Now you have two choices. Either you can import right away my file that you have in setup files, meaning you can just replace it by drag and dropping, or you can clean out here and just copy and paste the content of the setup file CSS file. This is really up to you. In my case, I'm just going to delete this and we're going to create a new one later on when we're going to grab my app CSS from the setup files. Then I'm going to head over, obviously, to the app JS. And for the time being, we're just going to comment this out because otherwise our application obviously will going to break. Then we can head over maybe to index.js. And I would want to comment out index CSS because, like I already said three times, probably our main CSS file will be just one. So we don't need the second one with index CSS. Then we don't need the logo SVG. So we can just delete this sucker as well. So let's say logo SVG, you go bye bye. Then what we have? Well, again, we have app JS breaking. So why don't we do very simply by deleting everything that we have currently in the div? And we can just have, I don't know, maybe a React fragment in this case. And we can just say, okay, within the React fragment, we're going to place a hello from app just for the time being. Hello from app. Now let's save that, and there should be no errors. I'm from part from the fact that I'm trying to import the logo, of course, so I can delete that. And yes, everything is working correctly. We do have our hello from app. Then uh, we will gonna head over to the public one, and within the index HTML, I would just want to create a new title because at the moment I have React app, and I'm gonna call my one uh, resort. Resort recording recording. All right, now let's save that. This is going to show me two things where I have beach resort that will be my finished one, and then I have a resort recording. Now, as far as the setup files are concerned, why don't we go over to the setup folder and we're going to go one by one? So here we have the redirects, and like I said, I will going to talk about redirects in this video, and in fact, I'm going to do that right now. So what happens is since we're using the React router DOM, they don't play very nicely right out of the box with a Netlify where we will going to be hosting our application eventually. And what happens is that the fix is very simple. You need to actually get this redirect file. So if you want more information, again, you can head over to the Google. You just type React router DOM. And pretty much this is going to be the first block that comes up. And like I said, we just need to grab that file and that file needs to be in the public folder. And that way, whenever we're going to be redirected or any kind of routing that we're going to do in Netlify will, in fact, work exactly the same like it would work locally with just a React router DOM. So I'm going to grab this redirects. I would want to copy this guy. And then we're going to head over to the public and just copy and paste it right here. And like I said, if you want more information, if you're going to head over to the blog, you can just read what is actually happening. 
and what would be the case scenario? Why we would want to use that? And notice we have the redirects. Now that is obviously the file name, and then we have our index HTML. Now, technically, this would come up only later once we deploy it on Netlify, but I think that we can just get it out of the way because maybe eventually I might forget. Now, next one up, we do have our app CSS. Like I said, this is going to be our main CSS file. So I will going to right now copy this and we're going to head over back to folder of the source and just copy and paste it somewhere in the source. Now, it is important that you actually use the same structure as I am where the files are at, because I do have already some paths here. So let's say when I'm setting up the hero backgrounds or something like that, I am already having some kind of paths. So it's important if you change the path, notice I'm actually looking for the images folder layer now. And then if you're going to place this file somewhere else, obviously it's not going to make sense. So that's why I'm suggesting either you follow the folder structure exactly by the letter, or if you are actually creating your own folder structure, then obviously just keep in mind that whatever we're going to be having some kind of path, you'll need to fix it. All right. Now, this will be my app CSS. Now I can head over back to app.js and in fact, comment this out. So now we're not going to break or we shouldn't break at least. And the moment I do that, I do have a beautiful error. And the reason for that is like I was just talking about that I cannot find the path because I'm looking for the image and I cannot get the image. Now I will going to return back to app CSS. We will talk about a little bit more, but right now what I would want is get these images. So I would want to get this images folder and again, somewhere within the source. So make sure that this is still within the source. We're just going to copy and paste that. And this is going to be our images folder. Then images are quite self-explanatory. These are going to be the images that we're going to be using locally. And later on, you can use the same images if you're setting up the data on contentful. And then why don't we also grab this data one? And why don't we talk about the data and what's happening here? Now, I'm going to discuss this data file later on in more detail once it's going to make a little bit more sense. But as you notice right now, there's a bunch of imports here on top where again, we are just getting the images. So it is crucial that again, your data is sitting within the source. Because if you're placing it somewhere else, this path will not going to make sense. But like I said, I will going to talk about this data JS later on when it's going to make sense, because at the moment we are not working with the data, so we might as well just skip that. So this will be our setup files. And last but not least, I would want to talk about a little bit about CSS. So the way I was setting up CSS, first and foremost, you notice that I have a bunch of variables here. So I'm using the CSS variables. I did set them up in a root. And then all throughout the document, you're going to notice that I'm just actually accessing these variables because I find it easier. Now, there's also one more thing that I would want to let you know that my main goal was as I'm working to create as little class names as possible. So even though normally I would work with style components, or even if I just work with CSS, I prefer naming everything with the classes. In my case, I didn't want to overpopulate the JSX. That's the reason why we're going to see a bunch of these nav links. And then you have, let's say, whatever the element that I'm choosing. This is not my preferred way, but since, again, I'm doing the recording and I didn't want to overpopulate the JSX, that is the reason why my CSS was structured this way. You're also going to notice that here on the top, we have a bunch of globals, whether this is going to be the body, where whatever heading ones, then a few classes that we're going to use all throughout the document. And then everything will be in a following string, where basically you're going to have a comment. So this would be the section that we're going to be working on. Let's say navbar and all the CSS that has to do anything with the navbar will be here. Then we have end of navbar. Then obviously we're going to cover hero and so on and so forth. So if you ever need to find something, remember that you're just going to have to look for the name of the section that we're working on. Or if let's say you want to find a specific class, you can also use always find. And let's say we're going to be working on a hero. I can type hero. Okay. So these are going to be the classes that we're going to be working with a hero. Now, last, I also would want to mention that I am purposely repeating myself. Now, what do I mean by that? You will notice that for each and every section, I will going to set up the media queries 
and bunch of them I could set up in one place and just use the grouping. Now, I, again, I did this purposely. So whenever you're working on this particular section, you can see all the CSS that was done. Now, again, this wouldn't make sense normally. You just group everything together, especially as far as the media uh, queries are concerned. Because let's say if you're repeating the same rule, it doesn't make sense. But in my case, again, I wanted you to show rule by rule that is applied for each and every section that we're working. So this would be the setup. This is the folder structure that we're going to be using. Well, obviously, we're going to create more folders and more components. But this is how we connect right now our application with the setup files that were provided. Our next task will be creating pages that we will use all throughout the project. So as I'm looking at my finished project, I have a few pages. I have the home page. Then we're going to have the room page where all the rooms will be displayed, as well as single room page where there will be information about single room. And also we would want to set up the 404 page. So let's say we're going to a page that doesn't exist. We will going to be brought to a 404 where we have an option of returning home. Okay, now what do we need is we will gonna head over to the source within the source, there will be a new folder and quite self explanatory. We're just gonna call this pages within the pages. There will be four components, uh, most of them will be actually functional components. Only one, the single room page, should be class based component. You can obviously do it later on, however, you'd like, but you might as well do it right now. So let's start with the first one. Uh, this will be home JS. And like I said, the home JS will be functional component. And in this case, I am using right away the extension that I have, which will be the ES67 React snippets. And this allows me to not to type the whole spiel where I'm importing React and all that. I can just say R A C and or F C, sorry. And this creates a functional component. In this case, though, this will be an arrow function. No, you can also do it RFC. This is just going to be creating as a function. This is really up to you, however you'd like. All right. Now in here, let's just write hello from home page, because this way we're going to know which component we have actually rendered in the app.js, because starting from next video, we are going to set up the React router DOM for the routing. Then the next one will be rooms. So again, new file. Let's call this a rooms JS again. Let's create a functional component RFC or RF AC. And then let's just say that hello, hello from and we're going to say rooms page. Okay, then we do have another one which is going to be single room page. So we can just call this single room JS again, same old deal. However, in this case, like I said, let's create a class based component. So in that case, I'm going to type RCC and we can just say hello from single room page. Now, last but not least, there will be an error page. Let's call this error JS. And again, this is going to be the functional component. And why don't we say hello from error page, error page. And when we save them, I might as well can close all the tabs. And then what we would want is within the app JS, I would want to import them one by one. We're just going to import them. So I'm going to say first and foremost, import. And why don't we actually close the sidebar? So import. Now I'm just going to be looking for the home and that will going to be in the pages folder. So since this is the same folder, of course, that's the only thing I need to do. And then I'm not looking for the images. In fact, I'm looking for the pages and then we're going to go with home. I will going to save that. We can just copy and paste that four times since we know that we have four of them. And let's just change the naming. The second one was rooms. Then we had what was the naming here? I think the second one wasn't the rooms. Obviously, that was single room. And we also need to change the name of the import single room. And last but not least, we have the error. So let's write error page as well as import from the error. All right. And when we do that, why don't we render everything out just so we can see how everything would look like if we wouldn't use the reactor or dump. So in that case, we're just going to go with home. Then again, like I said, copy and paste it like we did already previously. 
and let's just change the naming. In this case, we're gonna say rooms. Then we have a single room, single room, and the last one will be no other than the error page. And once we say that, we have four pages. Now it's a far cry from our final application, but at least we have started doing something. So why don't we take a look at how we can work nicely with React Router DOM? Setting up all our pages was nice and easy. However, we would probably want to give our user an option to navigate to a different pages. Because at the moment, if we're just going to keep on filling in all the components that we created, we're just going to have one giant page that will not make sense in the long run. Now, there's many ways how we can do that. However, probably the most popular would be React or DOM. And as always, if you want more information, we can just go to React router and we're going to be looking for the package name of dom and then since this is created by react training all the documentation will be in fact in this website where we have reacttraining.com and then step by step first we would need to install it which we already did and then we would want to import few things and we would want to start with the browser router which will serve as a router then route we are going to point to a specific route where each component will be rendered. And last one will be link, which will be pointing to that specific URL. OK, now we also are going to use the switch and we're going to talk about it once we get there. But these would be the basics that we would need to get from React Router down. As far as the browser router, we would want to use the browser router to wrap our whole React element tree or react component tree. So we have a few options. We can do this in the app.js. However, just so we don't clog up the app.js, we can also do it in the index.js. So this is exactly what I'm going to do is I'm going to import. I'm going to say import. Then I'm going to say browser uh, router. And usually what happens, you use the alias. Like you notice here, they use browser router. And then you just call this as router. So you give it an alias. And we're going to go from React Router DOM since we already have installed the package. And what you would want to do right now is just wrap your app component that you have that's being rendered in the browser, or I'm sorry, in a router. So this is going to serve as a parent container right now or parent component. And then we're just going to lift this guy up, the app. And we're going to save it. And now we're going to have access to a browser router. Now, I did mess up here because obviously this is not how you write this. So let's write it correctly. And then we have the import and we have successfully set up our router. Once we have the router, we might as well can start using it. And like I said, we would need two more things. Now, the first one will be a route. So notice we have a route component. And then later on, we're also going to use the switch. And I'm going to talk about the switch once we start using it, but I will going to import this right away. So we're going to be looking for route. Then we have the switch. And then again, this will be from React Router DOM. And the syntax is very simple. So let's imagine we have these components that we already created as pages. And then notice we have the link component, which will be pointing to that route whether this is going to be forward slash or this is going to be forward slash about. And what happens with a route component, it has this path prop that just shows where we're going to be actually navigating and then what component will be rendered. So if the path is forward slash, this component will be rendered. Then if we have the about, then the other component will be rendered. And in our case, this is very simple, in fact. We again need to set up the route and I'm going to say, okay, so if there is a prop and the name is path, in fact, not to let me go back path. And I'm going to say if the route is the home page, which would be the forward slash what component I would like to actually show. Well, this is quite simple component. And then we're going to go with our home one. So I'm going to say, okay, so home component will be displayed then I would need to get rid of rest of them. And we're just going to copy and paste them and set up four paths. Now, the last one, we're not going to use the path, but we're not going to talk about it right now. So why don't we get rid of the fourth one altogether? 
and we're going to talk about a little bit more once we actually are covering the error page. So if the path is forward slash, if the home page we would want to render, then obviously we're going to be looking for the home component. Then we would want to set up the rooms path. So if we're navigating to the rooms, then we would want to show rooms. And last but not least, we also would want to show the single room. So for the time being, I'm going to write like this single room, but we will going to change this a little bit later. So let's write this a single room. And now let's notice what happens. I do have my home page. Awesome. Because currently we are sitting on the home page. However, the problem will be if I want to navigate to a rooms, because I'm going to write forward slash, then we have the rooms. And check this out. I still have my home, even though I'm also rendering the rooms. And the reason for that is because with React Router DOM, it will match the first one. Now, in our case, what we would want is match the exact one. And for that, we do need to add uh, this prop. And the name here is exact. And that way, only if the path matches exactly, which would be the forward slash, then we're going to be rendering the home page. Because what you need to understand is if you're looking at the rooms the way it's written right now, we have forward slash and then rooms, it also matches the forward slash, the one that we have just for the home one. So what I'm going to do is right now is I'm just going to grab these guys and I'm just going to copy and paste them. So we're going to add this exact one to all our rights. So one, two, and three. We're all gonna have this exact route once I do that. And by the way, I didn't set up for the last one. Then, if I'm gonna be on a home page, only the home page will be rendered. If I'm gonna be on a room page, only the rooms page will be rendered. We also have an option of single page or single room, right? So we can write single room, and this will be our single room. However, there is an issue currently because what's gonna happen is that. The single room we're going to use for each and every room. However, we will going to be displaying different information. So if we have single economy room, this will have information about that single economy room. If I would want, let's say, some kind of presidential room, I would want information about that presidential room. And at the moment, the way our setup is currently, we are not doing that. We're just rendering this one single room. And in order to fix that, we would need to use the route parameters. So how we can do that? Well, we need to come up with a path. So in my case, I will going to say this is, this is rooms, even though remember, you could just say, leave the forward slash and then do the route parameters. But in order to set up the route parameters, you need to set up the colon and then need to come up with whatever variable name you would want. Now, in my case, I'm going to call this slug. But you can call this Uncle Bobby. It doesn't really matter. Now, the key here is going to be well, later on when we're going to be working within this single room component, we are going to check it out how we can access this slug here, how we can access that variable, and then pull the information about that one specific page. So that's the reason when I'm going to be clicking on a single room page, I'm going to be getting a unique information about that single room page. All right. Now let's test it out. Let's test it out our slug. So in this case, I can say localhost. This will be my home page. Then if we're gonna do, let's say rooms, let's type rooms, this will be the room page. And then if I'm gonna do the forward slash, and this is gonna be my path where I'm gonna be accessing the single room. And we were gonna set this up with a naming where if you're looking at the final project, notice that this would be double basic. This is gonna be our slug. But just to show you that it doesn't matter how we name the variable, this is just the accessing. I could type, let's say, one here. Now, what this is going to do is this is going to say, okay, so I cannot find this particular rooms. Now, the reason for that, because I didn't save it. Now, let's save that. And notice now I have rooms. Then I have one, which will be that one specific room. And obviously, this will be hello from single room. Now, instead of one, I could just write slug. And again, this will going to lead to a single room page. Now, last but not least, I do want to set up some kind of error page. Because at the moment, if I delete everything that I have in the URL, and let's just say forward slash hello, check this out. I have this blank page because none of these ones matched here. 
So I had a bunch of routes, but none of them in fact match. And what we can do here is we can set up the switch component so we can place everything within the switch that is giving with a react router. Now let's place this all the way in the bottom. And then once within the switch statement, we can set up again route component. In this case, we don't need to show the path. We can just say, okay, so we're going to be rendering the component. The name of the component will be in our case error. Error. And now let's check it out. When there will be no match for whatever URL we currently have, we will be rendering this error page. All right. Now, this will be our setup from the React or DOM. And then next, we can start working on our nav bar. Once we have successfully set up our React router with the URL parameters as well as the error page, just as a side note, I want to let you know that if you want to get more information about what is happening with React Router DOM, just explore their documentation, where in this case, they do talk about the URL parameters, basically what they are and how to work with them, as well as we have our no match. And the reason for that, why we're placing in the switch, because the switch will render the first child route that matches and the route with no path will always match. Now, just to show you how this is going to work. So let's say I will going to get rid of the switch. So I'm going to select them both and in fact, delete them. Now I can leave them as a fragment. Notice right now, my error one will be showing up on each and every route. So even if I'm going to go to a, let's say rooms, then I'm still going to have this error out. So one of the things that we can do is we can use the switch statement here like so. And then what happens is that if the route will obviously not going to match, we will going to be rendering this error component. All right. Now the nav bar, as I'm looking at our finished project, notice that nav bar will be on each and every room, even the error one. So even if I'm going to say hello and I'm going to have a trouble finding this page, I will going to still have my nav bar. So one of the most important things that we need to remember that nav bar will be placed around the switch statement because we are going to use the nav bar for the navigation. In order to do that, I will going to create a new folder. Now I'm going to call my folder components. And then within the components, we're going to be placing a bunch of components. And then the first one will be nav bar JS. And why don't we do it very simply? where I will going to place a class based component, because I do want to set up here the toggling. And why don't we write just hello from nav bar, let's save that. And then within the app JS, I would want to import. So somewhere here, maybe in the bottom, the last import import, then we're looking for nav bar, this will be in our components. So not there, but dot forward slash components and then we're looking for the nav bar and on top of the switch we will going to render our nav bar let's save that and we do have our hello from nav bar which is really really good because then for each and every page we will going to have the nav bar once i go to home page i'm still going to have nav bar and so on and so forth our done in or i'm sorry our work in the app js is pretty much done and next, we're just going to be working whether the pages or whether this is going to be components. First and foremost, I would want to show you how we can work with React icons, because if you're noticing on a smaller screen, we are going to have a very, very nice icon. And let me make this smaller. Notice this guy. So this is going to be the React icons. Now, in fact, that is a font awesome icon. But what I really liked about React icons, the package is the fact that they're rendering this as an SVG. And it just gives you more nice features. All right. Now, first and foremost, let me make this bigger. Then I will going to keep this open just again to show you where we're going to be working with the links, because this is what we're going to be setting it up. But I will going to open a new one. I'm going to say react, uh, react, and let's call this icons. And then this is going to lead you to react icons, netlify.com. And then notice how we should work with them. So first and foremost, we would need to install them which we did, then we have few libraries that we can choose from, whether you want to do font awesome, ionic material design. And then the way you would import, this would be the name of the icon that you would like to import. 
and then the library where you want to import from. So in our case, we're going to use font awesome. So we just need to add this forward slash F a. And then if you want to render that icon, the only thing you need to do is just name it. Okay. Now, if you want to check it out, what kind of icons they have, here you go. Knock yourself out again, icon name, and then from the font ISOM. Obviously, you can just follow along what would gonna be my naming for the icon. So you don't need to actually go ahead and search for that because you'll see in a second which icon I actually picked. Now, first and foremost, uh, what kind of other imports I would want? Well, I would want to set up some kind of uh, logo as well, because if you're looking at it in, again, the final project, we're noticing here the logo. So why don't we start with a logo? And we're going to do this from the images import. Then I'm going to name this logo. And now we just need to navigate to a images folder. And we do need to add from. And let's see. So we have right now images. And then within the images, the name of the logo will give me logo SVG. Now, this is going to be the logo that we're going to be using. Second, I would want to get my icon. So I'm going to say FA. Then the name is align and right. And then, like I said, this will be from React, icons, and then forward slash and FA. Now, last, I would want to get, and this is not what I would want. These are the setup files. But what I would want is to head over to a not React icons, but React router. And then remember, we talked about the link component. Now, link component is going to be the thing that we're going to use in the nav bar because we're going to use the link component. Then to prop, this will be actually directing our user to a specific URL. Okay, now let's import it, import, and let's name this link from React router down and get used to this import. We will do this all throughout our application because we'll have a bunch of buttons that we're going to be directing the user to some other route. All right, now we do have the link. Everything is awesome. And like I said, I would first want to set up right away uh, the state because I will do a bit of a toggling. If I'm just going to make this smaller, just to show you how this is going to look like. If we're going to go to the smaller screen, Notice this is going to be our nav bar, and then we click it again, and now nav bar disappears. I'm doing this with a state and with handle toggle, as well as there is a little bit of CSS. But I'm, obviously, I'm going to show you what kind of CSS is involved. However, I do want to let you know that in order to see everything that we're going to be doing within the nav bar, you will going to have to head over to app CSS. Now, let's find where is the nav bar. Let's look for the nav bar. And then within the nav bar links, you have here the height zero and overflow hidden. So if you're not going to comment this out, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see what is happening. So you do need to make sure that you comment this out. And that way, everything that we're going to be writing within nav bar JS, you will be able to see. Okay, enough of me yapping. Why don't we set up the state? Like I said, we're going to set up the state. Then we're going to use this or is open. Then we're going to set this equal to false. So by default, navbar will not going to be open. And we already know that we can create a handle toggle, which will be our method. Obviously, we can name this however we would like. And what this is going to do is use this dot set state. And we're just going to make sure that if the is open is, let's say, false, we would want to set it equal to true. If it's true, then it's false and so on and so forth. And the way we do that is we use this dot set state. Then we have this property there by the name of is open, and we're all going to set it up to opposite. So we're going to say exclamation mark this dot stat state and is open. So this way, as we're going to be clicking on it, this is going to be toggling in between the false and true. Then within the render, this is where the real font starts. So first and foremost, let me delete div, and I'm going to say that this instead will be nav. I do want to add right away the class of navbar, class name navbar. And if you did everything correctly, obviously there's going to be already some CSS that's being applied. Within the navbar, we're going to set up the nav center. This will be the div. Then after that, we would want to go with nav header div. And then last but not least, I would want to start setting up my logo. 
but I will gonna wrap this in a link. So the way we use this link component that we got from react router down, we just need to write link then to prop. So where we're going to be directing the user. In our case, if I click on my logo, I would want to go back to the home page. So let's close it out. And then within the link, why don't we place that logo? So for that, I'm going to use source. I did already import the logo from images and I can just place it within the source. So I can say logo and we can also add maybe alternative. And for alternative, we can write, I don't know, beach, beach resort, something like this resort. And we also obviously need to close out the image. So forward slash, and this will going to be our logo. Like I said, there's going to be multiple things happening. First and foremost, you notice that there's a background here. There's also a logo and everything is working nicely. All right. Then I would want to work on my button, which, like I said, will be our toggling button on a smaller screens. And in order to do that, we will going to set up the button component or button element first and foremost. Then we might as well add type will be button button. And then why don't we add a class name of uh, nav BTN? So nav BTN. And then within the button, I would want to render my icon here, the FA align right. Now, like I already previously showed you from their docs, the only thing I would want uh, is to access obviously this icon. So I would just need to add a name of this icon. And then I will gonna add right away class name because I did add a bit of styling here. So nav icon, let's close that out. Let's say that and sure enough, we have our icon, but we still haven't set up the handle toggle when I'm clicking on this button. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to set up on click, then this will be equal to a obviously function. And the name of the function will be this dot handle toggle, since we have access to it in this class. Last but not least, I would want to set up the UL or unordered list, which will render in fact, all our links. Now I need to be careful here that I would still want to place this within nav center, but I don't want to place it within the nav header. So make sure that you are outside the nav header and we're going to set up the unordered list. Then for unordered list, this is going to be the kicker where the class name will not going to be a simple class name. In fact, we will going to use the value from the state where we have this that open. I would want to write it first. And then once we're going to set up everything here within the nav bar, I'll head over back to CSS and show you what is actually happening. But the way we're going to do that is this dot state is open since obviously that is the property we're looking for. And I'm just going to check if the property is true. So if this is open, then this class name should be two of them. Then there's going to be links for my unordered list as well as we're going to be looking for the show nav class. However, if it is going to be false, then we are only going to be rendering one class or adding one class to this unordered links, which will be nav links. And then within the unordered list, I'm just going to go with list item. And for that particular list item, we're going to place a link. And then there's going to be two prop again. This will be again, directing the user back home. So we're going to write that the name in this link will be home. Let's copy and paste that one more time. And then the second one will be rooms. And that's it. That's the only thing we need to do as far as the navigation is concerned, because we don't have a bunch of links here. So let's write rooms and check this out. And currently, what I have here, I can click on it all day long and not much is happening. Only this small move, but we're going to fix this a little bit later on. The reason for that is, of course, because we commented it out, but I do have my links. Now, as a side note, normally, if you are setting the links, it's probably wiser to set it up in a different place and then just rendering it as a list. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, let's imagine and again, I keep going back to my GitHub where I don't want to go, but let's imagine you're going to have a bunch of links and those links will be displayed all over the page. Let's say you have the sidebar. You also have maybe a link is displayed in the footer. And what you don't want to do is just hard coding all over the place. Because let's say you want to change something. 
So probably a better way would be setting up some kind of constants folder or data folder where you have access to these links. So set them up as some kind of array and render them. Now, in my case, there wasn't a bunch of links and I was just rendering them in one place. So I thought this might be a bit of an overkill. But normally, if you're rendering in multiple places and you have way more links, it makes more sense to set up this as some kind of array, array of, let's say, objects. And then you're just rendering this. And that way you have the information in one place. So if you change this information, then all the changes are being affected all throughout your project. Again, in my case, it just didn't make sense. Now, the second one will be this app CSS, because what you notice in the nav links, we have by default height of zero and overflow of hidden. So if I'm going to comment this out, you'll see how actually this is going to work. I will going to set this up. So at the moment, by default, they should be hidden, but probably because I already clicked on them, this is the reason why it's not happening. So let me refresh. Notice now my links are gone because by default height is zero and overflow is hidden. And then there is the show nav of class that adds this height of 100% or I'm sorry, 100 pixels. That's the reason why we click on it. Now this class of show nav is being added to my on our list. And now my links are being shown. That's the whole magic here behind this navbar.js. And as you notice here, we are just checking the value in a state. Is this open? Then add these two classes here, the nav links as well as show nav. And if it's false, which by default, this is false, then we just want to work with a nav links. Okay. This is the only thing that we should be interested within our navbar.js. And now we are ready to move on to our next component which in fact will be a hero component. As you're looking at a final project, you probably noticed that for each and every page that we have, there's going to be this massive hero background image. And that is going to be the component that we were going to create. And the way we're going to create that is that we were going to be able to reuse it. Now, there's still going to be a problem just doing it with a regular CSS route. So when we we're going to get to a single page, in fact, we're going to do it two ways. First, we're going to set it up normally like we're going to do it right now with the CSS, but we're also going to explore the styled components way where we can make it even more dynamic. Okay. Now, what I would like to do right now is head over back to the components. We're going to create a new file and I'm going to call this hero.js. This will be a functional component. So RFC and let's close the sidebar and now let's decide what we would want to do. So this is going to be my component. Then there's going to be two props, children, because I would still want to render this banner with a button and all that within inside. That's the reason why I want to access the children. And the second one will be a hero. Now, this is the prop that I'm creating myself, which I'm going to add to this header that I'm going to be rendering. The reason for this hero class is because I want to add it as a class name. So I'm going to set up the class name and I'm going to say hero. So each and every time I'm going to be rendering this hero component, I will have an option of changing the class name. And then I'm going to show you, obviously, in the CSS, how we're going to be doing that. But in general, I'm going to say, OK, so this will be equal to my prop. So instead of passing this as a string, I need to say hero. And then we also would need to render the children. So I'm going to say header. And then we're going to say, I don't know, children. So let's try children. That is the prop, obviously, that we're accessing. So let's go with children. And this is our component. We're almost done. We're still going to have a look at how we can set up default prompts and why would that make sense? But why don't we test this out? So I'm going to say, OK, there will going to be a hero component. And first and foremost, I would want to try this out in my home page. So we're going to head over to the home page. We will going to import this. I'm going to say hero from from and let's say components, of course, then within the components, we do have the hero. And why don't we render it? First and foremost, let's get rid of this div. And then let's just say that this will be my hero, uh, hero component, like so. And I do need to add the class name here, because this is what I'm expecting in my hero, because I have my hero prop. And then this hero prep will be passed down into attribute of the class name. And then this is what's going to make the whole change. 
So in this case, I'm going to say hero. And I already did set up within the app CSS hero class. Now, let me show you how we can find that. Instead of looking for the nav bar, we're going to look for the hero and then check this out. I have two classes. I have one for default hero. And the second one would be for room zero. So this is what I'm talking about when I say that we're going to reuse it. So we're going to have this hero prop. But in this case, I would want to pass default hero. And since this will be accessing the class that I had, the default hero class, since that is the whole setup in the hero, check this out. Now I do have this massive image in my homepage. However, I would want to set up some kind of default props for this hero component. Because the issue right now is that, yes, I am expecting this hero prop. But what about, let's say, I forgot to add the prop. Now, it would be annoying if the only thing would be rendering is pretty much nothing here, because this is just going to be empty component. So what we can do here is we can use the hero. Now, that obviously is the name of our component. And then we go with default props. And I'm just going to set up right away that the hero prop will by default be default hero, which is in fact the class name that I had within the CSS. Now, what's going to happen is if on a different page, let's say the rooms page, I would want to render a different image. Obviously, I'm going to be passing the class name that I'm going to create for the rooms. However, if I'm not going to pass anything altogether, like let's say for the error page, if we're going to go to the error page, notice this again, we're going to be rendering the same thing like we had before is because I have the default props. So let's test it out. I do have my hero prop. I already have the default prop. So that way within the home, I actually don't need to add any kind of class name here. This is happening by default. And why don't we head over back to the rooms? Again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to import hero from, and then we're going to be looking for the components as well as we're going to be looking for the hero. And why don't we get rid of all this? And for the time being, let's just say hero. However, in this case, I would want to pass the information. And if you remember within the CSS, what was the other class name that I created? And that was room zero. And again, just to repeat, the reason why I didn't create a separate class for the single room is because we're going to do a little bit differently because there is a bit of issue here if you want to customize this even more. So there's limitations to doing this with a CSS. But in this case, I'm going to call this a rooms hero, which in fact will override the default ones that we did set up. So in this case, if we're going to head over to the rooms page, I will going to have a different image. Now, all the magic is obviously happening here within the CSS because I do have these two classes. What I'm saying here is the min height will be 100 view heights. Then I'm just getting rid of the height of the nav bar. I'm also setting up the background. Now, for the default one, I'm just looking for a default image from the images. Then I'm making sure that it's in the center. And here I'm just adding the flex box. So the banner that we're going to be adding later on will always, always be placed in the center. And for the room zero, I'm using all the properties with the values, but I'm just overriding them. I'm saying, you know what? I don't want 100 view heights, so I don't want 100% of the viewport. In fact, I want only 60. And then I also would want to change a image. Now, last but not least, like I said, we still would want to set it up the error page. So why don't we head over back to the error? And in this case, again, this will be very simply. We're going to say that we're not going to be getting any kind of specific class for that particular hero component where we're going to write hero from. And then let's say what from. Well, we can go to components again, hero. And why don't we render this dude? Why don't we say hero without any kind of classes or anything like that? Now, let's save that. And in this case, if I'm going to navigate in my browser to, let's say again, hello, I will going to be brought to my error page and which I will going to be able to set up later on in the next video, the banner component, which will have this button. So then we're going to be able to navigate back to a home page. We have our hero component. Good, good. And next one up, we have the banner. And I can tell you right away that we could set up everything within the hero. 
So where I do have the background, then within the banner, obviously, we're going to be placing all this information, whether that would be title, subtitle, this underline. And then as a child, we will be able to place something else. Now, in my case, I'm going to be placing each and every page. We're going to have some kind of link. And like I said, you could set this up everything in one component. Now, the reason why I split this up, because my idea was like this to show you that you can always reuse them however you'd like. Let's say in your case, you wouldn't want to use all of it together. You would have some kind of place in your project where you only want the background or you would only want the banner or you would want to place different children than just, let's say, button. So that way, if you make them smaller, the only annoying part is the fact that if you want to use all three of them together for each and every page, we're obviously going to have to do the import. Within home, we're going to have to not only import the hero, but also the banner and also the link and so on and so forth. So you could technically set this up as one big component. The reason why I'm splitting this up, because I find it a little bit more customizable, where if I want just to grab a hero component, I can just add it as an image. That's it. I don't have to actually get rid of the banner or anything like that. All right. That is just a side note. Then after the hero, I would want to create a component. And the component will be banner.js. Within the banner.js, again, this will be functional component. Then let's close the sidebar. And we will going to pass three props. So there's going to be option for title and subtitle. And title would be this guy. Then subtitle would be here. And then also we're going to be rendering the children. And just as a side note for anybody who is interested, what is the children? That is basically within the component. So if I'm saying here that I would want to render the children, whatever I'm going to place within this component, we're also going to be rendered. Otherwise, if you're not going to use these children, then whatever you're going to place within that component, in fact, will not be rendered. So we have hero, then we have banner. Like I said, we have three props. Again, we're going to use the children because I would want optionally to add this button. Now you don't have to. There's going to be cases where we're not going to be adding the button. But in most cases, we will going to add this link. And for that, we're going to say children. So we're going to render children, then title, and then subtitle. And what we would want to render? Well, there's going to be a div. I already did set up the class name. The class name will be banner. And then we will have a heading one. Now, heading one will be rendering the title. Then we will have a div. So simple div. As well as after that, there's going to be a paragraph and paragraph will be using to actually render the subtitle that we have. And last but not least, I will going to place the children. And what you need to remember that depending of where you're going to place these children, this is where they're going to be rendered. So the reason why this button is all the way in the bottom, because I just set it up. I said, whatever I'm going to be passing as children will be placed in the bottom. So if you're going to place them here, let's say above the title, they will be rendered above the title. We did set up the banner. Now, just to show you the classes that I'm using for the banner, this will be right after hero, like I said. So if you're following along, next section up, we have the banner. Here are the comments. Again, display online, some backgrounds, some colors, some paddings, text alignments, and so on and so forth. Then within the banner, we are pretty much done. We don't need anything. And now, again, this would be the part if some of you are annoyed by the imports where we would want to import this, of course. I will going to right away import link just so we can set it up everything together with the children. So I'm going to say import Then I'm looking for the banner from and I would need to say from where? Well, this is obviously from the components and the name will be banner. And like I said, if I want to render the children, I would need to place this within the hero and the kicker here that Within the hero, we already set up our flex box. Remember when we were saying that if there's going to be child, it basically will be placed in a center. Display flex, align item center, and justify content center. So this is exactly what we're going to do right now. We're going to say that we would want to render banner. The props are optional as far as the title and the subtitle is concerned. So for the title, I have luxurious rooms. So let's write title and I'm going to try to not uh, misspell it. And this is why I'm not going to repeat that, because usually when I talk and type my 
spelling is even more terrible. So hopefully this is luxurious written correctly. And then for the subtitle, let's write deluxe. Deluxe uh, rooms starting, I don't know, at $2.99. So dollar sign $2.99. Let's uh, actually not close the banner, but let's just close the opening tag. And now I'd want to get my link. So what I'm going to say here, import, then we're going to be importing link from what? Well, we can use it react router down. Let's import that. And then, like I said, within the banner, this is where we're rendering the children. We're going to say a link. Now, this will link back to a rooms. When I say back, obviously, in the case of the homepage, this will be rendering or this will going to be navigating to the rooms. And then we can also add right away class name. Class name will be button primary. Now, where's the button primary in app CSS? Again, the fastest way probably will be BTN. And this is going to set up the class that I'm adding. So notice this is the CSS we're adding. And by the way, this is going to be something we're going to reuse all throughout the project. Then within the link, what we would want to render? Well, let's write our rooms. Let's set this up. And bummer. I don't see it here. And the reason for that is obviously because I'm looking at a hello, which is our error page. But if I'm going to head over back to the home, this is going to be my banner. And if we're going to click on a link, Notice now we're going to be navigating to the rooms. I also would want to set up the same way like we did in home. I also would want to do a banner or I'm sorry, not banner, the error page. So let's close the home. I think we can close the CSS. I don't think we need it anymore. And for the error, what we're going to do? Well, I think it's going to be a bunch of the same things where again, we have already hero imported. I do need to have my banner. So import banner from and uh, that components banner. And I also would want the same thing with a link. So import. And then I need to have it as a name import link. Then where? Well, this is coming from the react router down. And then again, within the hero, there's going to be a banner within a banner, there will going to be a link. So let's write banner. Then let's write title. Title will be 404. Uh, subtitle, let's write page not found. Page not found. Let's close this banner for now. And then within the banner, again, let's actually uh, set up the link. Now, in this case, this will be directing us back to the home page. So link component that we just got from React Router to then home page. Class name, in this case, again, we're using BTN primary, primary, and by the way, I can close it here. And then within the link, we would want to render return home. So let's go up a little bit to return, return home. Let's save that. And now if I'm going to navigate on my current recording to some kind of hello page, this is what's going to be rendered. And check this out. So I have 404. Page not found, and then now we can navigate back home. Let me double check with a finished project what's happening with the rooms. And within the rooms, I do have this banner still with just a title, so not subtitle as well as the link. So this is exactly what we need to do within the rooms. Let's check it out the rooms. Let's copy and paste it. In this case, we will gonna obviously rename that we are not looking for the banner. We're I'm sorry for the hero. We're looking for the banner. Then let's close that. And again, we'll need to do the same thing. Import link from and react router DOM. From react router DOM, react router DOM. And same old spiel here. We're going to be looking for the banner. Hero within the banner and then banner. And again, I already said it once, but I'm going to repeat it twice. If you don't like to be this way, where you have a bunch of small components, you can obviously combine it in the one if this is really what you want. Now, in my case, I just thought that I'm going to show you how we would do it if we have a bunch of small components. But the same way you can just set up one component. For the banner, the title will be just our rooms. Title our rooms and we'll have no subtitle. So since we have no default one, no nothing, then nothing will be rendered. 
And then in this case, where we're navigating back home, so again, link to and why don't we set up again forward slash and two, and obviously, we would need to write something within that link. And in that case, we're going to write our return home. And we also would want to add that class name with a button. So class name btn primary. Let's save that. And this is going to be my rooms also. So once we navigate to the rooms, I will going to have this massive banner and I can navigate back home. Then next one up, we don't have search rooms that in fact will be the last component that we're going to be working on. But we do have our home. And within the home, we have the services. So that will be the, our next component that we're going to create. Excellent. We did set up everything that we wanted with a hero as well as the banner. Next one up, we have services that will be rendered only in the home page. And within the services, we're also going to create one component that we will reuse later on, which will be titled for the sections. So notice how we have services titled and featured rooms, so on and so forth. That way, we are going to create both of these components right now. Okay, now let me open up the sidebar. I would want to close everything that I have currently open. I don't need it. And then within the components, let's create two of them. So first one will be services JS, which will be a class based component. So let's type RCC. This is our going to be our component. Let's write uh, hello from hello from services. And then we can right away import the component that we currently don't have, which will be title. So from and then that title component will be in the same folder. So within the components, so let's just write title. And we obviously don't need to have the extension. Then once we have the services, why don't we create the actual title component? So title JS, this will be a functional component. And we will going to be expecting one prop, the name will be title that will be rendered. Once we're actually working with this component, the class name for this particular component that I have set up in CSS is section title within the div, the title will be displayed within the heading four like so so let's say that we are going to be rendering this title prop and right after that there will going to be a div which will be the underline let's save this title first and foremost we can also save the services but what i would like to do right now is get rid of everything that i had currently so hello from services and let's just say that i will going to be rendering my title component and the name i guess will be what well i think it just went with services so I can say title prop, you will be equal to services. Let's close out this particular component. And then like I said, we would want to render this only in home page. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to head over to the home. And then right after the link, and by the way, we can close the sidebar, import, and then not the title, but actually services that we will going to render in a second. So from and then we're heading over to components. And then within the components, there will going to be a services component. And right after the hero, we would want to render services. Now, the issue right now is going to be that we will try to render two adjacent component. So the issue would be fixed by adding a react fragment. So either I can write react fragment or not create factory. I could just type react fragment or the short case shortcut would be just angle brackets, as well as the closing angle brackets. Let's close out the fragment. And now let's render our services. Now we don't need to pass anything here. The services will be a component on its own. So I'm going to write services and services should be rendered. Now at the moment, we only will going to have a title. And by the way, we do need to navigate back to the home page. And yep, this is going to be my title. Again, if you're interested in the CSS, just head over to the app CSS. Uh, I believe it was actually globally. Let me check title and then sexual title is right after the banner. So aligned it in the center, added some font size, letter spacings, the color, the main color that I'm using, as well as this underline. OK, that is as far as the app CSS is concerned. And why don't we head over back to the services? 
And obviously, there's a bunch of other things that we would need to add here in the services. First and foremost, we would want to display a bunch of these icons. So I have four icons, and we already have the React icons working. So it will be very simply where we're going to say import. Now there is four icons that we're looking at. So cocktail, then FA hiking, hiking, and then FA shuttle van, shuttle van. And last one will be beer. Now all of them will be from, and then again, react icons forward slash font some icons. And once we have these imports, I would want to set up the state again. So technically, we could set this up globally in a context API, which we're going to take a look at later. But I just thought that since these are kind of dumb components anyway, meaning we're just rendering the icons, we might as well can do it locally here within the services uh, component. So let's set up state. State will be object. Within the object, we're going to set up one array services that will be my array and each and every item within this array will be the an object now we're going to have a few properties here the first one will be the icon so i'm going to go with a cocktail one first then title let's write that this would be free free cocktails cocktails and then i would want some info and for that i'm just going to get some lorem ipsum and let's say I'm going to go with 10 words. So let's say lorem 10. And I'm just going to grab this text. So within the icon, I'm going to write info. And that property will be equal to this text. Now, like I said, I would want four of them. So what we would need is copy and paste it four times or three times. So we would have four. I'm just going to add some commas so we don't have any issues. And then we obviously need to change these values where this is not going to be hiking anymore, where I could just select them three right now. And let's just write hiking. That will going to be my second one. Then let's select next two. And let's write FA shuttle van. And last one will be very simply beer. FA beer. Okay. We also need to change some texts here. This obviously is not going to be um, free cocktails. We can write endless. Hiking like so, then we don't need a free cocktails. We would probably need free sh shuttle. And then last one will be strongest beer. Strongest, strongest beer. Let's save that. And after that, we would want to obviously render that. So what I'm going to do right now is get rid of this div. We're going to go with the section. Section, we're going to have some class name. Now, the class name is important when I say some, of course. Services, that is the class that I'm using for the styling. Then within the services, the first one will be title. That will be rendered first. And after that, we're going to have one more div with a class of services. Services center. Now, within this div, I would want to render this list. There's a few options. I can obviously do this above the return, get my array, or I can just do it straight in the JSX, which is going to be this case. So I'm going to say this dot state map. And no, you know what? First of all, I need to access that array. So I'm going to say services. Since services is an array, I can use the map method. And then each and every item within this array, I'm going to pass it as an argument in my callback function. So I'm going to say you particular item, I would want to do something with you. And as far as uh, the mapping is concerned, we might as well, you know what, do the index because we're going to have to add key. So why don't we say item, which will refer to each and every item in the list, as well as the index. And now we would want to set up some kind of return where we had a simple array. And now we would want to wrap this in the JSX. Now, the way this is going to work, I'm going to say, all right, so there will going to be article for each and every item in array. Now the key prop we need to use every time we're rendering the list. And since the key prop needs to be unique, I will going to use the index. And in this case, it doesn't matter because it's not going to be changing. Normally, if it's something like a list that's changing, let's say within the rooms, you should never, never do that. But since again, this is just a dumb uh, components list where we just have the icons, I think we can just cheat a little bit and add index for the key. 
as well as I would want to add a class name and the class name is service. So this is what I added in the CSS. Now, what will be within the article? Well, first, there's going to be a span and we're going to be accessing actually I item icon. So each and every item in a list, we're going to have the icon. That is obviously the property that I have like so. Then let's copy and paste the span two more times. But you know what? I actually didn't want span. My apologies. We're going to have, in fact, heading six. Uh, this will be item title, item title. And then last one will be info. Now, info will be in a paragraph. So we might as well go to paragraph tags. And then let's add uh, item info, item info. And let's save that. And voila, we're going to have all the icons here as well as the text. Now, it looks like I did mess up a little bit because at the moment for the free first one, I don't have free cocktails. So I have everything written here uh, with a camel case, but then rest of them I didn't. So probably I would want to add here a little bit of CSS. Now let's head over back to app CSS. First and foremost, I'm going to show you where we are obviously getting it. So we have services, then services center. This is for styling where all throughout the project, I'm using grid and I'm using this grid template columns where basically you can set up the repeat function. Then with the repeat function, we can have either auto fit or auto fill. So with auto fill, this is going to make sure that the columns fill out the whole screen with auto fill. If there would be extra space, it would add a empty column, which by the way, we're going to use later on within the uh, rooms section where we are actually doing the filtering. And then we are using the min max where the first value is the minimum of the actual column. So minimum would be 255 pixels. And then second one is one fraction. Now this says what would be the max and within the grid. This just means one value from the screen size. So let's say one fraction would be one part of the screen. Okay. Now, what in reality means that this is going to span as much as it can until it is actually able to fit two columns in one line. So that would be the shortcut. And then for letter spacing, I'm obviously working with heading six. So here I can just add text transform uppercase like so. And we can save that and notice now I'm having everything uppercase, but probably capitalize would be better. Capitalize and now all my texts are capitalized. And if you want to do a little bit more info on one fraction, let's say that would be one unit of the screen. So if you have, let's say, the screen size, so one fraction would be one unit. So if you have one fraction, one fraction, that will be a two column layout. So what we're saying here is that as I'm going to be increasing the screen size, check this out, it's going to get bigger, 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 bigger. Now, the moment it will be able to place both of these with a minimum size of 255, then we'll have a two column layout. Okay. Since this is a React project, obviously, we're not going to focus too much on CSS, but I just wanted to tell you that all throughout the project, this is probably going to be most used and useful property as well as the value. Okay. We have our services set up. Let's check it out in our recording. I'll head over home and yep, we have the services. So next one up, what do we have in the final project? We already have the featured rooms. So first, why don't we talk about what we have in our data, why the data is structured in a particular way. And then we're going to start working on setting up the context because in fact, I want to access the rooms data using the context API. Before we start working on our next section, and even before we start working on setting up the context API, let's look at the data that we got from the setup files. And let me explain why I was setting up this data this way. Well, first and foremost, let me tell you why we in fact are including this data. So my idea is was very simple. Later on at the very end, we will check it out how we can set up everything externally within the contentful. Now, I apologize if some of you actually pronounce this contentful. I already have used to, I guess, saying contentful. So if some of you are annoyed by that, again, my apologies. But 
either contentful or contentful. And in order to do that, I did want to set up the data where we can finish the whole project just by using the local data. Because what I've noticed from the courses and from tutorials, a lot of times people have actually issue of connecting. Now, that is not the reason why, because the service is bad, because usually there's some kind of bug or something like that. Somebody misspells the name or something like that. And what happens is that, let's say if that would happen in the very, very beginning, person gets frustrated and just moves on to a different project. So my idea was very simple, where I did want to create a local data that we can use all throughout the project, build the whole project. So you shouldn't have no issues of accessing it, using it, uh, I don't know, modifying it, and so on and so forth. And at the very, very end, I'm going to show you how we can actually set up this data in the contentful, and then get this data to our application. And obviously, we're just going to flip it. There's going to be one place within the context API where we're getting our local data. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to change a few lines of code, and our whole application is still going to work. So that's the main idea. Now, that leads me to a second point of, as you're looking here, like I said, first and foremost, these are just the images that we're using. So each and every room obviously has a bunch of information about it. You can think of it as a big object that has images, it has all kinds of information about it. And these are all the local images. So what I did here is just reference them. And then I added to all those objects. Now, each of them has obviously a separate image, but you understand the idea. So there's a room object and that room object has particular image. Let's say image number one, image number two, and so on and so forth. Then as you're looking at it, you might be a little bit questioning my sanity. You would be like, okay, first of all, okay, I see that this is an array. This is an export default. That's all good. But what is this all about? Why this dude couldn't just do ID equals to one and then rest of it be name slug. Why is there a system? Then this is an object. Then we have an ID. Then we also have the same thing with the fields. And don't make me even get started on the images where I have the images array, then each and every item is an object. And then the actual image is within the fields, within the file, and within the URL. All right, now let me explain what's happening. First and foremost, each and every item we're going to have these keys where you have the ID, where you have the name, slug, type, price, size, and you can obviously see all them as you're looking at the final project, as well as as you're looking to a single page where we go and look at information about each and every single page. We have a price, size, and yada, yada, yada. Now, the reason why we're adding so much information, because I would want to have a nicer filtering where we have more options to filter it. Trust me, I could just set this up with one type and that would be fine. But I just find it a little bit more interesting where we have multiple things that we can actually sort it through. Now, let me tell you the most important thing. Why there is a specific structure to this? Well, it's very simple. Like I said, at the very end, I would want to flip it where we are using all the time the local data. And at the very end, we're going to connect to the contentful and we're going to use the external data. Now, what I don't want to do is set up the whole application and then be like, OK, so now we're going to rebuild everything just because the data is coming back like this. So the short answer is that when we are going to be accessing our data from Contentful, this is going to be their structure. Now, obviously, they were going to have more information. So the structure will going to be the same. But as you're going to be looking at a systems property, there's going to be a bunch of things. So the only thing that we're looking for is the ID. But there's going to be other things. If you want, you can obviously access them. But that way, when we are actually accessing the information from the contentful, nothing will going to break. Now, I understand in the beginning, you would be like, OK, so we could have set this up much more easier. But I just find it more better if we do it this way, where we have our original setup already, like we were going to be getting the information eventually from the external source. And yes, of course, we are going to have to do some kind of formatting where as we're working with our application, as we're accessing this data, also, this is not going to make sense. So within the context API, we're, we're going to set up the function that we're going to format. 
where basically we're gonna get one object just with these properties ID, name, slug, breakfast, blah blah blah, and then as well as extras and images, we're gonna be just a simple array with a images property here, and we're gonna be able to access them because it would be the pain each and every time as you're working with an application. If let's say you want to access this image, this is not gonna make sense, but you would have to do this regardless. So even though you would be getting this externally, you would still have to do some kind of formatting. So I think it's much more better if my original data is going to be exact same structure as the data we're going to be letting on. And right from the scratch, we were going to set up a function that we're going to format our code, our basically our data. And then we're just going to get back the data that we would normally work with. Once we talked about the data, why it was structured, why it was created in the first place. Now let's talk about how we were going to be distributing our data. And as we're looking at our application, it would be very easy to set this up locally for each and every component. So let's imagine we have this featured rooms. And by the way, I can tell you right away that the way I'm accessing the feature rooms is that on each and every object, we will going to add the featured property where for most of them, this is going to be false. And the rooms that I would like to show will be equal to true. And we could set this up, like I said, where we're just going to have this featured rooms component. Then we just access the array data that we had separately, filter it out and show it. However, what I wanted to do is create one place where we're going to be storing all the information, our data that we will eventually we're going to get from Contentful. And currently, we're going to get from our data file. And then we're just going to take a look at how we can distribute it around our application. And you could definitely do it with the Redux. But what we were going to do is we were going to check it out the React Context API. And again, there's many resources you can find, but I just find this one to be most straightforward. Obviously, we're going to do the coding, but just to give you an idea, we will first going to create a context object. Now, once we create a context object, then we have an option of passing some kind of default value, or in our case, we're just going to say that we don't want anything. Then we have access to two components. One of them will going to be provider. Notice provider react component that allows consuming to subscribe to the context changes, meaning this component will going to allow the access to our context all throughout our application our react component tree. And then we have a consumer where the consumer will be in fact, subscribing for that. Now, obviously, we're going to get to that. One thing I would want to point out that this value property or prop is very important, because this is where we're going to be placing pretty much all our application. We were going to do this in a few steps where first of all, we're just going to set up the context, then we're going to start accessing the data from our array. And last, we're going to do that formatting like I was talking to you. Okay, now, first and foremost, let's do a simple access. And by the way, I will going to be returning here, because we will look at few ways how we can access it. Because as we're working with the other component with a consumer component that also comes with a context object, we have multiple options, we can use the actual context where we're using context type. We also can use the render tops. That is also an option. Notice this would also want to be one of the syntaxes. We also have an option of actually using higher order components. Also something we're going to look at as well as using one of the use hooks or name of the hook would be use context, but that basically be one of the hooks. Okay. All right. Now let's start working on our setup. First and foremost, I would want to create a context. However, in this case, I will not going to place it within the pages or the images or components. In fact, I'll do it directly in the source. So I'm going to say new file. And we're going to call this context JS. Now you can obviously name it with capital letter doesn't really matter. Uh, next one up, we would want to create a class based component. Now at the moment, it will not going to matter. But I'm going to show you in a second why actually I'm doing this. The name currently is context, and that's not what I would want. So instead, I'm just going to say that this will be called the room provider. And now I would want to set up my context API. And the way I would do that, I would need to come up with some kind of name. 
so const and I'm gonna call this room context, and this will be equal to react. And then we have that method available where the method would be create context, and I'm not gonna pass any kind of default value. So now I do have my context, and if you remember, now I had access to two components. So the first one was a provider, and the second one was a consumer. So the provider was, in fact, responsible for allowing all the components in the component tree to access it. Now, obviously, we do need to wrap that component tree with that room context provider. And then the consumer was used to access that information. Now, I could technically do something like this, where I say room context, I do need to add, obviously, my value. So context, and by the way, let me spell this correctly. Context, I'm going to call this provider, and then I need to use the value. However, the reason why I created the class, because what we were going to do is we were going to set up the state here, and then we're going to place all our information in state, create methods that actually operate with these state values, and then we're going to pass it down to the value because this will give us way more flexibility. Now, the kicker here is that not only we can pass, like, let's say, a simple string of hello, in fact, we can pass the whole object. So, and that is the case where we're going to be working with a state. So, how this is going to look like I do have my room provider. So, instead of wrapping my whole component tree, with the room context provider and then value, I will going to set it up here within this room provider. So within that specific class. So let's like that we're going to be looking for the context. Then the name is provider. And at the moment, I'm just going to set this equal to a simple hello. Okay. Now, nothing fancy here. Now, let me make sure that I do close it. So I have room context. Then I need to go with a provider, but I definitely. 100% sure need to make sure that children are being rendered. And this actually made me uh, mess a bit. So let me close it properly. And then once I have this room context provider that I actually accessing from my room context, but since I'm going to be wrapping my whole component tree, I do need to make sure that I'm accessing the children. Now, the children in the class based component are this dot props. And the name is self explanatory children. So this would be the provider. Then we also do need to create a consumer because we would want to access the data. Now, the most simplest way would be const room consumer again, name, however you would like consumer. And then we need to use the room, obviously context, since that is the context we created and then set this equal to a consumer. Now, last but not least, I would want to export them. And at the moment, by default, this is exporting room provider. And that's not what I would want. So what I'm going to say is that they're just going to be a simple class. And then we're just going to export it like so, where we have the export. Then I'm going to say that I would want to export room provider. Now, that is obviously the class that we just created. Second, I'm going to export room consumer. And last but not least, there's going to be a case where we would want to use the whole context. So that's why we we're going to actually export as well room context. And obviously, we're going to go one by one, where some cases we would want to access room context. In some cases, we would want to access room consumer. Now, once we have exported all this, then what we can do? Well, I could technically go back to AppJS and just wrap my whole component tree. But since I already have the React router DOM, it would make more sense if we're going to head over back to the index and, in fact, wrap everything, the router, the app, in my provider. OK, now, in this case, I do need to say import. Then I'm going to be looking for the name export, since obviously we named them. And the name was the room provider. And then this will be from the context, which is in the same actually directory. So let's access the context. And now let's wrap it. Let's say room provider. We're going to wrap around the router as well as the app. So I can select these suckers here, get them out and copy and paste it. And now I do have my provider. 
at the moment, nothing magical happened. I understand this might be a bit of a bummer where you're like, okay, this, I mean, what is happening here? We did all this work and nothing magically happened. Yes, that is true. But just to give you an idea, what would you normally do? So let's say that you have multiple components that would want to use some kind of data. Well, eventually you would want to lift your state. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that we have a route with the rooms. Then I also have the home. And then as you're noticing, my services or featured rooms that we're going to create later on will be within the home. So what you normally do, you would set up the state somewhere here, and then you start passing down. You would be like, okay, so I'm going to pass these functions as well as the properties that I have on a state down to rooms component or the home component. And what's happening that as you're doing that, you're passing, you're doing basically a prop drilling where you're passing those props down unnecessarily because the component that's going to be using is just sitting pretty much wrapped in three other components, but you do need to pass it through. So if I start with an app, I'm going to have to pass the home. Home is going to pass down to featured uh, rooms and then so on and so forth. So what context allows us to do is avoid that step where even though the section that I am going to be using my data will be in fact within the home, I don't need to pass anything within the home. So we will going to avoid that step. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's say we have the home. And like I said, we will have to create a featured rooms section. We're all going to be looking for at a featured rooms. Then normally, what would you? Well, you would pass it to a home. Then from the home, you're going to find wherever yours component and then pass it down. But I'm going to show you in a second how we can actually omit that step. So within the components, let's create featured rooms. And at the moment, we're just going to be rendering, obviously, that one silly thing that we had. Remember when we passed basically what? Within the context, we had a simple hello. So first, we're going to access that. And then, of course, later on, we're going to set up everything properly where we will going to access uh, whatever we have currently in the state. OK, now let's head over to the featured rooms. This will be a functional component or I'm sorry, no class based component. So let's say and first of all, I do need to name this properly. So let's rename JS. That's the first thing that I would want. Then class based component. Voila, here you come. And then hello from featured rooms, right? Let's save that. Then what I would like to do is head over to the home, import it. So right after services, import featured rooms. And let's say that this is obviously in the same or no, it's not in the same folder. It's actually in components folder. Then within the components folder, we had featured rooms folder. Let's save this. And then right after services, let's check it out what do we have. So we'll have a featured rooms. And we are rendering them now at the moment. Again, I just have one silly hello from featured rooms. Again, nothing magical happened yet. But let me show you where the real magic comes in, where again, we have multiple ways how we can access it, whether that's going to be render props, whether that's going to be hooks. But the first one we're going to look at is where we set up the static. Then the name here is important where we have context type. And we set this equal to the context that we just created. Now, how this is going to work? Well, this is going to work where we do have the name, of course, for the context that we created, and we're going to set this equal. To. Now, there is one uh, easy mess up that I did where I would probably want to actually create this like this, where this is going to be my value. And now I'm going to have my hello. Then within the featured rooms, like I said, First and foremost, we would want to import this. We would want to import my whole context, not just the consumer, but the room context. The way we're going to do that, import, then we're going to be looking for a room, context, from, and now we're going to go up the tree, or not the tree, actually directory. Then we're going to be looking for components, or no, not components, sorry. Context is actually in the same one, or where it is. Let's figure out. So we have context right here. I don't know. I was staring at it, but 
for some reason, I cannot see it. And then, like I said, we would need to follow these steps where first and foremost, we're going to set up the static context type, and this will be equal to our context. All right, now let's write that. Let's say static. Then proper naming was what context type. Context type is equal. And now we're setting this equal to a room context. So that's the first step. Now, the next step is I would want to access this value. So in this case, I'm just going to say const. And we're going to set this equal to a simple value. Now, if I want to access this, I need to use this dot context. So this dot context. And why don't we right away do a console log? So I'm just going to say, first of all, value. And why don't we do also here where we're uh, showing what we have? So I can just add a curly braces where I want to access the JavaScript. And the moment I save it, check this out. Now I know that it's hard to see, but here in the bottom, I do have my hello. And in fact, if I'm going to head over to my project, to my recording, and if we're going to do inspect, you're also going to notice in a console where I have the hello. Now, this is magic because we actually went around the home page. We went around whatever other component would be there. So we didn't have to set up anything in the app.js, pass it down, and then in fact access it. We directly access it using the context API. Now, if I'm going to change that, and if I'm going to say, I don't know, hello world, now check this out. Now what I'm going to have here is hello world. So whatever values we're going to be placing there, we're going to be accessing. Of course, of course, the string is the most basic one that we can use. Like I said, why don't we check it out? What we have in an object? Because let's say that I'm going to have like some, I don't know, greeting. Then within the greeting, I'm going to say hello. And let's also use name. And then we're going to set up John. Now, in this case, I don't want to pass here the string. Instead, I want to pass the object. And then we have a few options. We could access properties one by one. So I could set up in my new object, let's say a property by the name of greeting, and the value is going to be coming from my state object. So let's write this dot state and whatever property name. So again, since I'm looking for a greeting, I could just type here greeting, or I could use a JavaScript object spread operator, where instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to select object whose properties I would like to copy. So in my case, that is going to be state. And then I'm just going to type here dot 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 this dot and state. So in this case, we are going to copy and paste all the properties that we have within the state object. Now, currently we have two of them, but of course I could add 10,000 of them and all of them are going to be copied. Now at the moment, obviously there's going to be big fat error. Now, the reason for that error is because within the featured rooms, I'm right away saying, okay, so get me the whole value. Now, that is not what I want since right now I have the object there. So let me delete that. Let me re-render and check this out. So what we have here is greeting, hello, and name of John. That way, instead of just working with the whole value, I could say that instead of creating some kind of variable, we can right away do a destructuring from the object that we're getting back. Again, we got our room context. It's important that you pass here, not the consumer, but your whole context. Set this equal to the context type. And then you're going to have access to that context using this dot context. And then, like I said, we would want to destructure where I'm going to say name and greeting. And we can use maybe here name, name John from. Uh, hello. And by the way, we can probably change this hello as well. Let's say greeting. Now let's check it out. And what do you see here? Well, I have hello, John from featured rooms. So hopefully you understand the basics of the context API, where most of the work that we're going to do be in fact within this context JS, where starting from next video, we will going to get our rooms and we're going to set up them in the state. And then we're going to pass them exactly the same way down. And our whole work is going to start where we're going to create a bunch of functions here that we're going to work with state and so on and so forth. But these would be the bare bones of how we can start working 
with a context API that creates provider and a consumer. We wrap the provider uh, within our component tree or component tree gets wrapped with a provider. And then we have multiple ways how we can access it. So we looked at the way how we do it within the class based component. Now, this is important. You're not going to be able to do it in a functional component. This is the reason why we're going to check it out other options as well. But this probably would be the most simplest one in class based because the render props is a little bit. I mean, it just takes a little bit of wrapping your mind around it. But static context type, get the context that you have, and then you have access to whatever you have currently in your context. Once we understand the general idea behind the context API, why don't we tailor it to our application? So we're going to do our setup. I will going to get rid of this greeting as well as name, because at the moment we're going to do later setup anyway. And I was going to get rid of it. Just remember that we were going to have to use this that context in order to access it. Then we're going to head over back to a context JS. And as a side note, if you are really just passing one string, you could do something like this. However, it doesn't really make sense that if you're going with all this setup just to pass down one string. Okay, so in most cases, this is exactly what you're going to see. But then remember that if you're passing here the object, you do need to have a two sets of curly braces. Otherwise, this is not going to work. That's the reason why it's probably more useful to place that string within the curly braces. So then at least you understand how would be the general setup. All right. Now I also want to add different values in the state. But before I do that, why don't we import all the items that we have in the data? And like I said, I do have it as a default export. So if we're going to check out the data all the way on the top, you'll notice that export default. And that means that we could name this however we would like. But I will going to name this items again. The reason why I'm naming this items when we're going to be accessing the contentful, it will going to be placed on the property by the name of items. That's the only reason. So let's do from now. This will be exactly in the same folder. So we're just accessing the data. And then before we do anything, I would want to change some values within the state. So there's going to be a rooms property which will store all our information about our rooms. Then we're going to have sorted rooms. Now, the reason for that is when we're going to be filtering our rooms, this is the array that we're going to be rendered. But then if we would want to get, let's say, information about all the rooms, that's when we're going to be rendering our original rooms array. Okay. Now, after that, we have featured rooms. Featured rooms will be in home, these three rooms. And at the moment, again, this will be set to featured rooms. And then we're going to set up here a empty array. Now, last one here, we're going to be loading. And by the way, when we start setting up the filtering, there are going to be more properties in a state. But I just don't want to overwhelm you. So why don't we start with the first four, which allow us to complete a big part of our application. And then once we get to filtering and sorting, that's when we're going to set up more properties here. So let's set uploading to true. Now, as we're getting locally data, as we're getting this data locally, of course, this is an overkill because we will have instant access to our data. But like I said, our general goal is to set up everything where we were going to be getting this using the external data. So eventually, at the very end, we're going to have the function. Let's call this get data. And we were going to run that function when the component will going to mount. And what we were going to do right now is obviously we're just going to access the, these items directly from our data. But there's a reason why I'm not setting up directly in a state. So again, I want to show you how we would do it later on anyway, when we're accessing the external data. And currently we're going to do it with our local data. However, what I would like to do is once the component mounts, then we're going to make sure that loading is in fact. Now, at the moment, you're not able to see that. But once you refresh the page again, because this is getting instant access, once actually you would have, let's say, some kind of slower internet connection, you would be able to see the GIF that we're going to be placing later on. Okay. Now, we do have this get data that we for sure are not going to do anything right now. 
but I would want to set up the life cycle method. So when this component mounts, so component did mount, then I would want to update these values in a state. And that's when we're going to update this, whether this is going to be true or false. So first and foremost, why don't we set up component did mount? Then within the component did mount, there is going to be a let rooms. So that will be my variable. And I'm going to set this equal to this dot and the function that we haven't created. Now, this function is again format data. And then we're going to set this equal to a items. And again, once we're going to get external data, I know I keep on repeating this, but but this will going to make much more sense later on as we're getting this external data. Currently, this function will just going to work as a formatter. So we're going to be getting all the items here. So we're passing them down into this function. And what I would like to do is eventually just to get a normal object where my data structure is not like this. Okay, because this is going to be much more easier for us to work with. So obviously, you understand that next thing we would need to set up this function. So I'm going to say format data. Now this format data as a parameter is just going to get some kind of I mean, you can write array, but I'm just going to call this items. But of course, understand that this is the argument where we are actually passing our data that we got from the items. And this is just the parameter that I'm writing here. Okay. Now, what I'm saying here is let and first and foremost, I would want to loop through my items that I have loop through the data that I got here. So first and foremost, I'm going to say temp items, temp items, this will be equal to items map. So I'm iterating over my array. And each and every item here, I'm going to call this that this will going to be my item. Now there's going to be a quite a bit of destructuring. So for sure, I'm going to create a curly braces. And the return is going to be here at the very bottom. Now, first and foremost, I would want to access this ID. So each and every item, we're going to have the system property and then this ID property on it. Okay. Now, the way I can do that, I can just say, okay, let ID is equal to item. So each and every object, we're going to have systems property. We're going to have the ID property in there. Now, that's first one. Then I would want to get those images because, like I said, accessing these images this way, we have images array and then one object, second object, third object doesn't really make sense. So you can say let images is equal. Now item, we're going to have what? Well, the images in fact sitting within this fields. So we have the fields, then within the fields, we have the images. So this is the reason why we type fields, then we type also images. And then I need to map over those images. Because again, each and every item there was in fact an object. So what I can say is each and every item, you will going to have what? Well, I could just return what I had in there, right? So each and every item has fields, file, URL. But what I'm interested in is only this URL. So what I can say as I'm mapping or looping over this images array, just return me image, fields, file, and URL. And that's it. Now our array, in fact, which is going to be simple array with all these values. Then I would want to create a new room object. So I'm going to say room. This is just going to be simple object. However, to access all the properties that are within each and every item fields property, I'm going to use dot 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 and item fields. And again, if you remember, this is JavaScript object spread operator, where within each and every item, we do have the fields property. Now the fields property is already object itself with more properties. So what I'm doing here is I am creating a new object. And I'm just going to copy the properties from the fields object. And then after that, once we have copied all the properties, we have two options. If that actual property is already within the object, if we're going to come up with a new value, we're going to override that property. Now, if that property is not within that object, well, we're just going to add that property to our new object. So in our case, we would like to add two properties, one by the name of the ID and the other one by the name of images. Now, what happens though, images is already there within the fields. Remember, images was already there. Now, the problem was that images 
had this nested structure. However, in our case, we already have flattened out that structure. So what I could do here is I'm going to say there's going to be an images property. Now, since that property is already there, essentially, we are overriding this. And I could just say images like so, where I set this equal to my variable. But please remember that, of course, we're using ES6. So I could just write here images. That's it. That would be exactly the same like we just wrote previously. And then after that, like I said, I would like to add the ID property. Now, since the ID property is not within the fields, as you notice, scroll up and down, you're not going to notice this ID property because it is sitting within the systems. That's when we are creating a new property in our room object. So this is our room. And what I would like to do right now is just return now room. And what happens? Well, I'm getting back this temp items, correct? So I'm looping over my array. I did all this destructuring and reformatting. Now, the last thing from this function, I would want to return temp items. And then next one up, since we are obviously calling this function. So I'm saying this dot format data, then I'm passing the array that we got from the local data. And I would want to first of all, console log just to show you what is happening with a rooms. Okay. And then after that, I'm going to kind of give you a brief idea of what actually happens. Okay, later on, when we're going to get this data. So I will going to head over to a recording. And now check this out. I have an object, which I'm console logging with 13 items. And now notice what we're actually rendering. Now this makes much more sense, right? So this is more cleaner, where each and every item is just an object. Now it has the breakfast capacity, all these values and check it out the images. Again, this is not a nested object anymore. We access everything here that we wanted, which in fact is just that URL. And just to give you again, I'm going to repeat this probably already for the fifth time, but we were going to have this get data. Now, once we're going to get get data or once we're going to run get data, we're going to get our data. Then we're going to run this this format data in the actual first function of by the name of get data. And then we're just going to run this this dot get data. Again, this will be at the very, very end. But I'm just explaining you why we're going through these actually steps, because what I would want to do is run this one when in fact it mounts again, it would be much more easier to for me to say, Okay, items pass in the rooms, but we would have to do all this extra work at the end of the day. Now, the only difference is where we're calling this format data. And the way this is going to work, we're going to say, Okay, so we got the rooms, awesome. And now I'd want to work a little bit more with the information that I have. Because notice, not only I'm looking for the rooms, I would want featured rooms, as well as I would want to probably set this loading to false. Because what I'm going to do is later on, we're going to pass this value down and the component is going to check. Are we still loading the information? If we are loading, then I'm going to show the spinner. If the information is there, then I'm going to display the items. Okay. Now, the way this is going to work, first and foremost, let's get the featured rooms. And now we are already working with our normal object. And when I say normal, of course, what I'm saying is this is just going to be simply to access. So that way I can say featured rooms is equal to rooms since obviously we have access to it and then filter it out, whatever you have for the featured rooms. So like I said, there's going to be a property with the value featured and we're just checking whether it's true or false. So I'm going to say each and every room, if you have room featured, if your property is in fact equal to true, you will be added to this featured rooms array. And then we also might as well just do the this dot set state. So let's write this dot set state. And now we'd want to change the values. And the values we want to change is for the rooms is also for the sorted rooms, featured rooms and loading. Now, at the moment at the very beginning, sorted rooms will have all the information the same like you would normally get the data. So since we would want to display initially all the rooms, they are going to be exactly the same. As we start filtering, you'll see why we're using the rooms. But what I would like to do right now is this that's the state. Again, we can use the S6 where I don't need to say rooms is equal to rooms, since I obviously named it exactly the same. Then I'm looking for featured rooms, which also is named the same. 
then the sorted ones is not exactly the same name. So I do need to write that sorted rooms will be equal to my rooms that I just got. And last but not least, we'll be loading off a false again. Not gonna make much sense currently this loading of false because we're getting our data locally. But once we're gonna be setting up getting the external data, it does matter that we in fact use this loading flag where if the data is still loading, we're not trying to render something. Okay, that would be our initial setup. And now check this out. We do have all this access in the state. So just to show you, and we're going to do it in the next video, the actual proper rendering. But at the moment, just to show you that we in fact have the featured rooms, I can just say that I would want to access this. So I can just call this as a variable const. And I'm going to call this featured rooms. So I'm accessing that value from the featured rooms, but I'm right away going to give it an alias or I'm just going to rename it. I'm going to say that this will be equal to rooms and I'm getting this from where where I'm getting this from context. And now let's check it out where if I'm going to do console log, let's console log and whether we are going to get rooms and let's see what we're going to have. And whoa, I have an empty array. Okay. Let's go back to context and figure out what went wrong. Let's scroll up and I can see that notice here. I didn't use featured should be featured, not feature. Now let's save that again. And voila, we have our array with three featured rooms. So now we can use this information, in fact, to display them. Before we start working on a logic, how we're going to be rendering all the featured rooms, we will going to use two components, one by the name of loading and the second one by the name of room. And as a side note, like I said, both of these components we will going to reuse in different parts of the application as well. Let's say, for example, room is going to be rendered also when we are rendering all the rooms, not just for the featured one. So what's going to happen right now is we're just going to set up the bare bones for rooms application where there's just going to be one text. Then I'm going to render the rooms that are in the feature rooms, and then we're going to work in the actual rooms component all together. Okay. Now for the moment, I just want to create the bare bones for our rooms component and set up the loading component. First and foremost, let's call this loading JS. And for that, this will be a just a basic functional component RFC, then what we would want to pass nothing as a prop, but we would want to have a div by the name and we're going to give this a loading. That is something that I already set up within my CSS. We might as well have a heading four. Let's write rooms data loading dot dot dot. And then I would want to import one of my GIFs. You can go with uh, gears if you want, because I have two of them. Basically, I have gears and I have the other one was the arrow. I think I'm going to go with the arrow. So if we're going to head over to the source, if you'll notice the images within the GIF, I don't know whether you can see that, but basically I have one of them, which is an arrow and the second one, which is a gear. So this is really up to you which one you would like. I think I'm going to go with an arrow. So I would want to import that. So I'm going to say import. I'm going to name this loading uh, GIF like so. And then from and now we're obviously looking for my images. So I'm going to say not data. We're going to go for the components. No, not components, images, then GIF. And then we're working with the name is loading and arrow arrow. And then the extension is GIF. And then right after the heading four, we're going to have the image. Then for the image, we're going to use loading loading and we're going to call this GIF. Then for alternative, I don't know, we can just skip this. I don't think this is going to be uh, doing a bunch of bad things if we're just going to skip alt altogether. Then I would want to import that in my featured rooms. So import, um, let's call this loading, of course, loading from and dot. And we have obviously the loading component. And instead of just looking for the rooms right after the ending text, you can just say loading and let's check it out whether our GIF is going to be working. Let's save that. 
and all the way in the bottom. Notice this is going to be my loading GIF. If you're interested again in the CSS, same old spiel. The difference would be that this class will be in my globals because, like I said, I will going to reuse it one more time. So, only thing I did is text capitalize, line center, and margin top. One, three. That's all what happened here. You can close the app CSS. And like I said, I would want to create a room, which at the moment we're just going to have some dumb text like hello from room. But then starting from not next video, next video, we're going to set up the functionality in the featured rooms. But then one after that, we're going to actually work on the rooms component. And at the moment, this will be a simple functional component, RFC. We're going to call this room and let's just go hello from room. Let's save that as well. We can close at the moment. Then we can close loading. We don't need it anymore. As well as for the time being, context is also not needed. Let's close the sidebar right after the loading. Why don't we get the rooms? Let's call this room or not rooms. Yeah, room from and we're going to go with uh, obviously my component by the name of room just so I can see that everything is being rendered properly. And let's say right before loading, I would go with a room component that I currently have. Let's save that. And I do see my little hello from room right after the feature room. So I know that I successfully created both of these components. Well, one of them completely and the other one just has the bare bones. And now I can start working with displaying all the featured rooms that I have in my application. We were going to start working on our logic just in a second, but I did a forgot that I do need the featured rooms title, meaning I do need to import the title component. So let's do that. We'll say import and we're looking for title component from and then where it is. It should be in the same directory. So let's just write title and let's save that. OK, that would be the first step. Then after that, remember when we were working with a context, I was telling you that we were going to use the loading again at the moment. Local data doesn't make much sense. Later on, we're going to be getting our data externally. We're going to make a whole lot of sense. So not only I would want to get featured rooms that I would want to rename it as rooms, but also I would want to get loading. I'm going to say get this property from the context. OK, now, once I have that, I don't care about the console logging anymore. I would want to loop through my rooms and in fact, set up right away the JSX. So I'm going to say rooms. And again, we can do it multiple ways. We can do it right in the JSX or we can just do it separately outside. And as always, with all my projects, I'm striving to kind of show you multiple ways. This is what I was talking about, where we are going to have a multiple options of how we can work with context. Now you can pick and choose which one you like. Of course, I would rather probably with class based components stick to this one instead of using render props. But I want to show you multiple options just in case you're like, hey, you know what? Maybe the other one makes sense. So previously we did our rendering within the JSX. Just remember, we can do it outside as well. So I can say rooms map. So I'm going to be again looping over my featured rooms array. Each and every room will going to be an object, of course, there, which I'm passing here as an argument in my callback function. And what I would like to return is not just a simple room. But I'm going to wrap that room in a room component that we just created. I do need to have the key since there is going to be a list. And each and every room, remember, had the ID. That's something that we didn't change. The only difference is we don't need to use the system anymore to access that. And then we were going to say that we're also going to pass a room prop with all information about that specific room. OK, so we're passing it down. Then I'm going to close this out. I would want right away to get rid of this room because usually what happens, I rendered the list and then there's an error because there's just one simple one. And we also would want to restructure this a little bit. So what I'm going to say here is this will be section instead of div first and foremost. And let's type here section as well. Then the section we're going to have a class. Now the class name is again important because it adds all the styling featured rooms like so. Then we're going to have our title, like I said, title and the title is expecting a title prop. Title prop will be featured rooms. That is the text that I would like to display here. Then after the title, I'm going to set up a, another div 
which we're gonna have a class name of featured room center again. This is for the whole layout with the grid, so this is important. So, div so class name, or I can just go with featured featured uh, rooms, and we're gonna go with center like so featured room center, and then within this div. I would like to get my ternary operator where I'm going to check if the loading is in fact in my context true, then I want to show this spinner. And the moment I'm going to get my data, obviously loading will be false. And then we are going to be displaying all the rooms. Okay, so that way, again, we're not rendering an empty array, which would be the case if the loading is true, because only featured rooms will going to have some kind of information. Once we're done with loading, once we're done with getting that data. And in this case, what I would like to say is that loading. So I'm going to check the property that I'm getting from the context. If you are true, if the data is still loading, then we're going to be displaying this loading component that we created in the last video. And if the data is there, then just do everything that we did here, where get me this rooms and just render it here. All right. Now let's save that. Of course, at the moment, we should have already some kind of rooms. And at this point, saying all oh, constant. Oh, yeah. So that is the issue. I should use let here because the moment I use const, I wasn't able to do it. And what I have here? Well, at the moment, I do have two loadings because I didn't delete this guy. So let me get rid of that one. But I do have my three rooms because obviously, once I run the component, did mount then loading is set to false. But let's imagine that we're waiting a long time. And I'll do that by just passing true. Then if we're just loading, then the user is going to know at least that okay, so we are getting that information sometimes. Again, probably you could say, well, I don't need this flag, and I really don't care. This is really up to you. But if you are doing some kind of data fetching, I think it makes a little bit more sense if you have some kind of flag where you are rendering only when you get that data. Awesome. We have ourselves featured rooms. The only problem is that this is currently a far cry of how our application would look eventually. So I think we can start working on a room component because this is where we're going to be displaying all the information about that particular room, whether that would be the price, whether that's going to be image and naming, as well as we're going to set up this link where once we click on a link, we will be directed to a specific single room page where there's just going to be information about this room. Obviously, we're going to work on this component after this, after we finish with the room. But in general, this is the idea where we're going to have our featured rooms. And then each and every room will be displayed as a component. And by the way, like I said before, this component, the room component, we will also going to reuse in our rooms page. So we're not going to have to do double the work. But in fact, we're going to do just once we're going to build our own component. And then we can display it all over the page. Okay. Now, after I have rambled on and on about the actual room component, why don't we start building it? We already have the file room JS. And here I would want to start firstly by importing the link. Now link will be imported obviously from the react router down. And the reason is very simple, because I showed you that I would want to link it to a specific single room page. So link from and then we go from react router DOM, of course, that is our import. And why don't we start working on what we're going to display within the room. Now I know that within the featured rooms, what am I doing? Well, I'm passing the prop by the name of room. And then I'm assigning everything that I'm getting for each and every room. So in the room component, I'm going to destructure first of all the prop that I'm getting first and foremost, and then I would destructure a little bit more. Where if you want to check it out, what kind of rooms are we going to be getting or what kind of information we as always can do a simple console log or you can use the react tools. This is really up to you. I'm going to use the console log this time where I should have three objects printed out on the screen because obviously I have three featured rooms. So let's head over to our recording. Let's see what we're going to have. And I should have in a console three objects. So console and sure enough, this is going to be three objects. And what I'm interested in is few properties. So first of all, I would want the images more specifically the first one, 
because that's gonna be the one that's displayed. Now again, this is really up to you. This is an array with four images, and the reason why we have multiple images because later on we're gonna have a single room page. We are gonna be displaying a couple of those images, and that was the reasoning there. And then what I would like to display as the main image would be the first one. Then I also would want to get the name, the slug that will be displayed in my URL. And then what else? What else? Uh, I think I will going to go with uh, price. So price is right here. So these are the things that we're looking for each and every object. And again, the same thing we're going to work within the room page. So what we can do here is const. We already know how we can structure using the S6. So I'm looking for name property, slug property, images property, which will bring me an array and price property here. And in this case, I can just say that I'm going to be looking for the room to be destructured. So room prop, and now we're destructuring. And now let's start working on our return. First and foremost, this will not going to be a div, but instead we're going to go with an article and I will going to add a class name. Now the class name will be room. Again, and this is something that we did already in the CSS. So I will going to get rid of this random text. Hello from room. And first and foremost, I would want the image container where I will going to have my image as well as the actual link that will going to link to a page to a different page. So let's start with that div image container. That will be the class. And then let's start by placing an image. So for the source. I will use this images array and I'm going to get the first one. I'm going to say images and then we're just going to say zero since this is an array and we'll have access to that particular image. Now, after that, we have a alternative one. So let's write single room and then let's save that and let's see what's going to happen. And what you should see is these three images for each of the featured rooms. Now, there's one thing that I definitely want to do right away which would be setting up some kind of default image, because here's the case. Well, let's imagine that I'm going to head over back to the data. And I know that I should have this presidential room, which, by the way, was going to be all the way in the bottom. And the reason for that, because I know that this is definitely featured, so I don't want to look for featured that way. And let's say that we comment this out. Let's say there's some kind of error where you're not getting this image from your data. So let's do that. And what you'll notice is that the single room in this case is missing. So I cannot see it that way. And this is not what I'm looking for. And by the way, I was actually very, very lucky because this was also featured. I didn't get the presidential. So let me again show this room and then scroll a little bit more down where I'm going to have my presidential. So now I'm going to comment this out and check this out. I don't see the room right now. I don't see the image because obviously I'm not getting it. And what we can always do is set up some kind of default where if I'm going to head over back to the room JS, let me close the sidebar here. I will going to import some kind of image, any kind of image from the images. And again, this is really up to you. You can obviously check what kind of image you're importing. I'm just showing you how we can set up the default image. So I'm going to call this default image. And then we're looking for the images folder. Then within the images folder, we're not going to be looking for GIF. Again, random image that I'm just picking. Normally, you would obviously research what kind of image you would want. And here we can use the or operator. So I can say, get me the zero images or one images or whatever images you would want from that array. However, if it's not there, if it's not at all in the array, what we can do is we can just say, just show me default image. So that way you don't have these surprises where let's say you have your application and it doesn't make sense where you should have some kind of image, but you don't. So I think this is a better, better look where we have at least some kind of image. Now I will going to head over back to data and of course show the presidential. There is no reason for us not to show it, but this is going to be nice fallback where just in case we don't have that particular image. Let's close the data. Now, next one up after the image, I would want to show the price. So still within this image of container, this is important. We will going to go with div by the class name of price top. And again, this is important to keep these class names. That's the reason why everything is going to be displayed this way. And I would want to access the price. So I'm going to say, first of all, dollar sign. Then we're going to be looking for the price like so. And we're going to also display a paragraph by the name of per 
night. Let's save that and check this out. We have nicely price displayed for each and every room. And then last but not least, still within this image container. Again, this is important, but not within this div, of course. Let's work on our link. So the link that will going to guide us to that single page. So how this is going to work? Well, first of all, I'm going to say link to. And now here's the question. So where are we linking? Well, if we're going to head over back to app.js, notice what we had for the single room. And I do need to close the sidebar right now, just so you can see it a little bit better, where the path for the single room was what? Well, we had the path, of course. Then we were heading over to rooms. And then we had our URL parameter, where I'm just passing the name by the slug. But of course, again, we can name this however we would like. What's more important is what kind of information we're going to be setting up here. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to say, okay, so first of all, I'm going to have to create a curly braces because I will going to have to use the variable and the variable, by the way, will be slug. And then we are going to set up obviously the template literal and we're going to write rooms. So first of all, we wouldn't want to navigate to rooms and then within the rooms, we're going to access each and every room that we have selected. So the slug will going to allow us to do that. Now, currently, of course, it will not do it. It will just going to show the URL. That's it. We will going to have to set up the single page in the next video. So in the next video, we'll see how we're accessing this information. Because what's really cool about React Router DOM or Re React Router uh, as a short one, then we can access this. So there's a reason why I'm setting up this slug, because each and every room will going to have a unique slug. We could do the ID, but then we're going to have to have some kind of number here. And what I would want is to have a text. That's the reason why I'm adding here the slug. Now, this will going to navigate to that single page. But again, nothing has been set up yet. And then let's add a few class names here that will going to add the styling. So first of all, I'm going to use again button primary. And we're also going to call this a room link that was just used to actually place it correctly. And then let's add some kind of name, of course, features like so. And then as I'm hovering, I should see this link. And if you're going to check it out, notice right now I'm heading over to rooms and double deluxe. Now what's happening, of course, like I said already, probably three times, we haven't done anything here within a single room page because we haven't set up any kind of logic where we're going to fetch this information from our context API. And we're going to get that information about each and every room, specific room, and that will be displayed. Meaning, if I'm going to head over to finished project, you'll notice that, of course, if I'm clicking, this is not just going to be single room, but actually specific information about each and every room. All right, so this is going to be dynamic eventually. Currently, at the moment, this is just going to show this dumb text. If I'm going to navigate back, of course, this is going to be the same. However, you will notice that the URL is changing. So we are going to a different URL. However, at the moment, we're just showing our single room page that we didn't do anything with it. Okay, then still within the actual article, but outside this div, I would want to set up here the paragraph and I'm going to add some class names here. I'm going to add class name of room info and then let's use the name here. Let's use the name. And again, we're going to have to obviously navigate back. And what you're going to see is double deluxe, family deluxe, and pretty much each and every name of the room. Now, last thing that I would want to do with the room is set up the prop types because we are passing the name, the slug, the images, and it would be nice to have some kind of mechanism where we're at least checking whether the prop has been passed. And the way we can do that in React, or one of the ways how we can do that, we can use obviously prop types. So let's write prop types from. And then we're importing this, obviously, from the prop types. So name is prop types, like so. Now, once this is imported all the way in the bottom, we are going to set up our prop types. And the way I'm going to write that, this is going to be the name of the component. Then we're going for the prop types, like so. But we do need to use the camel case here, in this case, prop types. And this will be equal to an object. Now, the kicker here is that a room itself is an object. Remember, these are not just single properties. So what happens? Yes, the room has specific props, but the room component has only one prop. And that one prop 
in fact, is an object. So what we would need to do here is use uh, shape from the prop types. So how this is going to work, I'm going to say, okay, so there is one prop within my room component by the name of room. Then we're going to say that we would want to check whether this object has particular properties there. And in order to do that, we will going to have to use shape. Then within the shape, we're going to set up the object. And now we're going to go one by one and basically check our properties. Now, first one was the name. Then here we're going to write prop types. And we need to make sure that this is a string. And we also need to add is required. So that way, if the string by the name of name will not be there, then obviously we're going to have a warning in a console. And I'm just going to copy and paste that. I have four of them. Now, next dude will be slug here, which also will be string and also will be required, of course. Then images is an array. So in this case, we're going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to say, okay, images array. Then prop types will not be string, of course, because it is an array. And we need to use array off. And then we need to specifically say, well, array of what? Well, and what we would want is to be array of strings. So that way I can write prop types and we just say string. So just to make sure that this is an array of strings, in fact. And then last one is a price, which obviously should be number. So we can just write price. And then instead of string, we can just write number. Now let's save that. And now we're setting up the prop types. So these should be good, as well as everything else is being re rendered. Now, our next challenge, obviously, is going to be working with the single room page. But before we do that, why don't we head over back to our recording just so we can see what we have done so far. I will going to close the console. I don't think we need it. And yes, we do have our awesome featured rooms. So now let's head over to the single room page and work on the single room page. Before we set up the single room page, I would want to set up the function within the context that we will use within single room page. Now, the reason for that is because single room page will be quite big component. So in fact, I think we're going to do multiple videos on that particular component. So why don't we split up even more where we're going to set up the functionality in the very beginning, and that way it's going to be easier later on. So first and foremost, we're going to head over back to context JS. We do have a component did mount. We have formatting the data. And right after that, why don't we set up a function that we're going to call get room. Now, this get room function, we're going to accept one argument by the name of the slug. And here, the only thing that we're going to do is, in fact, we're going to filter it. And you can probably already see what is happening. So there will going to be a way for us within the single room. Let me open this component where we will have access to the slug that we're passing from the room component. Remember, we were using the link and we were passing the slug. So there's going to be a way for us to access that slug. And there's also going to be a way for us, obviously, to access the context. And we already looked at one way. And by the way, we're going to repeat the same way using the context. However, later on, I still promised I remember that where we're going to have to look at multiple ways how we can do that. But again, since single room will be quite big, the way we're going to access the context will be the same way like we did before, where we use the context type. Because I just don't want to put too much information in the single room because this is already quite big. Then, like I said, we get the slug. Okay, that's first and foremost. And now I'd like to filter it and get that specific room that has that slug that will be passed using the link. So the way we're going to do that, we're going to say it let and I'm going to call this temp rooms and temp rooms is going to be equal to our rooms property in the state. However, I wouldn't want to assign it. In fact, I would just like to copy the values that I have in my rooms array. And the way we do that is by using the spread operator. So again, I'm saying there's going to be an array. And now I just like to spread out the values that I have already within this dot state rooms. All right. Now, once we have these particular values, once we have our array, now I'd like to use the find method to get the room that matches the slug that we're going to pass into our function. And the way we do that is by setting up another variable, then we're going to say temp rooms. That is, of course, already our array, we're going to use a find method. 
And then within the find method, we're passing in the callback function. And within the parameter of our callback function, we can access each and every item in our array. Now, since it is a parameter, we can call this however we would like. So I'm going to call my room. And in fact, I'm going to use the arrow function. And then what I would like to say is, you know what, get me the room that slug matches whatever we're passing into a get room function. So let's write room slug is equal to a slug. Let's say that now we have our function. And lastly, what I would like to do is return the room. Okay. Now, if you're wondering uh, what would be the difference, let's say, between the filter and the find. So the find is going to find a first match and also find is going to be an object where within a filter, you would need to essentially uh, actually get it out from the array because filter is going to return the array. So in my case, since I'm just looking for one item, I'm fine with just being an object. And then once we get the new object, then we're just returning back from our function. Now, lastly, I would want to make this available in my context. So once we have spread out our this dot state, correct, within the value, what I could also do is add more properties. Now, in this case, the way we add the properties is by coming up with a name of the property. So I'm going to say get room, and I'm going to set this equal to a this dot get room function. And this is how we can make this get room function available within the context. And this particular function is going to help us to get specific room once we open up a single room page. And that was nice and easy. We do have our functionality. Awesome. Now we're going to head over to a single room. And first and foremost, we're going to do quite a few imports. Now, I'm obviously going to explain to them, uh, to you once we get to that particular import, once we start using it. Why we're doing it, most of them will be uh, straightforward, but let's say some of them, I'm not going to spend too much time right now. You'll see it as we are creating this component while we're using it. And of course, I'm going to return and then show you how we did that. So first and foremost, I would want to get some image. So I'm going to say default BCG and then from, and then we're looking for images. Again, you can pick whatever image you'd like. I'm going to go with room one JPEG. That would be number one. Then I do want the hero because we will going to be displaying a massive hero. And at the moment, this will be a very basic one. But like I said, later on, we're going to check it out how we can do that using the style component. Now, this will be my hero. So let's call this hero. And then this will be from components, of course, components. And the name, I believe, was hero. Then we do have the banner. Banner will be used to display name. So banner from and again, same thing, banner from the components. Then we will have a link which will link away from a different page. Let's say rooms because notice again, we have the banner and we're going to have this link back to all the rooms page. So again, we're going to look for the room or link from and react router DOM. React router DOM. And last but not least, we will going to have to get a context. Because within the context, there's going to be a few things. First and foremost, we will going to have access to all the rooms that we had because we would want specific one. And second one, we want the function that we just created in the last video. So let's go with room context. And like I said, we will use again context type that we already covered. Since this is a class based component, we already know that probably the simplest way would be using the context type. Now, for the context type, I do need to have my whole context, the room context. And that's the reason why we're importing here from the context. Later on, we're going to have a functional components where we're going to check it out the other ways how we can access the context. Like I already previously mentioned, the reason why I'm not doing it here is because this will be quite a big component and I don't want to confuse you more than I already have. All right. Now. First and foremost, I do want to show you how we can access the parameter, the URL parameter that we passed here by the name of the slug. And in fact, this is very simple. Now we have a few options how we can do that in the class based component. And by the way, we can also do this in a functional. Of course, I'm just going to show it with the class based one where remember when we were working with the classes or class based components, we had an option of creating a constructor where we had the props. And we also had super 
um, by the name of the props. And now we can do something here, whether it bind the functions or set up the state, as well as we had a lifecycle method. When the lifecycle method was, well, one of them at least was component did mount. And now let's notice something interesting. So what's going to happen is that I can, in fact, access here something that React Router is giving me. And how we can do that? Well, first of all, let's look at console. Console log and let's type this dot props. And by the way, I can tell you right away that this is going to happen exactly the same in the component did mount. I will gonna tell you in a second why I'm showing you the component did mount, but for this time being, let's just save this. And once we're gonna head over again to our recording, we will notice something interesting. But by the way, before we do that, let me just uh, elaborate that. Nowhere in our application, we're passing this directly to a single room because notice this obviously is just a link. So what's real interesting. It's not like I went back to app.js and passed somehow here the prop. The prop is being passed by a react router. Just remember that that is kind of important. Now, if I'm going to do again, inspect, check this out. What's going to be in the console now? Currently, there's nothing there, right? So currently our console is just bunch of complaints that we're not using some kind of uh, variable that we set up. But check this out. I'm going to click on features and I'm seeing this prop and I definitely didn't pass this prop myself. Now, what's really cool that this is a react router and it gives us what? Well, it gives us access to a bunch of things. Now, what we are interested is notice we have an object and we have history, location, match. What we would want in this case is get this particular slug because remember this is what we set up the function for where we will going to pass that slug and by the way this slug will be specific for each and every item that we're passing so we will going to have a match then within the match we're going to have a params and what do you see within this params object i see the name and the name is double deluxe so just to show you that this obviously would be unique. Remember, this was double deluxe. Let's head over back and let's go with, let's say, Prudential, just so we know for sure that this would be different. Now, again, there's going to be another object. Again, we're going to look in the same place. We're going to look for the match. And then what do you see within the match params? I see the slug by the name of Presidential Room. So React Router gives us a very, very nifty way how we can access, in fact, this parameter. So this is exactly what I'm going to do. And the reason why I'm showing you component didn't mount, because in our case, I'm accessing this specific room here from obviously my function from the context. Now there's going to be cases where you're going to be setting up a different kind of API call, where remember, eventually we're going to set up everything using content. So in our case, we could say that we were going to get all our information from the contentful and we're going to store it here in the context. But then there's going to be cases, let's say you want to make a single call, because obviously what you need to understand is that this would be a single call. So what do you would do? Well, you would set up some kind of API call where you're just getting the specific room about that specific one page. Now, in our case, we are already doing this just by accessing the context. But this is not always going to be the case. There's going to be a case where you specifically need to make the API call. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this, that you most likely were going to do it with component didn't mount. And that, again, is where you can access this console log this props. Now, I'm not going to console log this right now. I'm just showing you that this obviously works. And I'm just going to comment this out for now, just for your understanding. And yes, you could technically just pass it here, grab the information from the state. You can do it. Let's say you're going to access that slug. And then you're going to make your API call. But I'm just letting you know that you still have access to this component did mount to the props to any props. But more specifically, in our case, what we want is access to the props that React Router DOM is providing. Now, after we have rambled on about the props, I will going to comment out just so you can have it for your reference. And what I would like to do right now is set up this dot and state. Now, within the state, I will have a few properties that we will going to reuse all throughout the project. So first of all, I'm going to set up the property by the name of the slug. Now, this will be equal to this dot props. Like I said, bunch of objects match params. That was the path. And then last one will be slug. And again, remember, this is unique for 
each and every time we're going to be opening up the single room page, this will be unique because we're getting this for each and every room. This is obviously different. And then I also would want to set up the default BCG, which will be exactly the same name that I had here, default BCG. Again, this will make sense a little bit later. This is just to be a image. So we're going to get there. All right. Now, last, I would want to access my context. So we can do outside the constructor. We can say static. Static context type will be equal to room context. Now, we already knew that. So what we can do is we can save that. And now let's notice something interesting. Once we successfully get our context from the room context, why don't we destructure? And more specifically, why don't we destructure the function that we had by the name of get room? So in order to do that, I'm going to say get room. That obviously will going to be coming from this dot context. That's number one. And then I would want to run that function. And I would want to run that function. And remember, we had to pass in the slug. So the way we're going to do that, we're going to say const and we're going to assign it by the name of room. I'm going to say room and then we're going to go with this dot. And then we're going to say, of course, first we need get room. Let's go with get room and then this dot state and slug. And now I'd want to console log the room to show you the issues that we're going to be having. And then we're going to decide how we're going to fix them. So first and foremost, we have console log so we're looking for the room and now let's check it out when we go to the console notice we have undefined first and then we're only getting the room now what's even worse is let's say that not only we are navigating to a single room from when we click on the room component we can also obviously navigate here in the url so not only if i'm going to be going for presidential but let's say i'm just going to type one check this out now I'm going to have two undefined. So we would need to figure out a way how we would catch this undefined, then render something first if the room is undefined, and then only when the room is defined eventually, then we would want to render the information about that single room. Knowing the issue is the first step. Next, we would want to fix it, of course. But before we do that, let's just see how our application will perform if we try to access this room when it's undefined. Now we know that we cannot access object in general, but we can access the property. And I already know that there will be the property by the name of or name. Yeah, by the name of name. And of course, at the moment, there will be a big fat error because it says, well, I cannot read that property. Now we could technically just again, refresh. And let's see how this is going to work if we go directly from our featured rooms page. So once we click it over here, everything is awesome. We are accessing this double deluxe. All this is fine. However, the issue will be once we refresh, then of course, we're going to get there the same way if we're going to try to access some kind of room that doesn't exist. Again, we're going to have a same error because the room will be undefined. So how we can fix that? Well, we could set up the if statement where we check whether room is undefined. That means that Either it's still loading or there was an error. And then we render something. So one part of our application. And then once the room is actually defined, then we're going to destructure it and show the information about that specific room. Very simple. So why don't we do the if statement? And we're just going to say if room is undefined, then we would want to render something. Now that something will be a narrative. So I'm going to say return. Then we're going to go with error and not console log error, but in fact, we're going to go with error div, error div. And then obviously, this is the class that we're just accessing from the CSS, as well as we would want to maybe place some heading three. No such room could be found. Now, please understand that if you're doing some kind of API call, API call from the component did mount then you're probably going to write like loading or something like that. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning that because people sometimes do a different setup by using the code that I have, and then they write in the comments that, well, you know what? It didn't work. Well, yeah, it didn't work because you're doing a different thing. In my case, I don't have an option of loading. 
I have only option of if that room is not in my context, then there's no way I'm going to be able to find that room. Now, if you're just waiting for your component and mount, then probably if it's even better to set up the flag within the state where once you actually get that specific room, get fetch that information, then in fact you render. In my case, again, there is only an option of either that room is in my context or not. And that's it. So in that case, I'm going to write no such room could be found. Then we have three dots. And then why don't we set up the link right away so the user can navigate away from the page. So link to then we're going to do I don't know rooms. And then let's write class name will be btn primary, like so. And within the link, why don't we write, uh, I don't know, back to rooms. And let's see what will going to happen. Then in our application, we notice that there is no such room. All right. Then if I'm just going to type and write deluxe, I will going to get this deluxe because initially, yes, it will be undefined, but then we're going to get that information about that specific page. So not only I will going to have an error if that room is not in my context. So once we're going to type that, no such room could be found. And then we have an option of actually navigating back to the rooms. That would be the first thing. Now we would want to set up here our actual div that will be rendered if everything is successful. So if the room is defined, first and foremost, we would want to destructure it. So first of all, I'm going to be looking for that name property. Then we're going to write for description. So comma description. Then we also have capacity as well as size. And again, these are just properties that I have on my room. So price extras. Uh, what else we have breakfast breakfast as well as we're going to have pets and images and all that will be in the room. So images. And that will be in my specific room object. And why don't we actually change also what we're going to be returning? So this will not just be a simple div. We're also going to use a hero. And for the time being, we are going to use our hero class. However, next video, we are going to look at styled components and how they improve our application. So we're going to set up the basic setup and I'll show you the uh, pitfall of this kind of setup. So rooms hero. That is the class that I already used before for my rooms. Now, within the hero, we are going to go with the banner. And for the banner title, in this case, we are going to set up the name that is for the room. So that way I can say that, oh, I'm sorry, not to, but title. And then why don't we set up right away the template strings? And we're just going to go with a dollar sign. I will going to be looking for the name of the room. And I'm going to say that this will be the name of my room. Then within the banner, I also would want to place a link. Now the navigation will offer user to, let's say, navigate rooms. Why don't we also add right away class name? I don't know. Um, button primary, of course, button primary, like so. And then within the link, we're going to write, I don't know, back to rooms again, back to rooms. Let's save that and we will see what will happen. And again, in this case, since the slug doesn't match any rooms that we have, we have no rooms can be found. If I'm going to change this one to deluxe, of course, I will going to get this nice hero component with our banner. And then this will be the name of my room. However, there is another issue. Now, this issue is very simple where each and every time we're going to be rendering that specific page, the image will not going to change. Now, why it's not going to change? Because we're just using a simple class where I have the rooms hero class. And remember, we had the case for the app CSS. And then within the app CSS, we did have somewhere hero. And I think it will be easier to find it using find. So why don't we type hero? And sure enough, we have our two classes. And you might be tempted to say, OK, of course, I understand. Yes, at the moment, because we're rendering room zero, we are just accessing that one image. So maybe we could set up a bunch of classes here and each and every class will be targeting that specific image. And then each and every time we're going to be going to that page, we, of course, will going to render different image. But again, please remember, we will going to be getting this data from where 
we're all going to be getting from contentful. And that way it's going to be impossible because those images will not be stored locally in our application or on machine. In fact, they will going to be stored in contentful and we're just going to access them dynamically. So even though you would want maybe manually to add whatever classes you have, you're not going to be able to access the images. That's number one. Number two, you probably are going to be wasting a lot of your time because every time what you're going to change something about your data, you're going to run back over to your CSS and add the class. So there has to be a better solution. And that better solution will be styled components, which allow us to insert this data dynamically. So this is what we're going to do in the next video. And this is what I'm saying, where this component is going to be quite big. As you noticed, first, we dealt with an issue of actually accessing the slug. Now we fix the error. And now we're going to fix this hero, where we're going to have the styled components hero that will access for each and every page dynamically the image we would want. So the image will be changing that big background image. And then we're going to render the rest of the uh, information regarding that single room. Okay, we know our next task is to create the hero component to be dynamic. Now, the first things first, why don't we take a look at what are styled components? Because this is exactly what we're going to do. Now, I'll tell you right away that I'm going to be skipping over them a lot because I already have a separate course on styled components. So I'm not going to go through each and every detail what is happening with styled components. So we're going to look at the general idea and we're going to customize it for our example. If you want to learn more about style components, check out my course on Udemy and you're going to know everything that there is to know about style components. Now, first of all, what is the idea? Well, the idea with styled components is the fact that we can attach styles to the component and it will be right away rendered. Now, there's a bunch of advantage with styled components and the simple fact that your CSS will not going to be colliding where each and every styled component will going to have unique class. Also, we have access to variables because, in fact, what we're doing here, we are writing JavaScript. Now, like I said, this is just going to be brief over you. So first and foremost, if you ever want to find out anything about styled components, this will be in stylecomponents.com. Then if we head over to documentation, we notice also the API reference. And what they're telling you is that, first and foremost, the default export will be styled. Then once we import styled from styled components, then we can start using that styled by writing whatever the component name would be. And usually the uh, simplest example would be some kind of button. And then we use the styled, which would be the default export that we have. And then the name of the component. Now, in this case, this could be another style component. This could be HTML element. This could be really anything you would want. In fact, this could also be a React component. And what happens here, once we have these backticks, which are template literals, then we can just write whatever CSS we would want. But what's really cool about this, that since these are template literals, we in fact can use JavaScript in here. And what we are going to do here, we dynamically we're going to access our image and place it within our background. All right. Now, what do we need to do first? Well, we would probably want to get the styled components. And first and foremost, if we head over to the basics, we just see this is the install we would need to create. I will going to head over back to my project. I will going to clear everything. And that's not what I would want. I'm going to clear everything in my integrated terminal. We will going to install styled components right away. And we will going to create a new component. Now, first of all, we're just going to test it with the button. But I know eventually this will be styled hero. So that will be our other component, the hero component. Only this one will be using styled components. And then again, let's head over back to the API. Like I said, I will be going to be skipping over a bunch of stuff. And remember, we needed to import styled from styled components. So import styled from styled components. And notice something interesting how we don't need to import React. Now, there's going to be cases where you obviously are going to combine them, where style components will be used together with React component. But in this case, this is just a styled component. However, it will perform uh, a lot like a React component. So let's do npm start. Now, this is going to start up, obviously, our dev server. I can close the integrated terminal. I don't need that. 
from and then we're looking for styled components because we installed them people then next one up why don't we create our simple button and by the way i will gonna render this somewhere why don't we head over maybe home and let's grab the styled component just so we can take a look first and foremost how this is gonna work so import now this will be styled component however i do need to make sure that i'm exporting something because at the moment i'm not importing or exporting anything apart from the style so in this case i will going to set up const why don't we call this whatever we would like but we we're just going to call this simple button then we need to write styled and again what kind of html element in this case we would want and i'm going to go with button and here let's add i don't know color red and background green something like this background green and we do need to export. so we're going to say export export uh, we can do either named or default export so in this case if we're just going to say default simple button will be exported so far so good then next one up we would need a home js and we can name it again whatever we would like so in my case i'm just going to name this button from and then we're going to access components and styled hero all right now somewhere all the way in the bottom right after featured rooms why don't we look at the button that we just created with styled components and at the moment we don't see anything now the reason for that because obviously we have the button remember we created the actual button so we would need to create some kind of text so whether that would be i don't know hello or whatever so we're going to create hero or hello and all the way in the bottom i could see the little button here notice i obviously can click it this is an actual button but nothing is happening now what's really cool here is that like i said this is javascript at the end of the day so i could pass some kind of variable i could set up i don't know const uh, red and this would be some kind of red color now i do need to use obviously the quotation marks here and i'm just going to say all right so this will be a string by the name of hashtag whatever we can use maybe orange color f15025 and then for the color why don't we change this why don't we say that all right so we would want to access the variable instead now this variable obviously is not going to be red i don't know why i'm writing red this will be orange color and also we can write orange and you know what in order to actually make this button more visible why don't we add a massive font size like i don't know three rems let's test it out and then notice check it out we do have right now the color however the color is not being displayed properly because i actually gave a wrong hashtag value i should add here f as well but in this case i do have it here the color is not red anymore in fact this is orange because we are accessing this dynamically using the variable so now let's think about it we have a styled component we can access some values dynamically and what we are trying to do is get this image in our styled component so whenever we are rendering this hero the big massive component i would want to place here the image so hopefully the bells are already ringing in your head because this is exactly what we're going to do now how this is going to work well first and foremost why don't we get the default image now you don't have to do it this way but i just always find it useful if we have some kind of default image so i'm going to say default image from and again we're going to be looking for the images then within the images there obviously will going to be some kind of default image and i'm just going to go with room jpeg like so then obviously i'm going to change this around i don't care about the button anymore what i would like to do instead is get my default hero and the way this is going to work i'm going to name this differently i'm going to say const styled hero will be equal to styled now in this case i don't want to render the html button i would want to render html header now that is going to be the name of my comp uh, html element of course and then what we would want for the header well we can actually already check what we already had previously so that will be in the app css and what are the styles that we're adding well i am adding the min height here i am adding the background 
as well as we would obviously want to display flex align item center and justify content. So we can just grab whatever we had or in the CSS. There's no point of rewriting this because our main goal is to look at how we can name this dynamic. I don't care about min height being 100 view heights. I can just go with 60 view heights here. Then display flex will stay the same align items just if I content all that will stay the same. What I care about is this. This is what I'm really interested about. And we already saw how we can use one variable. So first of all, before we mess up anything, let's just write that we are exporting default styled hero like so. And then let's change this value here around. Let's say that I would want to access this image dynamically by again, I need to use the dollar sign since I am within the template literals. And let's say that I'm checking for default IMG. Now, this is obviously the variable name that I have here. So hopefully everything was correct. Let's save that. And let's see what we're going to have in the bottom. Wow, I have my massive image and I can even go back in my recording. We can go back home. And for some reason, this is not showing right now. And yes, it is showing right now. What do you see here? This will be our massive image. Okay, but at the moment, it's the same thing. Again, I'm getting this data. So each and every time this will be rendered exactly the same because all I'm doing here is rendering the image. Now, what's even more cool about styled components that we can pass the props. So what will happen at the moment? I'm just going to show you, obviously, this in a home page because this is where we're rendering. And by the way, I named this button. But the way this will work eventually is that there will be some kind of prop and we can name this however we would like, but I'm just going to name this image. And then we dynamically will going to access the images that we had here from the room. All right. Now, let me show you how this is going to work. First and foremost, I don't think I care about the button anymore. I can just get rid of it. It will be on my way. I can also delete the import. I will going to fix the styled hero. And the way we access props in the styled components is a little bit different. So this way, if we're just accessing the variable, it's very simple. I can just say, OK, so give me whatever variable I would want. But if I'm going to be accessing the props that are being added to this style hero, the syntax would be following where it what it will not be just a simple dollar sign. I will going to have to, again, access something dynamically. But in this case, I'm passing here the function and this function grabs one argument, which will be the props. Now, the props obviously will be the ones that are added here on the style component by the name of styled hero in this case. And then I'm just going to be looking for either I can return it or we can even do a ternary operator. Again, the simple way would be something like this, where I say props image. Now, again, this will be the name of my current prop that I'm using. And just to show you how obviously this will work is I will going to save it currently. We will going to head over back to the single room. And right after the room context, why don't we import this? I'm going to say styled component like so. And you know what? No, styled hero. Why I'm calling this styled component. And then from and then obviously I need to head over to my components and somewhere within the components. Of course, I will have my styled component. So let's or styled hero. I don't know why I keep calling this styled uh component well it is styled component i guess but the name of it is styled hero now we will head over to a return if the room is actually defined and we're going to change this around so we will not going to be looking for the simple hero in fact we we're going to change this around then we will use styled component styled or again styled hero not styled component the prop name will be image. So the prop name, again, I use the name here, image. You can use whatever name you would want, but I'm just going to say image. And that image will be equal to anything that I would want from that images array. Now, this is really up to you how you want to do it. But in my case, I'm just going to go with images. And since I know that this is an array, I can just go with a zero. Now, let's check it out what we're going to have here. Let me first of all, save home. 
and then let's test it out in our application. I click on it. And what do you see as an image? Well, I see that this is going to be my double deluxe room. Again, if we're going to head over to the presidential, now this will be a presidential room. There is one more thing that I would want to show you with this styled component. And the simple fact that if you would want the default one, you can either do it here. Let's say set up some kind of default. If again, you're not able to access that image within the images, or we can do it here. That's the reason why I did set up this in a state. So this is really up to you. I'm going to add an overkill right now because I'm going to add in both ways the default one. So I'm going to say, show me images zero or, and that way I'm just going to say this dot state and default image. Again, you don't have to do this. This is definitely an overkill, but just to show you that we can add these default images in both cases where I can say, okay, if it's not there, then just render this guy. And also we can do the same thing here where not only we're looking for the props, but I could set up here a ternary operator. Now that ternary operator will be basically like this. I'm going to check if I'm passing any kind of prop. And if no image prop is being passed, I can obviously say like this, I can say, all right, so props images, if it's there, and if it's not there, then just render whatever default I have. Now, where is my default? Well, this will be this guy. So I can just say ternary operator. If the image prop is passed, obviously render that image prop. And then if it's not passed, then just render this IMG. Okay. That's basically a protection. If let's say you forgot to add that kind of prop. And this is how we can set up our single room page to be dynamic where each and every time we're going to be trying to render something. And I can go back to my final application where for each and every room, we in fact will be accessing image from that room. Okay. Instead of rendering the same old image all the time, we have our styled hero component. Awesome. And now what's left to do is just pretty much fill out rest of the information about our single room. So in this case, I will going to navigate to the single room. Obviously, this is going to show me the background image for that double deluxe room, but we already have our awesome styled hero where each and every time this will going to be rendering different images. And like I said, it's pretty much the easiest part where we would want to set up rest of the information about that one specific room. I would want to render everything after this styled hero. So in this case, since we cannot do two adjacent things in the GSX, I will going to also set up the react fragment. So opening and closing will be react fragment. And then rest of the information will going to go here, where we're going to be filling out using all the values that we're getting from that one specific room. First and foremost, we're going to start with the section. Now within that section, there will be a class that we have in the CSS by the name of single room. Now this should get me obviously my JSX right now. I'm just waiting on my Emmet. Here it goes. Then within the section, we are going to start very simply by showing all the images. So if you're looking at at my finished page, you see that we have all the images. Now this is really up to you. If you want to render all the images that we have in the array, basically including also this background one, you just need to obviously do it the images map because obviously we're accessing the images. And then all of them will be rendered. But we also are going to check it out how we can do a little bit of the structuring again with JavaScript and render only three of them. So the easy way would be like this, where we have a bunch of images. And by the way, I would want to place this in another div single room images. Again, this will be just for the styling. And this is just going to give me class name that I don't want. But again, we're going to have to get my JSX. And then within this images, this will be where we're going to render our images. So I'm going to start with images. Then we used a map method. And then since there's going to be a few of them, I would want item. So each and every index or each and every image in that array. And also we're going to add right away index just because we're going to be rendering the list. And what I would like to return is just a image with a key. And then the key will be index, of course. And then source will be the item. So source attribute for my 
HTML image will be coming from each and every image from my array. And I'm going to call this item. And then alternative, we can just say that the name, the name of that particular room, which obviously we still have access to. So let's do this. This will be our first setup. And at the moment, this will be complaining because I should obviously have the return as well. Now this should do better. And now we have all of these images. Again, we can head over back to our recording. Check it out. Single room. And I have these four images. And like I said, if you instead would want only the three images, so this background one, maybe you don't want to display, we would just do a bit of destructuring here. And in this case, instead of object destructuring, we're going to do array destructuring, where I do have my images array, correct? So I could just write, all right, const, and now get me out the images out of that images array. And I could set it up this way, where I have the main image, that is going to be my first image. And I could just say, let's say image number one, image number two, and so on and so forth, and set this equal to a images array. So now what we're doing is we're just grabbing the items out of the array. So that is going to be my first one, then second one, and third one, and so on and so forth. Now, the thing is that I would like to get another array with the rest of the images. So essentially, I don't want to keep the count of how many images I have in my array. Because in this case, I'm getting the second image, then third, and so on and so forth. But of course, there's cases where I don't know how many extra images I'm going to have, whether that is going to be five or whether that is going to be 50. So a better way would be this way, where I'm getting the main image, correct? So I am the structuring array and I'm getting my first item. But then for the rest of the items, I'm using the rest operator, where I'm just going to say dot, 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 and then whatever the name of my array. So in my case, I'm going to say default IMG, but you can call this however you would like. So again, we are doing the array destructuring. And then in order to get rest of the items apart from the first one, I'm just using a rest operator. So in this case, I'm going to rewrite my background as well, but you don't have to do it. So I'm going to say, okay, get me main IMG. And that of course is the item number one. And then instead of looping over all the images, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say default IMG. And then just to double check, let's just console log, just so we can see that for sure default IMG are going to be next images or rest of the images in the array. Now, let me head over back to my bigger browser window. We can maybe refresh our dev server. First of all, I can right away see that Still, my style hero works excellent. So we're still accessing our main image. But then notice how the rest of the images don't have any more that main image. So we got rid of that successfully. And essentially, we're rendering out the rest of the list. And if I'm going to click on inspect within a console, we're also going to notice that we have the array of three images. So essentially, we have rest of the images. So that's how we can do array destructuring using the rest operator in order to get rest of the images without the main image that is displayed in the background. Well, we are done with the images. This will be our div. So make sure that right outside this div, there's going to be another div. Now this div will be called single room info. And what I would like to access is obviously right now my JSX. And then we're going to start with article. Now the article class will be description. And let's go with that. Let's get description. And within the description, we're going to have a few things. First and foremost, there will be a heading three. And within the heading three, we're just going to write details. Details. Then next one up will be the paragraph. So let me navigate to the end of the line, create a new line, and I'm going to be going for the paragraph. And within the paragraph, like I said, we were going to be placing a description like so. Description. And again, what we're accessing right now is all the properties that we currently have. Description. Hopefully this is written correctly. Description. Let's save that and let's see what's going to happen. 
sure enough, what I have next is my details as my description. Also, still within this single room, I would want to create another article. Article. Then for the article class will be info. Info. And then within this info, there's going to be a few things. There's going to be a heading three, first and foremost. And we will going to be targeting info. And then also we would want to work with the price. So let's say that we have a heading six. So for the heading six, we're going to have a price. And for the price, we're going to do simply a dollar sign. And then we're going to go with actual price. So going to write price. Let's save. And let's see, sure enough, what I have here is info with a price. After that, we would want to render size. So let's grab this guy. We're going to have the size. This should obviously give me another thing, but at the moment, I don't see it. So why don't we grab the size prop from our object? And right after we change the size prop, I also would want to add square footage. So square foot, like so. And then I have pets and capacity and breakfast. Now, just to show you where this is going to be located, when we are going to head over to our page, we will going to have the max capacity. And in this case, I would want to do some kind of conditional rendering. Because let's say the room has max capacity of one, it's not going to make sense one people. So we would want to say if it's less than two, then that would be obviously person. And then it will be two, three, whatever, four people, if it's plural. Now, if it's going to be singular, then we would want to render one person. And also pets and breakfast will be conditional. Some rooms will have pets allowed, some will won't. So we're going to do a little bit of conditional rendering as well. First and foremost, let's start with capacity. Let's get heading six. And for the heading six, we would want to render, uh, obviously, like I said, capacity. And for the capacity, let's write max capacity. And then we're just going to be, like I said, doing a conditional rendering where we'll use a ternary operator. So in this case, I will going to check what is the value for the capacity. If it's bigger than one, then we're going to use a template literal where I'm just saying, OK, so there will going to be a capacity obviously rendered, but it will be people. So if it's more than one, so if the capacity is more than one, then We'll render people. If not, then the capacity will be capacity will be person. And in this case, we do need to have again template literals person. Now that should do it, but we do need to add here a question mark for our ternary operator. And now everything is working, and we have a max capacity of two people. All right. Now after that, we do have pets and breakfast. And there's a few ways how we can also check the same thing. So I will going to say, all right, I would want the heading six. But in this case, I will going to be checking for the pets prop. And then again, we're going to do a conditional rendering. So I'm going to close out this curly brace. And we are going to return if the pets are allowed, if that property is true on that particular room. We're going to write pets allowed. If it's not true. Then I'm going to say no pets allowed. Okay, that's going to be our setup. And last one will be breakfast. And as you can see, in this case, pets are allowed. And for the breakfast, it's going to be even simpler where we're going to use the and operator, where we're going to check if the breakfast property is true. That means the breakfast is for free. And breakfast, and we use and operator. And we say free breakfast, breakfast uh, included. And obviously, if this property on that particular room will be false, then we're just not going to render that string. That's all. Now, right after this section, there's going to be one last thing where I would want to render the rooms, or I'm sorry, the extras that the room has. So right after this section, I'm going to write section with a class name. Like so, class or why I'm typing class name, I just need to type a uh, room extras. Okay, so this is going to be a room extras, and then within this section, we're just going to head over to a heading six, 
and then we're gonna write extras. And then last but not least, I would want to loop over this extras array. And the way we're gonna render, we're just gonna attach a class for that on our list. So I'm gonna say this on our list, we're gonna have a class of extras, extras, and then within this on our list, why don't we do extras? So obviously, we're accessing right now the variable map again method. Then we're going to use item and index since these things will not change. They are just going to be rendered. And we would want to return each and every list item with that item that is in that array. So let's write list item key. And we're going to obviously access the index because this should be unique. And then within the list item, let's close it out first of all. And then within the list item, we would want to return that specific item. So let's write item. And then here we're going to add over here this dash. And let's see, we should have extras. And if we're going to check it out, our recording, yep, these are going to be the extras that we are rendering. If we're going to go back home, again, the presidential will obviously going to have a different price, different square footage, the capacity is going to be bigger, pets allowed, free breakfast, because in this case, the breakfast property is true. And of course, extras, I added exactly the same. I'm not going to be going and running around and changing these extras for each and every room. But this should just give you an idea how we can create whatever arrays or whatever we would want and then render them. Awesome. We did complete single room page. Now, what are we doing next? Well, let's check it out. So this would be the double basic room. Yada, yada, yada. And then these are going to be the rooms. So what do we would need? Well, rooms will be our last component. But obviously, when I say the last component, what I really mean is that within the room page, there will be, in fact, two components. One of them will be for the searching. And the second one will be displaying all the rooms that are being searched for. So let's say we're going to be searching for rooms that are less than 205. And obviously, these are going to be three rooms. If you want to search less so on and so forth, we're going to be displaying the rooms. In order to make this simple, because I still want to show you how we can render the context within the functional component, and there's actually two ways, what we are going to do is we're going to set up one container component that will going to hold both of these values. Okay, now it's also a little bit easier because I think this is going to structure our code better. And the plan will be very simple. We're going to head over back to our components. And then within the components, we're going to create three new files. So the first one will be rooms container. That's what going to be that parent container for both of them. And for now, like I said, we were going to create this as a functional component. So let's make sure that this is functional. Let's actually access it. And the moment we're going to do that, of course, we again are using uh, what we're using. Well, we're using the S6 snippets, of course. So let's head over back. And that's not what I wanted. Let's head over here. And yeah, let's actually get those snippets. For some reason, again, my VS code is like slowing down on me. And let's fix that. Yep, now I have my functional component. And then within the functional component, let's just write uh, hello from rooms container. And we might as well can right away import both of the things we're going to be creating. So first one will be a rooms filter. So I can just call this the rooms filter from then this will be in the same directory. So at the moment we cannot access it, but I'm going to call this rooms filter JS. Then we're going to copy and paste that. And the second one will be in fact, uh, the actual room list. So that will be where we're going to be displaying the rooms that are we are filtering so room list and room list. And why don't we right away render them? Again, there's going to be an error if you're going to save the file, but eventually they will be there. So rooms filter. Let's copy and paste that. And we're going to call this room list. Once we have this set up, like I said, we would need to create these two components. So first one will be room list JS, where again, this will be functional component. And we are just going to grab all the rooms that we're going to have. And that way, let's just call this hello from room list, like so. And then what else? We have that room 
uh, filter. Yeah, new file room filter JS. And again, let's call this functional component room filter and just hello. Hello from room filter. Then let's save them one by one room list room container. I will gonna have these tabs open because obviously we're gonna be doing a bunch of work here. I can close the single room. I will gonna leave the context open because we will gonna do a little bit of work there. We don't need the room. And what else do we have? I don't think we need featured rooms anymore either. All right, now we would want to navigate to the room page just so we can see what is happening. So at the moment, nothing is happening because we do need to have our container. So gonna let me open up the sidebar. We will gonna head over to the rooms page and let's say import our rooms container. I believe that was the name, right? So rooms container. And then we are gonna say that from and dot dot. So components and then within the components, we had a rooms component. Now be careful as you're saving. Of course, your files notice how there is an issue where basically I'm one place. I'm saying a room list and then a room filter. And then the next one is, let's say, rooms. So again, this is singular and plural issue where that's the reason why sometimes there is an issue. OK, now, in this case, it says cannot find rooms filter. Which is weird. So let's head over to uh, filter. This should be in the same thing. So I really don't understand why we cannot access it. It's in actually the same directory. So it says cannot resolve rooms filters and using components. Hmm. Interesting why we cannot get rooms filter. Oh, because it's room. Yeah, you see, this is the issue sometimes when you go with the room and rooms. And that's, you know, that's why sometimes I just told you to be careful. And in fact, I made a mistake myself. Okay, now this will be rooms. And at the moment, we're not rendering anything. So let's head over back to rooms. And again, we would need to create, of course, the fragment, because otherwise, this is not going to work. Again, we we're going to have to have no adjacent JSX. So this will be my fragment. And then let's render room container or rooms container. Or you know what? This is getting really, really annoying. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to rename it. So by mistake, I, in fact, called it rooms and it should be probably room container, because otherwise this is just really, really getting annoying. So let's say this will be rooms. As well as within the actual rooms, we're going to get a room and this will be from room. So let's save that. And at the moment, this is again complaining it is not defined because we have rooms container. And now let's save that. And yes, finally, everything is successful where we have hello from rooms. And then we have two of the components. One is filter and one is the room list. Now, my first thing is that I would like to show you how we can obviously work with the context as far as the functional components are concerned. Because at the moment, we want to access the context because there's some things we would want to pass it down to a room filter as well as the room list. So we'd want to grab the rooms, the sorted rooms, as well as the loading, because we will going to have to check loading here. However, that one, obviously, we're not going to pass it down that one. We just want to check it ourselves. But also there will be a method and that's what we're going to be looking for. OK, now what we want to do first is head over back to the context and notice what happened. So the first time we had we had this context, correct, where we had this dot context and we were able to access it because we were working with a static type. And then this was equal to the my context. And we set this equal to a this dot context. And then we got the value. If this is a functional component, we cannot do that. Now, instead, what we are looking for is for the consumer that we created all the way in the beginning. And the way we can access that is, in fact, using the render props, where the return in between the component will not going to be just a simple some kind of value. But in fact, this will be a function. Now, this function takes an argument of our object that we placed. Now, just to show you where this is in the context, remember all the way in the bottom, we had our value that was equal to a state. So 
here we can access that value. But I think it's going to be easier a little bit to show you how this works. But the general idea is like this. So rooms container, first and foremost, now we do need the consumer. Remember, we imported, in fact, or exported three things, room provider, room consumer and room context. And all the time we have been using this guy, the context. one. Now we, in fact, need this consumer. So let's head over to the container. We're going to import. We're going to call this or by the way, this is a name import. So we need to call it uh, like it is room. And this was consumer. Then this will be from the context. So again, we need to access the context, of course. And then once we have access the context, I also would want to right away get the loading component. So I'm going to say, all right, import loading. And that will be my loading component loading component. And now, like I said, what happens is that I will have to use this room consumer to access my context. So the way this is going to work is going to be very interesting, especially if you're doing this the first time. So we have our component room consumer. And like I said, in order to access this information, we need to run the function here. Okay. And this is something called render props. Now within the function, the only argument here is going to be this value. The value that we are in fact passing in our context. So this is exactly what we're accessing. So what we can do is since this is the function, I obviously will gonna have to do some kind of return. However, in this case, why don't we set it up where we have right now our divs? Obviously, this would be my return. Let's place that. That is our return. But since this is a function, we can start in fact destructuring it. We can actually start looking at what values are we getting. So again, this would be the same thing as we would set up in the class this dot context type and then accessing by this dot context. So why don't we check it out const? And again, maybe we can just value. Uh, maybe we can just console log just so you believe me that this is actually happening. Let's write value. And I understand that in the beginning, this kind of syntax might be throwing you off a bit. Because again, we're just not accessing simply the variable that we're getting from the actual context. In fact, we do need to run this function. And that's the reason why, of course, if you have the class, this is probably much simpler. And also in the rooms filter, we will check it out how we can use it as a hook where we can do a lot like we're doing within the class just by using the hook. Again, that will be in the rooms filter component. So far, we're dealing with this render prop because I want to show you a couple of ways how we can do that. Now, in this case, I will going to head over to my recording. I'm going to go to rooms. And if everything is correct, I should have my value object. And of course I do. And now check it out. So everything that we had in the state, we have access to. And we already know how to the structure. In fact, I think we're experts already. And that's it. Let's just start grabbing the values. So I'm going to be looking for loading. I will going to be looking for uh, sorted rooms as well as the rooms. And this will be from the value. Now, my plan is to pass the sorted rooms down to a room list and then the rooms into rooms filter. Please remember that whenever we're going to be working with rooms filter, we also will going to grab some more functions that we haven't set up yet in context. And we could technically set them up right now and pass it down to the rooms filter. However, since I want to show you how you can use use context, which we'll do in a rooms filter, this is why we're going to be doing grabbing a little bit of information from the context in our container and then a little bit more from filter and understand that you can do it either way. I could grab everything within a rooms filter or I can just pass it down like here within the room container. The only the reason why I'm doing this because I want to show you multiple ways how to do that. OK, and in fact, in the next video, we're going to check it out how we can do this with a higher order component. Again, it's kind of important whenever you're going to be working with context to kind of know these ways how we can do that. So in this case, I could say sorted and I'm just going to say that this will be rooms. So I will going to set this up and you know what? In here, I'm actually going to pass the rooms. So the sorted rooms will be passed into rooms list. But I will going to call this prop exactly the same. So I'm going to say, yes, there will be a rooms prop. So each of them will going to get rooms prop. 
but the difference would be one will get the sorted rooms and the other one will gonna get the rooms. And you'll see when we start filtering why, in fact, we are doing that. But I also would like to check the loading because let's not forget eventually when we're getting our data from the external API, we need to make sure that the actual data is there. And that would still require checking it within the room page. All right. Now, in this case, it's very simple. I'm going to say if loading, if loading is true, then I would want to display or return, in fact, the loading component. Loading component. And then if it will be false, which obviously going to be our case, because this is done locally, then of course, we're just going to be rendering and passing down these props into rooms filter and rooms list. Now, let's test it out just so we know that loading is for sure working. Again, I'm going to head over back to set state. And I'm just going to say that, or you know what, I could have just done it like I could have commented out. And now I should have a massive loading because obviously we didn't change it from two to false. So we know that that is working. And why don't we check it out? What would be another way how to write this? Because like I said, you might be thrown off a bit from this component where we are pretty much using this render props, where we are using the consumer and then we're passing it this way, where we are using the function. Now, this is not unique to context. You'll see, in fact, uh, all over the React that somebody might use this kind of pattern, especially before hooks. Of course, now that there's hooks, there's probably less use of this case, but you will going to see this. So. Just remember, this is a function. The argument is whatever we have currently in the context. And then you just need to access it and make sure that you're obviously returning that this is a function, but you can do all kinds of functionality right here on the top. Don't do it in return. That is against the rules of JSX, but you can definitely, definitely do it here on the top. All right. Now, while we're still on a subject, of course, why don't we cover how we can do this with a higher order component. However, what I would like to do right now is, in fact, first of all, set it up. And the way we're going to set it up will be within the context. Now, let's go somewhere here. Let's create that component. Let's say that you don't like this kind of syntax. You're like, I cannot stand the fact that I do need to pass the function and then I need to access this value. So. Let's say that you decide to go a higher order uh, component route. Now, how this is going to work, I'm going to say export. I'm going to call this function. We can just say with uh, room consumer. It doesn't really matter how you call it. And then within this function, first and foremost, I'm going to pass in the component. So there will be going to be a component that I'm going to pass within this function. What we need to remember that in this case, this will be a room container. But understand that you can do it obviously with any component where you want to hook up the context. Now, once I pass it within the function, what's interesting about this function, it will return another function. That's why they call it higher order components, where basically they return another component. Okay. Now let's call this return. Then we're going to write function. And of course, you can do this with an arrow function, but I just find it a little bit more understandable if we write it the ES5 way where we're writing the functions, because otherwise, if you just have a bunch of arrows there, I think that, I mean, some people might get confused. Let's call this consumer wrapper. Again, we can call this however we would want. And what's important about this function is that we are going to be grabbing props. Now, I understand that you probably will be asking, well, what props are you talking about? We will run this function with consumer within this room container. And of course, in our case, we did not pass anything as a props. But let's say if we're going to be running this with rooms filter, notice we are passing some kind of props. So what we would want to do is if we're creating this higher order component, we do want to pass those props into the component that will be returned. Okay. Now, last thing, from this function, what are we going to be returning? Finally, okay, we have our first function, we have our second function, the one that's grabbing the props, and also we are doing the return. So what 
on earth are we going to be returning here? Well, this is finally where we're going to be returning a consumer. So I'm going to call this a room consumer. And remember, we still need to follow the rules because it still will return the value. Because remember, we had this setup where room consumer is returning this function. Now, in this case, though, we will going to return already right away the component that will be passed in. So the way we're going to do that is going to be like this component. Then we're going to access the props. So dot, dot, dot and props that component might or might not have. Let's make sure that I'm typing actually correctly because I would want to access this particular component as well as I would want to right away set up context and the context will be equal to the value. The prop of the context obviously is not mandatory. You can call this however you'd want. The most important thing is that you are accessing this value here. So this way you're kind of skipping where instead of running through your whole application and each and every time using a room consumer, what in fact you will do, you're just going to grab this higher order component and you will wrap your component within this higher order component and your component will be returned right away with the props that component has, which in our case we didn't. But like I said, again, for the room filter, let's say you will going to have as well as context prop or any kind of prop, how you'd like to name it, that is equal to this value. So how this is going to work, we already are exporting. And now I'd want to go back to the room container. And you know what? I know that this might be a little bit redundant, but I'm going to select everything. I will going to comment this out just so you can have it for your reference. And we're basically going to retype everything from the scratch. Now, this is not going to take like ages or anything like that. This will be quite uh, fast because, again, everything is already there. Now, some things we might as well copy and paste it, like, let's say, imports. These are obviously going to be mostly the same. So let's copy and paste that. And we're going to select them all. This will be my loading. Now, the difference is, of course, I don't want room consumer. I want with room consumer. That was the higher order component that we created. Then I also would want to create, obviously, a function. Then room consumer. I'm going to name this like so. And then within the props, I will going to be able to access to the context. Now, one thing that we do need to do is, as we're going to be exporting this, we need to wrap the room consumer, the one that we currently have, or you know what, let's call this room container. Sorry, room container. We would want to wrap it in the with room consumer. So let's write it here. Export default, just so we can name it however we would want. And then we have this room consumer and we pass in the room container. And that's the reason why we're going to have access to this context. Okay, let's write the room container. Now we have successfully wrapped the container in the with room consumer, so how a higher order component. And now we're going to have access to this context, just like we normally would with the props. And again, here's the question. What do you find more easier? Just setting up this room consumer with the value? Or if you have to use it all over the page, you maybe would want to go with higher order component. But there's a last thing that actually is, again, very easy one, which we're going to check it out in the rooms filter where you can just use the hooks. Again, this is really up to you. Now, let me quickly finish this. We're going to say again, loading, loading, uh, sorted rooms, and then rooms. We're obviously passing. This will be coming, in this case, from the context, of course. Then we can also do right away if loading. And then, of course, this all will be exactly the same. So we can just copy and paste that. Okay, a little bit of copying, pasting, not too much. Okay, so we got if, then in this case, this obviously is working really well. Now, the only difference is that I do need to add here, obviously, the closing tag, and this should fix everything that I had on the errors. Hopefully, it will. So, in this case, I am accessing if, and for some reason, I'm not getting back to return. And that's why sometimes the issue with copying, pasting, I guess. Let's delete that. Let's save it. And yes, it is working. Everything is working correct. 
again, this is really up to you. However, you would like to do in the rooms filter. We'll check it out. The uh, hook that we can again use to access the context within the functional component. Again, if you would have some kind of class based component, it's obviously just using the static type. We have successfully finished with a room container. So by the way, we can get rid of this guy. We don't need it here. And if you really don't want to have this div here, of course, you can just delete it and this will become react fragment. And next on our list will not be rooms filter. In fact, it will be a rooms list. Now, the reason for that is because this will be a more straightforward where we just want to render all the rooms that we're going to be filtering. And the only thing that I would want to show you at the very end is the difference in the CSS a little bit and pretty much it, because we were going to grab the room container or I'm sorry, room component that we already created. And we're just going to render the list that we're getting. Okay. Now I can close the room container. I will not need it anymore. Then where is my buddy? Where is my room list? Here it is. And first of all, like I said, let's import the room component from this will be in the same uh, folder, of course, or directory. And then I am getting as a props. I'm passing here the rooms. So I'm grabbing this rooms prop. And then I obviously would want to render them. Now, one thing that I would want to set it up is if there are no rooms, because we will going to be filtering and there's going to be case that rooms array that we're going to be getting as a prop will be in fact empty. So that way I would want to render that. Unfortunately, no rooms matched your search parameter. Now you don't have to do it, but I think this is just going to be a little bit better user experience. Now, the way we're going to do that is going to be very simple. I'm just going to check if the rooms rooms length is in fact equal to zero. Then I'm going to render one thing. So I'm going to say return. And then in that case, we're going to go with a div by the name of empty search. And again, this is already set it up in our CSS. And let's just write this uh, long text and hopefully I will try to not mess it up as far as uh, the spelling is concerned. No rooms matched uh, your search search parameters like so. And then let's do another return, which in fact will be normal return. Obviously, since the array in most cases will going to have some kind of items. In this case, I will going to use section here. So let's use a section with a class of room list like this. And this is obviously not giving me what I would want. So let's write section and then let's add right away class name. And we're going to call this a room list or you know what? No rooms, rooms list. And we're going to have the section. Now, within the section, there's going to be a room list center. So simple div with a room list center. And then within this div, we would want to map our array. So let's call rooms again, the prop that we're getting map method uh, item each and every room as an argument. And then we would want to return that room wrapped in our room component that we already had. The key here will be the same item item ID, and then room will pass as an item. So the room prop that we're expecting in the room component, we're just going to pass each and every object that we have. And that's it. That will be our massive and interesting room component. And the moment we render it, notice, obviously, we are getting bunch of bunch of rooms. Now, there's one thing that's missing, and that is, again, this S. So I apologize. There's rooms and room, and this is what's missing. That's the reason why it's rendered this way. The moment I'm going to save it, obviously, right now, the rendering will be better. We can check it out in a context. Let's say I will going to say sorted rooms will just going to be an empty array because remember, we're passing the sorted rooms. The rooms itself will be passed in a filter. So again, if I'm going to comment this out, Notice we should have the text. Unfortunately, no rooms match to your whatever parameters. And we're going to get that text if our array that we're going to be getting from the context 
will be empty. Now, the last thing that I would want to show you as far as CSS is concerned, and again, we're going to do finding because we have rooms list. Now, notice how for rest of the grid, I was using auto fit when I did my function with repeat. And then I used min max where minimum column width should be like this. And then maximum is going to be one fraction that would be part of the screen. And in the rest of them, I used auto fit. And in this case, I used auto fill. Now, if you want to see the difference is that with auto fill, if there will be extra room within, let's say your layout, it will going to enter this one empty one. So there's going to be this one empty column. However, with auto fit, this is just going to make sure that you have three columns. So they are going to be spanning all across. So if with auto fill, if there's going to be extra room for that column, the same with our rest of your columns, it will be inserted. So in this case, I think it looks a little bit better because let's imagine that if we have one component, it would be just spanning all across the page because it would take up all the space. That would be the effect with auto fit. Now with auto fill, it just says, okay, you have room for one column, but if you have more, I'm just going to be creating the empty spaces. Okay. That's the only thing that I would want to show you as far as the CSS is concerned, uh, that I find of course important. And once we're done with a room list, then we're going to start working on a room filter. All right, guys, I think we're ready to our most important component, which we will use for the filtering. Before we do anything within the search filter or room filter component, I would want to make some changes in our context. And the reason is very simple. If you have done any kind of work with React or especially with React forms, you know that there is an option for using the controlled inputs. Now, what does that mean? That there is a value in a state that is, in fact, reflecting whatever you have right now. And then you also have the on change handler, which makes sure that every time we're going to make a change, it is also affected in the state. And this is exactly what we would want to do here as well. So we will going to have to set up some values in the context state. Then later on, we will going to also set up a function, the handle change function, as well as we will going to pass them down into a filter component and we'll attach them to each and every component. Obviously not all the values from the state, but that particular value, just so we can control the input. Okay, first and first. And why don't we head over to context? Then within the context, like I said, we would want to add more values. After the loading, I would want to add type. And these will be the default values, or basically I'm saying type by default will be all. And if you're wondering, this is obviously our first select box. Now I'm not going to go one by one because you'll see obviously what is happening, meaning I'm not going to scroll over to the page just to show you where we're going to be using it because my first uh, deal is to actually render them. So capacity one, that will be the default price by default will be zero. Then min price will be also zero. Also, I would want max price that also will be zero. Then min size, again, you guessed it, zero. Max size, you guessed it, zero. And then we have breakfast, which uh, will be by default false, as well as last one, pets by default, also will be false. So we have set up the values in a state. Before we start working on our handle change, I would also want to make few changes here. Notice how we're using this dot state where we're changing the values in the state. So as far as the price and the size is concerned, I would want to set up the max ones, not as zero, but whatever max I will be getting from my data. So what does that mean? Well, you see by default, once you're going to refresh it, notice my max price will be all the way up to 600 as well as my max size will be right here. So those are the two values that I don't want zero, but I want specifically from the data. So I don't want to guess what is the max price for the room. In fact, I would want to calculate that from the data that I'm going to be getting. And the way we can do that, I'm just going to set up the variable max price. Now I will going to use math max. 
but we know that we would need to pass it as a value is not as an array. So in this case, we can use the spread operator and I can just use rooms. Now again, rooms will be the data that we're getting back right here. And then we're going to write map. Then of course, item. So return me the price for each and every item. So what will happen is that we will going to be returning the array as we're using map. Then we right away going to use the spread. And this way, we're going to know our max price. Again, we can console log it, but I think we can skip it this way. And the same way I would want to set up with a size. So we're going to copy and paste that. Now I will going to rename this. This will not be max price. It will be max size. And I will be looking not for the price, but also for the size. And the way we're going to do that right now in a state is, first of all, the price we're going to set equal to max price, because again, Right away, you see that my price is all the way on the end. That is my max price. And we're just going to say, all right, max price. Then we already have in a state the max price property. So we just need to write max and not there. But we need to write it within this that's it state max price. So that will be equal, of course, to the max price. And last one will be max size. That also will be equal to the variable that we just created. Let's save that. And then we need to set up two functions, at least some kind of structure, some minimal structure for them, where right after the get room, I will going to say handle change. That will be the name of my function. And I'm just going to say that this function will be expecting an event. And you know what? For the time being, why don't we console log the event target type, name, and value? And the way this is going to work, just like in regular JavaScript, we have access to the event object, then within the event object, we have the target uh, that we're clicking or that is actually being changed, not maybe we're clicking on it. But then we also have option of accessing the value from the target or from the event, the name, as well as the type. So the way we're going to do that, we're going to be const. Uh, let's just go with, uh, first of all, I don't know, maybe type, and that will be event target type, and then we're going to copy and paste that. And these values are just going to change to name. Name like so. That will be my variable. And then we're looking for not type, but we're in fact going to be looking for the value. So event dot target value. And just so we can see everything that's happening. In fact, we're going to do a simple log of type, name and value. Okay, and then eventually we will going to call another method once we're done changing the values, because what we were going to do with this function is, in fact, we're going to grab everything that controlled inputs were going to give us and we're going to fix the values in a state because notice we have a bunch of properties. So what we are going to do is we're going to access those properties and change it from within this handle change function. And then once we run the function after that, we're going to run another function, which will call uh, filter rooms, filter rooms that will not look for any arguments. It will just grab the values from the state and filter rooms. And at the moment, we can just say hello. It doesn't really matter. I'm not going to call it anyway. Okay. Now, what we would want to do, though, is in the state, we have get room, but I also would want to pass not both of them, not filter rooms, but just handle change. So I can write handle change will be equal to this dot handle change. And once we make these changes in the context, we are ready to head over to a room filter and start working with our data. Once we have our general setup in the context JS, I think this is the great time to head over to the room filter where we're going to do most of our work. We're well, going to still head over once in a while to context.js because we will going to have to add more functionality than just a simple console log. But most of the work will be done here. And first and foremost, we're going to have to do some imports. Now, I'm going to be importing right now use context, which is a latest way how we can actually access context. And this one is using the hooks. So I'm going to say from, and this will be from React. And again, this will be used because this is a functional component. 
And of course, we cannot use the static type here. That is the reason why. Now, we also would want right away a room context. Remember, that was something that we used when we were not using the higher order component or the render props because we used actual room consumer. Now, this is a whole context. So hold the whole object that we're creating. Again, we're importing that. And then this will be from the context, of course. So from the context. And last but not least, we do have the title. So I don't know whether you remember, but all the way in the beginning, we created this title component. And that's what I will be right now importing. Let's grab it. This is my title. And first, you probably are wondering, well, how we can access the context? Well, very easy. The only thing we need to do is set up some kind of variable, which in my case will be context. And we can use use context room context. And if we want to double check what we're going to get, let's just go with the context and let's check it out. Of course, inspect not here, but here. And voila, people, we have our object. So we don't need to use render props if we don't want to. We don't need to use higher component, but we can use right away the hooks. And in this case, the use context hook. Obviously, it is very good to know them, the higher order component and the render props. Because like I said, this is not unique just to a context API. You'll see those patterns as well. But probably I think you will going to be sticking with use context because this is as straightforward as it gets. Just get that context API, set this up equal to some kind of variable, and you're good to go. All right. Now, what we would want to destructure from this particular variable? Well, all the things pretty much that we have in the state. And when I say all the things, of course, not all the properties, but a bunch of them. Now, let's start by handle change. That was the function that we needed. Then I'll need a type. And again, only thing I'm going to be doing is listing basically a bunch of these properties. All right, so type, capacity, price, because these will be used as my value on the inputs. That's why I'm going to have the controlled input. Capacity. Capacity, then let's do price. We can also do, I don't know, min price. Mean price, then also max price. And I know this might be a little bit annoying, but I need do need to type them out. Mean size, max size, uh, breakfast, breakfast, and pets. Now, this will be, of course, equal, and we're going to set it equal to context. Context, let's save that. Okay, now we have access to the variables. Awesome. And why do we start working right now on what we're going to be returning? Now, in this case, obviously, I have the div, but instead, I would want section. Section, and I'm going to add some class name here. So I'm going to say class name. Class name will be filter container. Filter container. And in the first video, we're just going to pretty much set up the first one, this first input, the select box, because there's going to be quite a big setup, meaning we were going to have to set up the input box, and then we're going to have to do a little bit of context where we're just working with handle change, as well as we're going to have to get unique values. So why don't we start slow, where we're just focusing on one input, and then you'll see that it gets faster. But the first one will include a bunch of boilerplate that we're going to have to do. Okay, now within the filter container, we're going to have our room by the title of search rooms. Let's render that dude. And let's see what we're going to get. That is obviously my title. Awesome, search rooms. And now we're going to be working with the form. For the form, there will be no action, but I will gonna add class name. Now the class name will be form, uh, filter form, sorry, filter form. And then within the form, I will right away gonna set up some kind of uh, comments because it will gonna be easier. Now that way I'm gonna comment the line and we're gonna say select type and let's write End of select type, end of select type. Otherwise, it's just going to get messed up, at least in my opinion, 
these comments kind of show me where I'm starting with this select input and where I'm ending. Then there's going to be div with a class of form group. Now, within this div, I would want, first of all, a label. Now, label will be for the ID of type. And then we're going to write a room type. After the label, we will have our select box. For the select box, we do have a name and we do need to use this name input. Now, what is the reason for that? Because we will going to be grabbing that value right here when we're going to be working with our handle change. So that is important that that name, in fact, matches. So in this case, I type type. And the reason for that, because of course, here within the state, I also have the type and you'll see why that is important. Just make sure that you actually type this type. The ID is just for the label. So I'm going to say type. And then we do want a value. So I'm going to say value and the value will be the type that I'm getting back from the context state. So this is how we're creating a controlled input. And then we also would want some class name for the styling. I'm going to say form control that I added for the styling. And last but not least, we would want that handle change. So on change, we're going to set this equal to the function that we are getting from the context. And the moment I save it, notice this will be my input. So far, so good. Now, what is missing, though, as you're looking at it? What is, in fact, missing here? Well, we're missing the values that we're getting from the state. And the way, obviously, this data is going to work, if I'm going to head over back to the data JS for each and every room, there will be type of room. Now, the thing is, though, that I just want, don't want all the rooms that I have, because types are obviously going to be repeating. Let's say if you're scrolling up a little bit, you'll notice that, let's say, type is single, then I scroll over to the next uh room it's also going to be single so what happens is that i only want unique values so if i'm looking at my finished project check this out i do have here only the unique values not repeated otherwise i'm going to have for each and every room a type so the more rooms i'm going to add it the more types there are going to be even though they were going to be repeating so we need to be careful there's few ways how we can do it we could technically set this up like this where if i'm going to head over to room filter then within the select, I could be like, okay, so I'm going to grab the select and now we're just going to manually add these types. So first and foremost, we would do, let's say, option, we're going to set some value. I'm going to say this, I don't know, single, and then, val and then the actual input would be single. We could do it this way. The problem though with this way is, again, you don't want to do anything manually. You want to check the data that you're having. And by the way, where are we having the data? Remember when we were using the room filter? Let me show you. We had rooms container. And what we passed in, into rooms filter, we passed everything from the context. So all the rooms from the context. And this is what I was talking to you that I just wanted to show you how we can pass the information. We could technically get this from the context the same way. So this is a bit of an overkill where I could get that information directly but i just wanted to show you how we have many ways how we can pass the context around so what i would be interested is getting these rooms that are being passed and what i would like to do is instead of doing this manually where i'm like okay let me head over to my data and just find out what kind of types i have i would want to set up some kind of function that will return only the unique values how is this going to work well, it's very easy. First, we will going to have to set up some kind of function that will only, only repeat or return unique values. Now, I'm going to do this above where I'm going to say get all unique values, get all unique uh, values, and then why don't we set up the function const get unique. And we're going to be passing two things, the array of items. So whatever items we're going to be passing. But of course, in our case, that will be the rooms array. And then the second one, well, what kind of unique values are you looking for? 
whether you're looking for a unique type, whether you're going to be looking for, let's say, unique capacity and so on and so forth. In our case, in fact, there's going to be only two. There's going to be this guest, the capacity, as well as the room type, because the rest of them are obviously different inputs. Now, in this case, I will going to say value. And then since this is a function, I would want to return something. So I would want to filter this out. If you're struggling with what I'm about to write, please head over to my channel. You're going to head over and you're going to see that there's a playlist for JavaScript challenges. And one of the challenges, in fact, is looking for unique values because I'm not going to spend too much time here. This is very straightforward JavaScript. And again, if you need more information, please head over there. That is one of the solutions that we used. So what I would want from this function to return is in fact an array, but I will going to spread it out right away and I'm going to use new set. Now the key here with the new set data structure is the fact that set only accepts unique values. So within a set, I can just map over whatever items I'm going to be getting, which again, by the way, will be rooms since we're going to pass rooms right here. And then what I would like to return will be item and that item value. So item value. And what's happening here again, we're using the dynamic properties. This will be a string. So I'm going to pass in the string. It will going to check what kind of value you have for the type. And if that value will not be in a set, it will be included. If it's in a set by default, set will not going to include. So this is how we're going to get all the unique values. Now let's test it out this function. And we're just going to pretty much say like this, we're going to say types. Types will use our get unique function. And then we obviously need to pass two things, the array that we're going to be checking as well as what we're going to be checking for. So I'm going to say type. Now I do want to add type of all because that's something that I'm interested in, because that's also going to be one of the options. Okay. Where I would want to get all the rooms with, let's say all the types. Now, why don't we add here? Maybe a comment get and let's do it properly. Get unique, uh, get unique types. Then why don't we add all again? Comment add all. And why don't we say, okay, so we had our array because obviously what we're getting back an array and we can just use again spread operator where I can say I would want to add all. And whatever you had already in the types, whatever you had already in the types, and this will be my types. And what we can do right now is head over to my select. And instead of working here with these values, we could display the JSX, or we can work on this JSX right here, where again, we're going to create some comment map to JSX, then types will be in this case already JSX. Let's write types map. And again, we're just going to wrap this in the option. That's it. Now for the map, we would want two things, item and index. And then we have the function, of course. And what this is going to return? Well, we're going to say we would want to return option. And we would want to wrap option, actually. Option. For the option value will be the item that we're passing. So each and every item that will be in this types array. And last but not least, we have a key that will be index. And let's close it out. However, still within the option, we are going to place our item. Now, lastly, within the select box, we're just going to say that we would want to access types. And what you see here is, OK, so item is not defined room filter seven. Okay, let's check it out. Item, item. And of course, because I'm using the items here, that's the reason. Let's save that. And what do you see here on the right hand side? As far as I can tell, if I'm going to open up, I will have only the unique values, whether that's going to be single, double, family, or presidential. Again, if you need help with this, check it out. One of the actual challenges is getting the unique value. I went over already what we were doing. And then next is just getting these values using that function. And the reason why I created the function is because we were going to, like I said, 
reuse it for the second one for the capacity as well. So we might as well not do the double of work. Then I'm just adding here this all that would be for all the properties. And last but not least, I would want to work with uh, actual JSX. So that's the reason why I'm getting JSX. And last but not least, I'm saying, okay, so set the value for the type. So now what's going to happen if I'm going to head over to the bigger screen so we can see. Remember, we were doing the console logging. So we can clear the console for now. And then we can head over to rooms. Of course, we're already here. And if we're just going to click on it, let's say single. This is going to tell me what that I'm selecting one that is obviously the type that I'm having. Then I do have this type as well as the single. Now the type is let's check it out. What do we have here? Otherwise, it might be a little bit confusing. And you know what? Why don't we add here the actual explanations? What we had within handle change now? Uh, and you know what? We can do it probably with template literals. It's going to be easier. This is, and let's say it like this. This is type. Uh, this is mm, name. And this is going to be the value. So this is value. Let's set this up. Why don't we add maybe this is value. And that way you'll see exactly what is happening. So name. I know a little bit annoying in the beginning, but I just want you to understand because this is important what we are in fact getting back. So this is type. And now let's console log everything that we're going to have where we're going to have this is type. So the type will be select one, then the name will be type. And by the way, name will be the one that we are in fact changing in our state and the value will be family. We also can notice something very interesting where all the time our value goes back to all. And the reason for that is very simple because we do have value set up on a select box and we're getting it from the type. And at the moment, we're just working with the handle change where we're getting the type, the name and the value. However, what we're not doing, we're not changing anything in a state. So if I'm going to head over, let's say, and in the type, we're going to type single. Notice, of course, I'm going to be getting right now the single because this is the controlled input where everything will going to be coming from the state. So that's exactly what I would want to do next, where now that we have this information, so we have whatever change we are we creating, I will going to head over to a context and we're going to set up a little bit better handle change where instead of all of this console logging, we're going to decide what we would want. Well, as I'm looking at the state right now, check this out. I have type, then I have the capacity, price, and all of that. And this is equal to some kind of value. And if you noticed when we were working with console logging, name was actually equal to whatever we had with the state. And then the value is whatever we selected. So how this is going to work? Well, I would want to first of all decide whether I'm going to have the checkbox or this is going to be something else. Because with the checkbox, in fact, we're not going to be looking for the value. We were going to be looking for a check. So first and foremost, we were going to say like this. We we're going to say that there's going to be a target. Now target will going to be very general where we have event target. Then after that, I would want to set up the value again. By the way, I can just delete this guy because this will be an if statement where I'm going to say const value. So again, this is because we have the checkbox. If you wouldn't have the checkbox, you wouldn't have to do that. Then event type. And I'm going to check if the type is equal to the checkbox. Then instead of target value, we'll have a target check. So in fact, we're going to say, OK, if there is checkbox, then use target checked. And then, and by the way, this is not what I wanted, dot checked. And then if it's not a checkbox, we're just going to use, like we did before, target value. That's number one. 
and name will stay the same. So there will be target name as well as the target value. And now it's really interesting the way we can do that within the this dot set state is the fact that I can again use the dynamic variables in my object. So instead of saying, okay, so once I get these values, this is just going to be for the type. What I would want to do is for all my inputs, every time I'm going to be changing, I'll be dynamically checking what is my name. And then the way we can do that is very simple. I'm going to say whatever name property I'm getting back, just check that value in a state and set this equal to whatever value we have currently from our input. Okay, now name and we're going to set the value. The last thing that I would want to do is run this this dot filter rooms, because depending on whatever we're going to do with our input, we're also going to be changing these values. So once this runs, once we run this that state as a callback function, we're going to run this filter rooms. So we're going to change this value in a state. And then depending on that, we're going to filter our sorter rooms. Remember, that was something that we we're going to be passing down into the room list, the sorted rooms. Let's change that. And now let's check it out. I will going to have access to it. And now in this case, I will going to call single. Now this calls me hello. And the reason why it calls hello, because we already have here the filter rooms. And obviously with filter rooms, we have console log hello. All right, now. I do think that it will be a little bit more beneficial if we're going to head over to react tools, then we have the room provider. And now let's check it out what we're going to have for the type. As you're looking at it, what is the type right now? I believe this is single. So if I'm going to head over here to family, what I'm going to have, I'm going to have the family and the same I'm going to have within my input family. Now, if I'm going to go back to all this, of course, will be all and so on and so forth. And this is exactly what we're going to do later on with the rest of the inputs, where we're going to have access to a value in a state, because this is an object and we can access the properties dynamically by passing in the value. And then we're just going to set it equal to whatever value we're getting from the input. And I understand that probably the most confusing is this part, as far as the handle changes concerned, because again, we're not doing it one by one. We're not saying type will be equal to value. No, we're saying whatever I'm getting back doesn't matter whether it's type, whether that's capacity, whether that's money, it doesn't really matter. As long as you name them exactly like you have in a state, you should have no issues. All right. Now, we also would want to set up the filter rooms. And like I said, the first one will be the longest one. And once we already set up everything, this is where it's going to go faster. Okay. Now, in the filter rooms, first and foremost, I would want to get rooms from my state, not sorted rooms. Sorted rooms will be passing down the rooms, the original value that we have, because the changes we're going to be making to the sorted rooms. But if we want to ever want to go back to original values, this is why we would want to access rooms. So again, we're going to have to do a little bit of destructuring where we have rooms, then we'll have type. Then we have capacity, then we're going to have price. So again, we're just going to be checking these values, mean size, uh, max size. And what else we have? We have breakfast and we have pets. Now, where is this coming from? Very simply, it's coming from this dot state. Again, very important to understand that this is a callback function because this dot state is a synchronous. So we need to make sure that we only run this when the state is actually changed. Okay. All right. We have successfully destructured our state values. And again, please remember rooms, not sorted rooms. Sorted rooms will be the ones that we're going to be changing. Then we're going to set up some temporary variable. We're going to say let temp rooms is equal. And now why don't we do the spread operator where what I'm getting back from the state we will use the spread operator. Now we're going to have an array. And why don't we set up our first if statement where I'm going to say if type and now I'm talking about this specific type is not equal to all is not. Please remember, this is again important. If it's not equal to all, 
I would want to filter my temp rooms. So the way I'm gonna write is temp rooms is equal to temp rooms filter, and then we can say return me only the rooms that match the current type. Because what we we're gonna do right here is just like I showed you, we changed the values for the type. One of them was single, then we had all and whatever. So what I'm saying here is unless this is all, in that case, we were just gonna have our original value. We're not gonna change anything. If the value for the type is anything but all, then I do wanna filter it. Then I do wanna return only the rooms that in fact are matching the room type that I'm passing. So return me only the rooms that has the same type that we're getting right now from the state. And obviously when I'm talking about the type, I'm talking about the value. Now, last thing that I would want to do within this uh, filter rooms is again, set another this that set state. And in this case, like I said, what's important, we got the rooms, we got the original value. And I would want to change not the actual rooms, but the sorted rooms that we are accessing later on in my list. So in this case, I'm going to write temp rooms. So set this equal in a state, the sorted rooms to the temp rooms. Okay, now let's save that. And at the moment, again, this is ROMs. I can see already there's some kind of temp, uh, not the temp. There's already some kind of bug, not some kind of bug. I can see that I'm accessing ROMs, not the rooms. Let's do that. Now, once we save that, it complains about uh, 81. And then, of course, this is not temp items. This is temp rooms. Yep, bugs crawled in. Now let's test it out. We're going to head over to my recording. We can maybe make this big smaller. Now notice I do want to still show you what's happening here. So let's click on double and voila, our type is double. So we changed it. And what kind of rooms we have? We have only the rooms that have the type of double. That's it. That's the only thing we needed to do. And as long as we're going to be changing that value, that's when we're going to be displaying only those rooms. Now, if I'm going to click on all, notice now I'm going to be getting again the full value because I have type of all and I'm going to grab all the original rooms. And that's the reason why when we pass down to a room list, we are using the sorted list, the uh, sorted rooms. But if we would want, let's say again, use the type all, I'm going to get back all the rooms. So that's how we can do the filtering. This was our first filter. So like I said, the second ones and the third ones and the fourth ones should be already much faster because we have all our structure. I know the first one was a doozy, but once we have all our structure, I think it will going to go faster. And the next one will be, in fact, the guests. So I'm going to be checking how many people are max for each and every room. And again, we're going to do a bunch of the same things. So in this case, I can and I will going to copy and paste it. And we're just going to be changing here the values because I don't see the point of retyping all the divs and everything. Now, this will be guests. And I'm not going to call this type. You can just say, OK, so there will be guests. And that's all. There will be no type. Then I will going to leave the form group. So form group will stay. Type will not be my label. In fact, this will be named capacity. We're just going to write here guests. That's all. Guests. Then for select, naming again will not be type, as well as the ID. So both of these will going to become capacity. Uh, value. Obviously, again, we're not accessing the type. So we're accessing the variable by the name of capacity. Handle change will not change because we're going to use the still the same function. That's the reason why we spent so much time on a proper setup. And then for the types, I would need to do very similar like we did already previously. So what we're going to do right here is we're going to say that first and foremost, we're not going to be getting the types. We are going to be getting the people. So I'm going to say let people and again, we can name this however we would like. Um, that is just the naming that I came up with. I will going to be checking for unique. That is obviously the function that we set up. I'm still going to be running through the rooms array. Then we're going to be looking for capacity. 
So for each and every room, what would be the unique capacity as well as we might as well can right away set up everything with a JSX. In this case, we don't need to add anything, so I'm not going to have to use the spread and I'll add all the all string. And then why don't we do this? Why don't we say people map? Uh, there will be item and the index again, because this is an array like already previously. Then let's just do a return. And again, we are returning an option. So we're saying option key will be item ID or you know what? No, let's just do index here, because obviously this was just going to be an array with numbers, whether that's one, two or three or four. And then what else we would want for the option? Well, we would want value. Of course, the value will be actual item within this array that's being returned. And then last but not least, we would want to display whatever we got in there. So item now within the second select box, we're not going to be looking for the types. In fact, we'll be looking for people. Let's test this out. Sure enough, now we do have our guests. Everything is working fine. We should be also able to change the values in the state right away because our handle change is already working. I will going to head over to the bigger screen because I do want to show you the React Dev Tools. Let's do inspect. Let's have a React open. And then I don't have a select box. That's not what I want. Type will be all. But what we're going to be focusing on is, of course, the capacity. I want you to keep track of something. And that is what type of value this is. Not what value this is, but what type of value. Because as you're looking at, notice that this right now is a number. However, check this out. Once I save it, notice these quotation marks. So what's happening right now, this is in fact string. Now, this is simply because when we are getting back the value from the select box, this will be automatically as a string. So we were going to have to do a little bit of parsing where we're going to turn it back into a number. That's the reason why we're going to do that within our function. All right. Now we're going to head over back to the context. We have our filter rooms. We did our first filter. Remember, we got our temp rooms, so we were filtering already. But now what I'm going to do is right after I got my rooms and everything. And by the way, I'm going to start adding comments because there's going to be a bunch of values that are repeating. So in this case, I probably think that uh, adding comments would make a little bit more sense. Let's say all the rooms. Then after that, why don't we do a transform values? values and what we're saying here is obviously we already changed the value in a state so now we're getting back to capacity but capacity will be string so what i can do right now is i can say okay whatever capacity i had and that's the reason why i use let here because i'm going to be overriding them i'm going to say capacity will be in fact used with parse integer which will make sure that instead of string we're going to be getting the uh number of course now, this is going to transform the values. And now I would want to write the comment that filter by type. And then now we're going to be filtering by capacity. Filter by capacity. Whenever we're talking about this kind of filter, again, it will be a lot similar like we already had before. And the way we're going to write that is just going to be if capacity is not equal to one is not equal to one like so then we would want to filter it again and the way we're going to filter it we're going to say temp rooms again like we had before is equal to temp rooms filter and then what i would want to pass is a room if the capacity property on the room so room capacity is in fact bigger or equal to a capacity. Now, if it's going to be one, then again, we're not going to touch it. We pretty much will going to have our original array. But if we're going to make sure that capacity, let's say, is bigger, if we're getting a bigger value for capacity, let's say two, then return me only the rooms that will have this capacity property bigger 
or equal to two. All right, now let's head over back again. We have all our rooms. Check this out. If I'm gonna let's say three, then my value changes in a state. And what do I see? I see only the rooms that have the capacity of three. That's how we can filter by capacity. Next one up, we have filtering by price, but I do want to close the console just so we can see that obviously both of them would work together. So if I'm going to go, let's say for all, then in this case, this will not show anything. And that's the reason when I said to you, the more data you are going to have, the more interesting this will be by filtering. Of course, if I'm saying that I'm just looking for a room type by the name of double, and then I'm expecting that this will have a guests of three. Unfortunately, within those particular rooms, we cannot have three guests. However, within the family room, we can check it out. Okay, so all the family rooms, as far as I can tell, have right now, right now, the guest minimum of three, meaning we can stay three people if we would want to. But we also can obviously do that in Prudential. That's the reason why it shows all the rooms, which in our case is just one that you can stay with three guests. If I'm going to go back to all, then this will show me all the family ones that I can stay at least three people can stay there. Now, within the single and double, there is a max. And uh, the max for the single, let's say, would be one. And for double, this will be two. However, if I'm going to go, let's say, with two, then this, again, will going to show me all the rooms that I would want. And let's say, in this case, all the double rooms that two people can stay in, and all of them can stay in all the double rooms. All right. Now, we do see that both of them can be used together. So that is working. Now, next one up, we're going to have the price. And the more filters we're going to add it, the more, of course, again, it will depend on how much data you have. Because for 13 rooms, and if we have six filters, understand that it's kind of hard to combine them where we can check by all of them all at the same time. Now, we can always check them, obviously, one by one, because we're just returning all the rooms. But the more filters you're going to have, the more it will going to make sense to have way more data. That way, this will be interesting. Otherwise, of course, for all the double rooms, there's only two people that can stay for all the single rooms, one, and so on and so forth. Okay, now, as far as the money is concerned, as far as we're working with the price, why don't we grab here or you know what, we're going to create a new one. Because in this case, we will going to create a input with a type of range. So it's not like we can really repeat everything within a select. Let's write room price, copy and paste that. Let's say end of room price, end of room price. And then here we're going to write again first a div with a class of form group. Within the form group, we're going to have some label. Then I will going to go with price for my label and we're just going to write room price. And we can also access the current price that we're going to have, because what we need to remember is that we are going to be changing this. Notice how the price will be changing and we'll be displaying whatever price we have currently, whatever value we have in the state. That's the reason why we're going to access price here. After the label, we're going to work with an inputs. So I'm going to say that there will be input. Now, this will not be simple text. In fact, we're going to have range. And now name again is important because it needs to match whatever we're going to have in the state. So this will be price. And for the range, we have min max. That's the reason why we set up min price and max price values. That's the reason why we're getting them out of the state. So max uh, attribute will be equal to the max price. And then we'll have an ID. Now, ID again will be used with a label. Let's just write price. And we also need, of course, the value. Value will be the price that we are getting currently from the state. On change, we'll work with a handle change like we already did before. Handle change. And then last but not least, we have the class name. Class name and the class name will be simply um, what we have. We have form control. Form control. Let's check it out. 
control and not control X. In fact, this will be control. Once we say that, yep, this, of course, is the room price, but I can change it. Oh, no, actually, everything is working already. Yeah, right. Because we already have the handle change. Now, as I'm going to be scrolling, I'm not filtering anything, but you notice how the value is changing. And that's the reason why I have 600. If you'll notice in all my rooms, the max value will be 600. And that's something that we did. And by the way, we already had the filter here. But the reason for that is because my presidential is 600. If some room would be, let's say, 1000 then $1,000 would be shown. And remember, we did that in the context in the very beginning when we were getting our data. Now, once we have the room price, all this is done. What we need is filtering because at the moment, again, we are just getting the type as well as the capacity. Again, as we're looking at our state, what you'll notice is that from the range, again, the same thing happens like we did before, where the value will be changing in a state, all that is going to be happening. But notice the max price is 600. The moment I touch it, the price is 577. And as you can see here, quotation marks, that means that this is a string. And again, something that whenever you're working with the range, the return that you're going to get back will be, in fact, a string. So what we need to do is, again, the same thing like we did with capacity. Then in this case, we're just going to change this around where we're going to have not capacity, but we're going to write price. So the price that we are getting from the state, first and foremost. And now let's do a little bit of filtering, where again, after the filter by capacity, you know what I'm going to add here, change state, just so I can see where I'm actually changing the state. And we're going to set up another filter. Now this filter be filter, filter by price. And then what we're going to do over here, we're going to say if, and in this case, we can just go with no if statement, because what we need to understand that if in general, we're going to be changing the price, then we would just want to display all the rooms that are being obviously rendered right now. In that case, we can skip the if statement. We can say temp rooms equals to temp rooms like so. And we're going to run with filter. Now, within the filter, we're going to have what? Well, we're going to have not temp rooms, but we're going to have temp and temp room instead of temp rooms and then filter. And what are we saying here? We're going to say room if your price is less than the price that we currently have in the range, then that room will be displayed. So let's write room price if your price is less then price, then obviously our rooms will be rendered. Okay, let's save that. And if we're going to go to the bigger screen again, I'm going to close this one right now. And if you're going to notice something that if I'm changing the price, also the rooms that ha have the price less than what we currently have in a range, only those rooms will be rendered. I'm going to go up to let's say 431. The last room will be 400. And then I have 280. And that's how we can filter according to a price that we're setting here in our range. Now that we are experts already, how we can work with the filtering. Why don't we complete our application as far as our search rooms component is concerned? Because in this case, we will going to set up filter according to the size, as well as we are going to create these checkboxes and set up the functionality. Okay. Now we have the end of room. That is not what we want right now. We would want the size and I'm going to say end of size and of size, as well as we will going to have a div by the name of form group within this form group. We will going to have label a label will be for the size in this case. And then we're going to call this room size after the label. I would want to set up div. Now within this div, and we're going to call this size inputs and not input, but in fact inputs. And then within this div, we are going to place these two inputs. One will be for the small size and the other one will be for the big size. 
uh, input type will be number. We're gonna head over with a number, and then as far as name is concerned, we're gonna say min size ID in this case. We're just gonna be a size, of course, because this is what we have label for size. Then our value will be from the state mean size. And then what else we would want? Well, we also could use on change that will be equal to our handle change. And last one will be class name. Class name will be, of course, for styling, self explanatory uh, size input size input so size hyphen input all right that is my input and what i would want right now is copy and paste this guy copy and paste that and the second one will just have different values where instead of min size will change everywhere to the max size now that obviously is in two places so value as well as the naming will be max size instead that should do it that will be my room size, min and max. And again, remember the filtering that we did all the way in the very, very beginning when we did have component did mount, we checked for the max size and we set this up in a state. So that is exactly why we have this value of thousand. Again, if one room would have a bigger size, bigger square footage, obviously that will be rendered. And then last but not least, I would want to show these checkboxes. So in this case, let's write extras. And I just want to complete here everything within our component. And then we're going to set up the context. There's no point for us to jump back and forth because we already should have the general idea and of extras. Now in this one, again, we're going to start with the div form group within the div. We're going to have a two other divs. One of them will be or both of them, in fact, will be single extra single extra within this div what i would want is input by the type of checkbox name will be breakfast and again this needs to match whatever state values we have uh for the id i don't think we need anything just delete it because there's not going to be a label or you know what no uh, my apologies there will be a label so why don't we write here breakfast like so and right after the input, we're going to write our label. And I didn't notice that it was right after it. And why don't we write uh, breakfast since that is the div? And let's just write breakfast here as well. Okay, we have our setup for the input. We do need to have obviously the value. However, the value in this case will not going to be value attribute by itself. But because we are working with a checkbox, we need to set this equal as checked. Now for the checked, we will going to be checking what is the value that we're getting back from the breakfast property in the state. All right. And we also have the on change that will be applied later on. So I'm going to say on change and the change. Let's save that. This will be my breakfast. And just to show you that this is working, if I'm going to head over back to a state and I'm going to set this equal to true. Notice the checkbox will be checked. Okay, let's do that. Let's say false back to false. And last but not least, I would want one more div exactly the same. Just the value will not be breakfast. It will be pets. Now, in this case, I will going to select a bunch of them because I would want to pretty much change them all together. So I have one breakfast, second breakfast. This guy is a breakfast. This guy is a breakfast and this guy is a breakfast. We're going to delete them all. I'm just going to write pets. That should be the value that I'm getting back from the state. So pets, pets and pets. This should do it. Once we have this kind of setup, then uh, we have context, of course, and we can do all our changes in a context. First one we we're going to be looking at is not going to be filtering by price. But in fact, we're going to filter by size. The way this is going to work, we're going to say, and this is change state. So let's leave that. But again, we don't need to even use the if statement. You can just say temp rooms. And temp rooms is obviously the array we will have. And we're just going to filter it. And we're going to say filter by. And in this case, we're going to say room. 
and now we're gonna be checking. We want to make sure that we are only returning the room, which size is in fact bigger than minimum size that we're gonna have over here and smaller than maximum. And the way we write that, we can just say room size is bigger. And by the way, I need to write bigger here. I need to say uh, bigger than a min size. And then also I need to use the and operator. So I'm going to say and room size is less than the max size. So min and max. Okay. This is going to filter depending on the room size. And we also have two more filters. And those ones will be the breakfast and the pets. Why don't we add here that uh, filter by size and filter, let's say, filter by breakfast, breakfast, and then copy and paste that. And this will be pets, pets. And again, very simple filter where I'm going to say if breakfast is true. So, in fact, if we click on it, then we were going to be checking basically temp rooms again. Temp rooms is equal to temp rooms filter and then return me a room that room breakfast is in fact equal to true. Okay, and very similar way where we have filter by pets. You can just copy and paste that filter by pets and instead of breakfast of course we're just gonna have to change it here we're gonna say we are selecting both of them and we would just want to select pets whether the pets is true then of course we're going to be returning only the rooms that allow pets uh one thing that i want to mention is the fact that the reason with the checkbox it doesn't use the value attribute it just uses the checked attribute that's the reason why we check the type and if the type was checkbox, then we know that we're targeting the checked attribute instead of the value attribute. We're almost ready to take our baby out for a spin, but I am noticing that there is a bug because in this case, I set this equal to target. So I went with event, not target. This is equal to target. And instead of what I'm not checking is I should be checking target type, not the event type, right? Now let's set this up. We're going to head over to our document. And in this case, why don't we start checking which rooms have the breakfast and which don't. So if I click on it, I'm being shown that these four rooms have the breakfast. If we click on it again, now we see all the rooms. Same thing we can do with the pets. These rooms allow pets or these rooms can have pets and the breakfast. If you're going to get rid of the pets, now you're going to have only breakfast. So what we can see is that all the rooms that offer breakfast also offer pets. However, there's rooms that don't offer breakfast, but do offer free pets. And of course, we can combine it with all the rest of the filters that we already had. The same goes with size. I could go to, let's say, zero square footage. In this case, this is not going to work. But let's say these rooms are at least 500 square footage. And I can obviously add it to the price and so on and so forth. And this is how we can set up all the filtering in our application. Awesome, guys, we have a fully functional project. However, there is one thing that is bugging me. And that one thing is very simple. Currently, we are using our local data. And while that not be a big issue, and overall, it was really good when we were setting up the application, because if we needed to do any kind of changes, we could just do it in our data JS. The problem will be later on when we are hosting this application, let's say on a Netlify, because if we're using the local data, that means two things. First of all, we always will going to have to have access to this project on our machine. Obviously, if we would want to make some kind of changes and let's say if we would want to add one more room, we would need to get that image. We would need to import this image in a file, set up the object, as well as what that means is that most likely you will be the one who needs to add these changes. And for the simple reason, let's imagine a scenario where person is not aware of what is a JavaScript object or something like that, and they're struggling with this kind of setup. So wouldn't it be nicer if there would be a external resource where we can set up our data, 
separately from our project in order to set up the data. We're going to have a nice graphical interface. So even somebody who doesn't know anything about our project would be able to do it. And we could access that data using the CDN. And not only that, we could access the data, even though we would have different type of application. Let's say currently we are obviously using the react application. Well, we could do the same with Gatsby. We could do the same with vanilla JS and that external platform will be by the name of contentful. And I already named all the nice features about contentful, but why don't I repeat? Well, contentful is a content infrastructure. And what that means is that we can have a nice graphical interface to set up our application. And then we can consume our application regardless whether we have React application, Gatsby application, vanilla JS application, just to name a few. And Contentful is something called headless CMS or BOIF, which would translate to bring your own front end. And this is exactly what I mentioned before, where regardless of the type of application we're going to have, we will be able to consume our data without changing the data. Obviously, Contentful has a paid versions and all that, but we will going to use a free one. And the free one just requires for the email, nothing more. So I would encourage you to sign up. You get like 5,000 records, two spaces, and all that. So I don't think there is no reason why you shouldn't try it out and set it up for this application. Now, next one up, I will going to log in again. Hopefully, you're going to sign up for the free version and you're going to be able to follow along. Now, once we click on login, I will going to be directed to a space. And this is something you won't going to see because most likely in the beginning, you're just going to have to sign up for the example space. So you'll be met by this type of screen. Now, in this video, I would like to do a brief overview what you should expect from the interface. And next, we're going to be setting up the content model as well as the content. So as you're looking at it, there's really four things that are really important, especially in the beginning, as you're working with Contentful. So first of all, would be the space. Again, most likely you're going to have the example space, but if you would want to create a new space and you can think of it as a database, as a project, you can just click here on creating a new space. As you're using the free ones, you can see that I'm using one of two. And that means that the moment I'm going to create a second one, that would exceed what I can use with obviously the free one, or that would pretty much limit to two environments. Now I'm going to open this up and I'm going to call this example, just like you probably will going to have in the very, very beginning. So I'm going to say proceed, then we're going to create a new space. And before we start talking about content model or content, I would want to show you that if you have that example space, or in general, you have a space and you do want to delete it, you will need to head over to general settings and notice then it says remove space and all its contents. And then you just need to say, okay, so this is going to be the example one or whatever space you have. And if you would want to remove it, you just need to type example, obviously the name of it. And I went all caps here, example, and we're going to remove the space. Then again, I'm going to go back to the space that I already had. Depending on what you have, you can either create a new one or you can keep on working on the example one that let's say you didn't delete. Then we have a space home. And what's really nice over here is the documentation for how we're going to be consuming the data. We were going to use the SDK, which means software development kit, but you can obviously access this also with API. We're not going to do that right now because we still would need to have a look how we can set up the data. Then next one up, we have the content model. And notice we have beach room or beach resort room. Obviously, this for you should be empty because if you just set up the data. But for me, I already set up the data that we're going to be consuming with this application. Again, what content model would be if we're going to head over back? That would be the structure for your inputs. So let's say in our case, this is obviously a room. So content model would be structure for that room input. And you can think of it again as an object. You can think of it as any kind of structure that would give you availability later on to add that particular data. Notice I have few content models here for multiple courses and tutorials. 
let's say I have a coffee item, coffee house products, and so on and so forth. And what you're noticing here, these would be the fields. So this would describe what kind of content I'm actually going to be adding. All right. Now, once we have the content model, then after that, we have the content. So once I have set up the blueprint of how my data will be structured, then I only need to work as a factory and just keep adding any kind of data I would like. So if I'm going to go over to my beach resort room, you'll notice that I you have or I have 13 entries, and this will pretty much be each and every room. All right. Now, last but not least, as far as the general interface, we would be interested again in the settings and setting up the API keys. So why we're interested in that? Because in order to consume that data, we will going to have to use these API keys. We can head over to API keys again for you. You most likely will just going to have one example one, but I already set it up a multiple ones for my different tutorials and projects. And the way you can just add a new API key very simply, you just click over here. We're adding new API key. You can name it however you'd like. You can have description, but yeah, what you'll be interested is this data. One will be the access token and the second one will be space ID. Now, once we have the general idea how the contentful interface works, next one up, we're going to be setting up the content model as well as the content for our data. Once we have the general understanding how we can work with contentful interface, next one up, we would want to set up the structure for the data that we're going to be creating. I already have the structure. I already have beach room resort as well as I have all the data here. Now, I do want to show you how to do it from the scratch. And this is the reason why I'm going to set up the example one. However, in the next video, when we're going to be adding the data, I will going to keep on adding to the data to a content model that I already have, because there's no point for me to create two of them and just keep adding to the new one. All right. But I do want to show you how to do everything from the scratch. So first things first, we would need to go with add content type. And the name here is important because this will be used as API identifier. So you will going to need to access it later on because by default, you're going to be getting all your data and most likely you would want to limit of what kind of data you would like to consume. So in my case, I will going to call this beach. Beach uh, resort room, and you can call this however you would like. I will going to go with example because by the next video, I'm going to delete it anyway. So I'm going to write a create a new one. And notice this is the ID that we're going to be using. Like it says here, use this ID to retrieve everything related to this content type via API. All right. So this is something that you would need to remember regarding of what kind of naming you have. And next one up is very, very simple where we just start adding the fields we would like. So I'm going to go with the first one and the first one will be name. As you can see, these would be the type of fields we can have. Whether we have the rich text, text number, and I'm not going to name them all of them. You can obviously see them as you're working with contentful. Now we're going to go with the text. This will be the first one for the name. And here we have two options. We can go with the short one or the long one. So for description, we're going to go with the long one. But for the simple name field, I'm just going to go here and I'm going to say that I would like to create. And the moment we created, we have two options. We could have configured in a previous screen or we can do it here. Now, what do I mean by configuration? Well, a lot of times what I see, especially in the courses and tutorials where people forget to add that particular field. So let's say they do set up here your content model, but later on when they're adding the content, they like skip some kind of field. And then when they're trying to access it, they write me, hey, John, listen, so there's something wrong with the application. I cannot access that particular field. Well, the problem is that most cases, the student or whoever is watching the project just skips adding that field. So in order to avoid that, we can just go with required field. So that way we're making sure that we're not going to be able to save this particular content as we're adding that content into this content model if we skip that field. Now, this is really up to you. If you're 100% confident that you will not be that person, then obviously you can skip this. But in general, I always prefer to do it myself because that way I am not skipping something. All right. Now, first one was the name. Then after that, we have the slug. And again, we're going to go with simple text. I'm going to go with slug. We're going to create. 
And in general, I'm going to go to validations and required field. Now I'm also going to show you how we can do it right away as we're saving. Next field up will be price. And for that, we're going to go with integer. In this case, we have a decimal. So if you're going to go with rooms, let's say that have decimal price, obviously go with decimal. I'm going to go with integer and I'm just going to call this price. All right, now I'm going to create it. And in this case, notice we also have create and configure. And that way we right away go to validations and we can just say required. And obviously you have other options, but again, we are going to be skipping in this tutorial. Then we have the type right after the price. We're going to go with the type type will be again, short text. So we're going to go with type short text, create configure validations, required field. And next one up, we do have the size for the size. Again, we're going to go with integer. So number integer, this will be size of the room. So what would be the square footage validations required field? All right, then we do have the capacity. So what would be the max people of how many can stay in a room? Again, we're going to go with integer. So let's call this size, create configure. And in this case, it's complaining that it's already there. Well, because the name obviously is not uh, size, it's capacity. My bad capacity, create and configure validations required field. All right, we have that. And then we have two of them pets and breakfast that will be Boolean. So we just go with, let's say Boolean here. And we have pets, whether pets are allowed. Again, we set up the validations. All right, next one up, we have breakfast. Again, we're going to go with the Boolean breakfast, create and configure. And in this case, again, we are going with the required field. After that, we're looking whether the room is featured. So whether the room shows up on a homepage, this is where we're setting up that featured room. And in this case, again, we go with that field. Again, we're going to go with Boolean featured and I will going to be skipping over here because this is as straightforward as it gets. Again, we're going to go with a required field. And then we have the description extras and images. And just to show you that obviously you don't have to always have everything required. I will not going to create them as required fields. But again, remember, if you want them as required fields, make sure that you click on configuration. Let's go with a description. And for description, we will going to go with long text because technically we could fit everything that we have here. Of course, I don't think we have 255, but I will going to go with long text. Now, in this case, I will going to call this description like so create. And again, in this case, I'm not going to be requiring that field. Extras will be what we can see in a single home page. Notice if we're going to be navigating here, these will going to be my extras. And for extras, we are going to use something new that we haven't seen yet, and that is a JSON object. So what we're going to say is the JSON object. This is what we're going to use for extras, create and configure if you want to have required, or I'm just going to go with required. And then last one will be images. Now for the images, notice that we are obviously using multiple of them because for the single page, it's not just one image. In fact, this is many files. So this is the difference. If you just want one image, you go with one file. If you want multiple images, you just say that images and this will be many files. Okay. Now, once we create it, I will going to save it again. Remember, this is where we're going to be able to find the ID. Obviously, I'm going to come back to this. I'm just giving you a heads up. And then once we save it in the next video, I would like to start adding the content because our content model is there. So we have the blueprint of what kind of data we would like to add. And if you would want to add the data again, we're heading over to the content and then we have option basically decide where you would want to add the entry. If I would want to add to beach resort room, which I will do, I would add it here. If you want to add to example or the one that you created, obviously you would need to click on that. In your case, most likely just because you just started, this will be the only option, the content model that we just created. But in general, once you're going to have multiple, this is where you will need to use this drop down and decide where you would want to add the content. Once we have successfully set up the content model, now this would be a great time to start adding the content. Before we do that, I will going to delete my example because like I said previously, I will going to be adding my content to previously already created content model. And in order to delete that particular content model, we just need to head over there. 
click on the leading. Then I will gonna select the name here since I'm lazy to type it out. And sure enough, we can just delete it and the content model is gone. Then we're gonna head over to the content. And like I said, we would need to decide to where we would want to add it to which content model. Well, in our case, I will gonna go with beach resort room and we are just gonna click on adding the entry again. The same would go here. We can click anywhere we would want, but we have the suggested one already. All right. Now, in this case, once we click on it, we are adding the entry and then we just need to decide what would be the name. Since I'm going for all the rooms, I'm going with single, then double, then let's say family. In this case, just because these will be examples, I'm just going to name them triple and we're going to start with economy. And then we also would need to add a slug. In your case, as always, you can come up with whatever names you would want. Then for the type, this will be triple price, let's say will be 500 bucks size will be 1200 uh, square footage, then capacity. We're obviously going to say that max three people can stay there. Uh, no pets allowed, no breakfast, no free breakfast. It will not be featured. And again, just because I want to save a little bit of time, I'm just going to grab the description that I had already previously. We're going to copy and paste that. Then next one up, we have the extras and for the extras again, I already have this array set up like this for the JSON one. So I'm just going to copy and paste it in your case. If you want to create it from scratch, this is really up to you. Then we have the image and we have multiple ways how we can add images. The first one, the most easiest one would be from your local machine. So I'm just going to click on it. This is going to select everything that I have. I will going to head over to a desktop. Then I already added them to the images and most likely you're going to have these images as well. And we're going to start by room 13. So we're going to open that. All right. This will be our first image. And then always, always remember to click on publishing. Otherwise, again, this is the part where sometimes uh, somebody who is watching the tutorial or course skips and then you'll have no access to that image. This would be our first and only image currently. But remember, we set it up that we will have multiple images. And what we can do here, the other option would be link existing assets. And in this case, I'm having all the images that I already have in the contentful. In your case, again, probably you'll just going to have this one image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find where I have those linked images. And remember, when I had a single room for all the rooms, I had these three images that were basically describing that one particular room. And the way you can do that is since, again, you're linking your assets, you can just say, OK, show me this one, this one and this one. So these three will be added. And the way I did it is I added for all the rooms. Now, once we have this set up, the only thing we need to do is click on adding. And then we have a few options. We can click here where we're going back to all the content that we have, or I can just add a new one here again, multiple ways how we can create a new content. And in this case, I'm back in the content screen where I could search for different type of contents. So this is going to give me coffee item again, coffee product, or I'm going to go back to beach room resort. This will show me all the entries that I have. And then if I would want to add new entry, obviously I just click here. And again, if you want, you can add it to different content types. But since we're working right now with beach rooms, it will only going to make sense if we keep on adding the content. All right. Now let's go with content, uh, not content, sorry, triple. And let's call this basic. Then again, we're going to do the same thing. So lots of repetition here. Triple basic type will be triple. Then uh, price, let's go with, I don't know, $600. Again, I'm just free writing right now here. Um, I don't know, 30 or 3000 square feet. Capacity still will be three people no pets, uh, no breakfast, or you know what, let's give it a breakfast here, but no pets, uh, it will not be featured. And same old spiel here. We're going to go with description. I'm just going to make sure that we copy everything correctly. Then copy and paste JSON, the same deal. We had our extras. Okay. So just a little bit of data input here. Then last one will be images. And again, in this case, I will going to show you that 
we are not limited to adding from the computer or from the assets we already have. We can obviously also do the web search. So let's say here you would look for, I don't know, hotel. So this is just going to give you all the images that you can add for the hotel. I will not going to go with this route. I will still going to continue adding from my device. But just to let you know, this is also your option. I'm going to go with room 14. This will be my image. All right. As always, let's make sure that we remember to click on publishing. Then we're going to head over back. And like I said, we would want to add these new assets. And by the way, this is not what I wanted to do. This is going to give me the draft where I can just delete it. So in this case, I can say, all right, I don't want this asset. And last one I would want is link existing assets. Or the way we would do that, of course, again, we're going to find for the images that will be added to all my rooms. Okay, now this will be added. Again, we can just get rid of that guy because we don't need it. And then we just click on publish. So this will be the second one. And I'll show you the third one, which will be the last one. Because again, you probably don't want to watch me do the data entry. So it doesn't really make sense to do more than three. Now, last one, I'll show you that we can do it from the actions tab right here. So we don't have to go back. Just click here, create. Now this will going to create a new entry. And then I'm going to check it out. What was the naming that I used? So I used single standard. Okay, so this will be my last one. So I'm going to go with single or you know what, not triple, uh, triple standard. Standard room, this will be standard, of course, the slug will be the same just with a hyphen. Like so type will be still triple price. I don't know, we can go with maybe 200. Again, we're just free writing here. Uh, size, I don't know, maybe go with 400. Capacity still three. And why don't we add for this one, the pets are allowed as well as the breakfast, but it will still not be featured. And last but not least, I would want to head over and again, add the description like we did before. So let's check it out. This will be my description. Maybe let's get rid of all the quotation marks here, like so. And we have also obviously our JSON data for extras. So let's select that. This will be added here. And then let's add also the images like we already did before, where we're going to click on it. Then we're going to head over to room 15. This will add our image. Okay, so far so good. We can obviously right away publish it. And let's link our existing assets, which by this time, if you have been coding along, you should have at least some images already there. So you can click on existing assets, then we're going to find them. I'm going to say this guy, this guy and this guy will be added. And of course, I'm just going to publish that. Then the moment I do that, once we will going to head over back to all my data, I should be able to see that I have 16, where previously I had 13. Once you have added whatever rooms you would like, obviously, in your case, if you're trying to access it, it would make more sense, the more rooms you're going to have, because like I said, the moment you start filtering it, it makes sense that you have more data. Otherwise, if you have three rooms, the filtering is also going to be kind of boring. Once you have added data, next one, we're going to look at how we can access this data from our application. All right, guys, we successfully set up our data structure as well as we added the data. So now this would be the time where we start, in fact, consuming our data. And the fastest way of doing that would be using the SDK. And for that, we will going to have to install one more package by the name of, you guessed it, Contentful or Contentful. It doesn't really matter. However, you would want to pronounce it. I will going to stop the dev server. I'm going to clear the console right now. And we're going to copy and paste it here, the NPM install Contentful or Contentful. And let me just copy and paste that. And sure enough, this will be installing right now. While this is being installed, why don't we right away check it out the documentation? And what we're really interested is creating the client as well as running the method of getting entries. Again, there's a bunch of things that you can do here. And if you would want to get a single entry, obviously check it out the get entry. But what we will be interested is getting entries. Now, as we're scrolling down, 
you are going to notice that first and foremost, we do need to install it. They also let you know that if, for example, you're working with simple vanilla JavaScript application, you can do something like this where you are using the CDN, but it will not be our case, of course, because we do have the content full installed and then we just need to require it, of course, and then run this method create client and we need to pass here the object with two parameters. One would be space and the second one will be access token. Now I'll show you in a second again where we do need to get this information, but I think this will be our first step. So why don't we clear the console? We can start a dev server. Obviously, these will be two first steps. Then I can close it and we can clear it a new file. So within the source, I could say, you know what? I would want a new file and I'm going to call this file. Let's say contentful contentful and we're going to say JS. And instead of using the syntax that they give us here, which, by the way, we can do it. You can just copy and paste it. Why don't we set up the ES6 way? Where I'm going to say import. Now, in this case, I will need to use the named import, and the method name will be create client. This will be from contentful. And then right away, we're going to use the export default. We're going to say export default, and we're going to run this method or the function, but we're going to pass in obviously our own parameters. So the first one will be space, and the second one will be access token. Where can we get this information? Remember, in the very, very beginning, I showed you that here we have the API keys. Under the settings, we head over to API keys, and we just need to create one. Now, I can name this however I would like. This could be store four or whatever. I'm just going to say resort rooms or something like this. Then let's copy this guy. Let's say that this will be my space, and we're going to set this equal. And as a side note, in the next video, before we deploy this on a Netlify, we will going to create our environment variables. Okay, so if you are right now committing this to the GitHub, please don't, because you probably don't want to share this information. Then I'm going to get also my access token. And the same would go here for the property on the object, access token. And this will be equal to my string. Now let's save that. We have successfully exported right away this function. So now our next step will be heading over to the context. Then right after the items, I would want to import. Since this is a default export anyway, I can name this however I'd want. I will name this client. And this will be coming from my local content folder. So the same folder. All right. Now, once I have that, I will going to use client. And then if you're looking at it in their example, they give you this get entry where we are looking for specific entries. And this is what I was saying, where these two probably will be your most used ones, where either you're getting all the entries or you're getting specific one. Now you have other options here, but these will probably be your most used ones. Instead of getting the entry, which we will not do, I'm going to head over to the get entries and right away notice what happens. So they give you an idea what you should do. And this is exactly how we're going to test it out first by running client, which in our case, obviously would be whatever we would name it, because that was a default export, the client or create client. And then we're just going to run get entries. This will return a promise. And then we're going to consume a promise with dot then. And then we're just going to be looking for a response. And the reason for that, because I want to show you what would be the pitfall if we are not filtering actually our entries. OK, let's copy this. In our case, I already named this client. So we're going to have to adjust it a little bit where it will not going to be client. But let's say all the way on the top of our file, I'm just going to run it. Now, first and foremost, I do want to check whether my dev server is running before I start checking out the console. Yes, everything is correct. And then we're going to head over back to my recording and let's see what happens if I open up the console. OK, now, in this case, nothing is happening. But at the moment, I do have my array. And what do you see right now? Well, I see array of 64. And the problem is the fact that I'm getting all the data that I have right now. So everything that I have, and by the way, I'm going to save the changes here. So it's working. But 
all my entries are here, not just my 16, the ones that I was looking for, where I said that I would want the beach resort room. As you can see right now, I can't filter it out. But if I'm looking at all my data, in fact, the value will be 64. So what I'm saying is, if you're going to have multiple content types for, let's say, each and every project, you probably would want to filter it out. You can obviously do this in your file. I could go back and be like, OK, whatever data I'm getting back, I would want to filter it somehow out. But you can also do it right away as you're making the request. And in order to understand more information about this, what we were going to do as we are getting the entries, we were going to head over to REST API reference, and this will going to give us more details. Now, as we're looking at it, notice what they're saying. If you want to query entries, we would need to use either content ID or content type. Now, in our case, we are going to go with content type. And if you're going to click on querying the entries, Check this out. So they tell you, okay, what would be the content type? And then within the content type, we are passing in the ID. Now, your next question probably will be, well, where are we looking for that ID? And remember, in the very, very beginning, when we were setting this up, I was like a chicken and I was reminding you all the time, you need to remember this ID. You need to remember this ID. And when I say remember, obviously, I don't mean that you need to remember the ID for each and every content model that you have, but you should know where to find it. So if you're going to go to that particular content model, this is the ID that you will have to use in order to filter your data, depending on your particular content model. So what we can do over here is again, we're just testing it out right now. Don't worry about it. But we do need to write content like so, then underscore type and then let's pass in that beach room sort because that was obviously the name of my content type if you have a different name please add a different name that one that's matching and voila in our case we have the 16 items that i was looking for so once i have this information of course we would need to restructure a little bit our application because the moment the only thing that i'm doing is console logging and that is obviously not the extent that i would like to do so remember, in the very, very beginning, I said to you, there will going to be this function by the name of get data that will be responsible for getting the data from the contentful. And instead of doing everything in the component did mount, where we again used our method, the one that we created ourselves with format data, instead, we were going to move all this functionality into this this dot get data. And then we're just going to run this function. Okay. Now let's test it out. First of all, let's build it. We are going to name this surprisingly get data. Then this will be a sync because I do want to use a sync await because this is just a little bit a more straightforward syntax as we're dealing with asynchronous code. So let's write it here async await. And you know what? Why don't we right away add it within a try catch? Because that way we are going to be able to find more errors if there are any. And the first thing, why don't we console log the error just in case there is one? And then within the try, what would we would want to set up? Well, we will going to be waiting for response. And since we are using a sync await, I can just say, OK, let response. And this will be equal to await because I am using a sync await. And then I have the client. And in this case, I am using again get entries. So either you can copy and paste it, whatever we had here on top, where we had the entries, and then you would want to add this content type. Now we will going to add one more thing for the order, but that will be in a second. So you know what, since I'll have to delete it anyway, I will going to get rid of this guy. I will going to delete that then. And we're just going to set this await equal to whatever response we're going to be getting. So now we're getting back this in this response variable. All right, now, okay, so far, so good. We got our response back. Now what? Well, we have all this functionality. And remember, again, I was repeating this over and over again when I said we are creating this function, correct? But then within the function at the moment, we were passing all the time. I keep repeating local data, local data, local data. And then once we're going to get external data, we were going to flip it around where all this data that we were using all the time locally 
we all just gonna use externally, and we all not gonna change any functionality below that. Okay, so how this is gonna work? Well, I am using right now my response, I'm getting my response, so it's very easy. In fact, I can take everything that I had already before here, we can just actually cut it out because again, I don't see the point of rewriting anything. We can uncomment this, so we will run this that data. However, after the response, once I copy and paste that, the difference would be that I'm not adding here the items that in fact, we will gonna pass within our function response items. So the way this will works is I'm getting back my response from the contentful. And on the response object, there will be items. Now, if I open up my response, check this out. What happened here? When we were console logging, remember, we were console logging response that items. This is the array that we already had locally, meaning, like I said, we had less fields. We obviously didn't have in a system object so many options. We didn't have as well some maybe extra stuff that they had within the fields property. But in general, the setup was exactly the same. And again, if you want to double check that, you can notice that whenever you're going to be dealing with get entries, this is exactly what's going to happen. You will going to have your response object. And then within the response object, the property name will be items. And the way we structured our data locally is a simple difference that as I'm getting this data right now externally, I don't pass items, I pass response items. Of course, you could set this up differently, but the main idea is very simple here, that now the data will be from Contentful, it will be external data, and the difference pretty much is just the fact that we are getting it from the Contentful. I'm specifically saying what kind of data I'm looking for, and then from the response, I'm just using the items. And everything else here, yes, will stay the same. Now, what I would like to do right now is comment out the items just for sure that you know that I'm not using the local data. We will going to save that. And voila, people, if everything is correct, and I can, by the way, close the console, check this out. I already can see that I have featured rooms. So this is working really well. And then I have rooms all together. So I have all my 16 rooms. Check this out. So I have four rows with four columns each. Now I know that I successfully got the data because if you remember, locally, I had only 13 items and now we're working with 16 items. And again, we didn't have to change any kind of functionality or anything like that. That's the reason why we went through the pain in the beginning when we structured our data exactly like they would. The only difference, obviously, is that we are getting back the object and we placed everything already in this items. So that was our items array. But this way, we don't need to recreate anything. I don't need to refactor anything because it already matches the format that we're getting back. And again, we can do all the filtering and everything, and I'm not going to bore you right now. However, there is one thing that you probably noticed where you're like, okay, so I get single standard, then right away I have triple standard, then I have double economy. And again, we could actually set up some kind of filtering right now here. I could say, okay, whatever items I got, filter depending on that, and only then update the rooms. You could do it. But since this is a case where I would want to show you that we can also do it from the contentful, why don't we head over again to documentation and be rock stars and find out how we can do that? So if I'm going to go again back to API reference, we are going to scroll down. We eventually will going to hit the order or let's say reverse order. Now let's test it out. We would say, let's say order. And they were going to give you an example here pretty much where we can order it depending on a date. And again, in this case, I just want to speed this up. So I'm just going to grab this information order. We will going to head over back. And the next one will be depending on order. Now they do warn you right away that you do need to right away set up a specific content type. So notice they're saying you must set the content type. Otherwise, obviously, you're going to be pretty much working with all of the data that you're getting back. Now, in this case, why don't we set this up? So 
In this case, I'm using the order. Now let's save that. And yep, what happens here is that I have single economy, which was first, then single basic, single standard, single deluxe, and so on and so forth. Let's imagine that you don't believe me. You're like, okay, I don't believe that this is actually working. Maybe he's just saying that that was how the order came in. Okay, just to prove my point, we still have the comma. I will gonna comment this out right now. And why don't we set up instead, we can use the order property. Again, that's what we need to do. And then what is the property that we would wanna order in? Well, why don't we try it out the price? And again, if you wanna find out what property you should order by, you just need to go back again to your local data. And remember, each and every object has all the same properties. So what do you have within the fields? We have name, we have slug, type, price. So why don't we order them by price? Okay, why don't we start very simply by ordering them by price? As we're heading over again back to context.js, now where is the price? It is in the fields property. And then we're looking for the price. Let's save that. And yeah, now everything is grouped by the price. Again, we have $100, 50, to 200, 250, again, 250, and I can go on and on and on. Now, last one, why don't we check it out how we can do the reverse order? Because again, this is something that they suggest in the documentation where the next one would be reverse order. And the only thing we would need to do again is use the order property and then flip the sign where this would be a uh, negative sign or subtraction sign. Now let's test it out. Like I keep saying all the time, let's do the negative one. And now I should start with 600 or whatever was my max. Yep, it was 600. And then obviously we're going reverse order. As I said before, all the things that we could do manually, of course ourselves, but what I'm trying to show is that Contentful gives you nice options where you can already get your data structured the way you would like. We successfully have pulled data from the Contentful, and now we're ready to deploy our application online. Well, there's many awesome platforms that we could use. In our case, we're going to use Netlify because it's an awesome hassle-free service, and even free account allows you to do a bunch of things. In order to get the free account, the only thing you would need to do is sign up with your email, and they're all not going to hassle you. You're not going to have to leave your credit card or anything like that. And you're going to be good to go. Assuming that you already have signed up for the account, I'm just going to log in. And in your case, probably if you just sign up for the service, this screen will be empty. In my case, I have a bunch of projects for the tutorials and the projects. There's two ways how we can do it. We can do a single drag and drop, or in fact, we can use the continuous deployment using the GitHub. This is the option we're going to choose. So for that, you're also going to need to have a GitHub account. However, assuming that you're watching a React tutorial, it's safe to say that you probably already have one. So I'm just going to be kind of skipping a lot of things because I do find it very, very basic. First and foremost, we're going to have to create a new repository. I'm going to name one, I don't know, React Beach Resort. And let's say recording. And then what I would like to have is the external URL. And in my case, it's saying, okay, you can have it. And the reason why I would want the remote URL, because this is going to let my Git know where to push the application that we have built. Then we're going to head over back to my document. And before we actually set up the Git, I would like to change these variables to the environment variables. I wouldn't want to push them up to the GitHub. Now, in order to do that, we're going to first create a new file. We're going to call this .env development, like so. Once we have this file, I would also right away want, want to add this to git ignore. So this way, the file will be ignored when we're going to be pushing this up to the GitHub. And let's call this not git ignore, but in fact, env development. Just make sure that you add this dot in front of it. And once we have the in development file within the file, we're going to create the environment variables. Now, in that case, we can change how we're accessing them. So instead of just placing the string here, so the rest of the world can see our secret variables, we're going to set them up in the environment uh, variable file. 
and the way we work it if with create react app, the naming would be react underscore app and then whatever name of your variable. So in my case, I will gonna call this API and let's call this space. I'm gonna set this equal to wherever string I had first and foremost. And the second will be this access token. So let's grab this value as well. And by the way, we can probably cut this out and we'll just gonna go with naming react app access token. And then let's copy and paste that. Once I have these two values, what's going to happen is my application will break, even though we were going to be accessing them. Now, let me show you how this is going to work. First and foremost, if we would want to access these environment variables, we go with process dot env and then whatever name we had. So in my case, this was react app API space. So let's copy and paste that. And the second one will be exactly the same. But of course, the variable name should be matching whatever I had for the access token. So let's delete that. And we're going to go with the react app. That is again, the important part. And let's call this access token. Once I'm going to save it, my application will going to break. And the reason why it will break because every time we're creating these environment variables, we do need to restart the server. So let's stop the server, clear the integrated terminal. And let's run npm start just to double check that everything is working. Because obviously it doesn't make sense pushing this up to the Netlify if you already have some errors locally. Thankfully, everything is working. So everything is awesome. And now again, I'm going to have to clear the integrated terminal as well as stop the server. And my first thing would be setting this up as a Git repository. So we're going to initialize the Git, Git in it. Now, once we do that, the next one would be adding all the styles or not, I'm sorry, not all the styles, all the files. So in order to do that, of course, we're going to say git add, and we're going to add all of them. Then after that, why don't we do the commit? So git commit. And what would be the message? I don't know. Uh, react uh, beach, beach application, something like this. At this moment, we're committing. And now we would need this remote URL. So in this case, I are going to copy and paste this line clear the console probably first. Now this will going to create my remote URL. And last but not least, I would want to push it up to my GitHub repository. So let's go back, git push you and origin will be master in our case. Hopefully everything is working. Hopefully we didn't push up the environment development file because otherwise everything that we did is kind of useless anyway. Uh, let's refresh the browser. Let's see. Okay, this will be my project. Awesome. And now we're going to have to head over back to Netlify. And we're going to have to click on this tab where we have new site from Git. And of course, in this case, I would need to choose my provider. In my case, I will going to choose the GitHub. And then why don't we find right away the file that I had or not file the repository. And it was the React Beach Resort recording. However, before we do anything, before we click on deploying the site, we would want to check it out the advanced one and add the same variables that we had before. Otherwise, basically, you're going to deploy the site, it will going to break and then you're going to have to add them anyway. So you might as well skip that step. And the way we're going to do that, we do need to copy and paste these values. So number one, and number two would be the value, of course. So this will be my space one. And then after that, I would want another one, the access token. So let's go with this guy, copy and paste. And the same, we're going to do it over here. Copy and paste. Once we have that, let's deploy the site. Now, Netlify, we're going to start building the site. And while the build process is happening, we're just going to go to the site settings and we're going to change the name. And again, why don't we change it to React Beach? Resort recording. Yeah, this should do it. Let's save that. And it says the name is already taken. Okay, unfortunately, that is the case. Why don't we say YouTube as well? I think this should work. And yes, it is working. We changed successfully uh, site name. Let's look at the deploy. Currently, we can even check it out how the build process is happening. And as you can see right now, this is being built. And if there will going to be some errors, you will be able to see them. Now, I do need to warn you that 
it is kind of hard to work off the Netlify uh, errors as you're getting them. In most cases, you do need to troubleshoot, and that is not as easy as it seems. But anyway, you can see if there's some kind of error. If, let's say there would be an access token error or something like that. It might show up here. Okay. Now let's head over to the GitHub. We can might as well close that. The site is still being built, but no, it's already live. Awesome. Let's head over back to a site. We're going to click on here. And of course, this will be my site. And check this out. I do have my rooms. Awesome. And if you remember, we were using the order and the order was reversed. So in this case, everything comes with a higher price first. Then we do have the rooms. So we have the rooms. We obviously can have an option of filtering it. We can also have the error page where if I'm not going to be able to find the page, let's say we're going to go with hello. Notice, remember, we had our 404 page not found. And this is where that file, remember, we copy and paste in the public those redirects. So if you're not going to copy and paste that, if you're not going to use that simple line of code, then it will going to be directing you basically to your uh, default Netlify error page, as well as when you're going to be refreshing the single page, if you're going to click on here. And if you're going to be refreshing the single page, it will not work. In our case, notice nothing breaks. And this is why it's important to include those redirects. We do have all the pages. Everything is working. And just to show you that we are actually connected nicely with Contentful, let me show you one last thing. If we're going to head over, let's say, to Contentful, and just because this is an easiest option, I will going to delete one of the rooms that we have just so you can see that this is working. And the room that I will going to delete will be presidential because that way we for sure know that this would be something unique. So first and foremost, we're going to have to go with unpublish. Okay, so we're going to unpublish it. Then it shows that this is a draft already. Now it's not published. And then why don't we delete it? So we're going to go with deletion. And the moment we do that, if I'm going to head over back to my project, notice this was previously the first one. The moment we're going to refresh, what do you see here? I don't see any more presidential. And if you're going to look at all the rooms, we notice that we have one less. So now we know that everything has been nicely connected to the contentful. And what that means is that now your project doesn't have to be in your local machine. You don't have to add all the changes. In fact, you can work with your project data exclusively on contentful. Hopefully you guys enjoy the project and hopefully I'll see you on my next project.